After three playthroughs and 250 hours of total playtime, I feel like it's fair to say that Cyberpunk 2077 comes off as a somewhat unfinished game. And no, I'm not really referring to the bugs. There are already enough videos where YouTubers complain about the game's technical state before condemning the unethical nature of CDPR as a company and all of the lies that were told throughout the game's development. While much of this condemnation is valid, that won't be what this video is about. This video seeks to analyze Cyberpunk 2077 as a game in as thorough of a manner as possible. So yeah, this video is going to be dense. I will be going through the entire game in excruciating detail. Every story mission, every side job, every facet of gameplay, every length of co- Lastly, I feel the need to state that it's not my goal to persuade anyone to like or dislike Cyberpunk 2077, only to help people better understand their own feelings towards it. This is where I'll be putting the first spoiler warning. While I won't be spoiling any of these games in their entirety, I will be mentioning some early story moments for a few of them in addition to outlining how they're structured. So, what type of game is Cyberpunk 2077? This section seeks to examine the evolution of game development trends that led to where we are today. Discussion of Cyberpunk itself will be kept to a minimum, but I will be mentioning other games left and right, so beware for spoilers. There seems to be a mounting backlash towards open-world AAA games nowadays. It seems that more and more big studios are choosing to play it safe, sticking to tried and tested conventions instead of innovating with their open-world formulas. And if you were to ask who is primarily to blame for this, most people would point at Ubisoft. The first thing we need to clarify is what an open world is. If I were to go into Unity and use landscape generation technology to create something that vaguely looks like terrain, I have yet to create something that could be described as an open world. This is because there is no meaningful interaction the player can have with this play space that embraces its open-ended nature. I think that definitions and categorization are both useful tools when it comes to understanding complicated ideas, so I'm going to introduce some terminology that will hopefully help people better understand the various concepts I will be discussing throughout this video. Since I've asserted that a play space isn't an open world without open world interactions, let's start by categorizing the various ways that developers can implement said open world interactions. After pondering this quite a bit, I've come to the conclusion that there are three distinct philosophies designing open-world gameplay mechanics. Dynamic, static, and authentic. All three of these types of mechanics embrace the open nature of open worlds in very specific ways. Dynamic open-world mechanics are what you typically expect to see in sandbox open-world games like the early Grand Theft Auto games. Sandbox open-world games are very systems-driven, featuring a lot of reactive elements such as traffic and a robust wanted system. Static open-world mechanics are the complete antithesis of dynamic open-world mechanics. As they tend to materialize as objectives that are waiting around in the open world for the player to come around and complete. Think of the outposts in Far Cry 3. Outpost-centric open worlds feature a lot of objectives that are often broadcasted on an in-game map, which are generally, but not always, meant to be completed like items on a checklist. Authentic open world mechanics are rather unique and much harder to define, as instead of serving as a mechanism to get the player into the gameplay loop, they attempt to get the player to engage with the location in the world as if they were real places, which enhances the player's ability to view the open world as a setting. The best example of this would actually be The Witcher 3's open world, which while often lacking in a gameplay sense, far surpasses its contemporaries when it comes to feeling like a real place because of how it's contextualized through its quests. So, those are the three types of open world mechanics that result in three generally distinct types of open worlds, sandbox, outpost, and setting. While I do think it's possible for an open world to have equal parts dynamic, static, and authentic elements, in my experience one of these three tends to stand out. Some might suggest that there should be a fourth category dedicated to open worlds that focus on making exploration interesting through static and dynamic elements that keep the player engaged during their travels, but in my experience these these types of open worlds still rely heavily on the presence of outposts, even if only as a boon to get the player to travel across certain areas. The point of creating these definitions was to make it easier to examine the current state of AAA open world games. It just feels like open world innovation has been stagnating as of late, with AAA developers putting their focus into only one of these types of open worlds, the outpost variety. While there's nothing inherently wrong with static open world mechanics, I believe it's gotten to the point where far too little is done to differentiate outpost open world games. It's not that the outpost structure itself is outright bad, it's just that it's become 
overly familiar. But why? How did it come to be that so many open world games nowadays feel so samey? To answer this, we need to go all the way back to the year 2000, to the release of Deus Ex, which, while not an open world game, is very relevant to understanding how we got to where we are now. To understand what Deus Ex is and why it was so revolutionary, let's take a look at a clip of Warren Spector, the lead director of Deus Ex, taken from GDC 2017. If people get that, that you can fight, sneak, or talk, we're gonna rule the world. If people compare our combat to Half-Life, we're dead. If people compare our sneaking to Thief, we're dead. And if people compare our role-playing elements to Baldur's Gate, we're dead. Deus Ex's strength wasn't found in any individual facet of its game design, but the abundance of options that were present in tackling its objectives. In order to prove this, let's take a close look at the opening mission where JC has to reach the leader of the terrorists who have taken over Liberty Island. Firstly, the player has options as to how they choose to build their character, with certain skills benefiting a stealth playstyle and others benefiting a more aggressive approach. This progression system feeds into the design of the stealth combat arenas, which have various routes and areas that benefit from or play differently when approached with different builds. For example, take the turret guarding the entrance. Might end up being trouble if you didn't select the rocket launcher as a starting weapon or don't have some other plan to deal with it. If you want to stealthily navigate the narrow corridors, having a knife is a silent albeit lethal way to take down enemies. The level of choice goes further than just this however, as there are often options objectives present on missions like this. For example, there's a contact by the northern docks who can tip JC off about a guard who can help him get inside, and failing that, there are plenty of other ways to infiltrate the stronghold without making any noise. When inside, there's an optional objective to help Gunther out of his cell, and after doing so, you have the option to give him a weapon, which results in him clearing out all of the enemies on the floor. When you finally get to the terrorist leader, you have the option to kill him or talk him down, and many of these decisions have small but notable ramifications later on, such as various NPCs commenting on how the mission went. Minor deviations such as these make missions like this more replayable, or at the very least more rewarding knowing that your actions are formally recognized by the game. Deus Ex pioneered the stealth combat arena, open-ended play spaces where the player is tasked with completing objectives using a wide array of gameplay options. While Deus Ex's gameplay was immensely lacking in polish, the depth and complexity in how players can approach objectives is still impressive to this stay. While elements pertaining to outpost open worlds were present before 2007, Assassin's Creed revolutionized open world outposts by presenting them as easily accessible objectives, the location of which could be easily viewed using an in-game map. This created a gameplay loop where the player would track an objective, travel to it using the game's engaging movement systems, and complete it before starting the cycle all over again. The main benefit of these objectives existing in an open world was the fun of engaging with the transversal mechanics to get from point A to point B. Assassin's Creed's open world design did possess dynamic elements as well, such as the wanted system and interesting NPC behavior, but the outpost style objectives were clearly the core feature that the game was designed around. However, a dire pitfall to this approach to game design was the extent to which objectives were copy and pasted all around with very little to differentiate them. Some of these activities managed to stay fresh by embracing the open world's level design or dynamic systems, but after you've completed the first pickpocketing task, you've done them all. Despite all of this, the first Assassin's Creed game happens to be my favorite in the series by a decent margin. And no, that's not nostalgia speaking. I actually played it for the first time during the process of making this video. In my opinion, it was by far the most original and focused entry, and it's a shame that the series didn't focus on improving the unique gameplay it introduced. The next and arguably most crucial step on this path is 2012's Far Cry 3. Taking some cues from Assassin's Creed and Deus Ex, Far Cry 3 managed to be the first game that successfully implemented stealth combat arenas into an outpost style open world. Far Cry 2 tried to do this but in my opinion it didn't succeed. The merger of these two ideas created a gameplay loop that was extremely addicting and relatively easy for developers to implement. So easy to implement in fact that an uncanny number of AAA games released nowadays fall 
follow Far Cry 3's open world blueprint to a letter. Sure, there are some unique twists on the formula, such as a focus on some gimmick like hacking or a deprioritization of stealth, but the inspiration is clear to see. But let's take a step back. What was the game design philosophy behind Far Cry 3 and why have so many developers flocked to it? There are three main ingredients that are key to Far Cry 3's game design. Firstly, we have a progression system that serves to gradually expand the scope of gameplay as the player progresses throughout the game. This skill tree didn't sport the depth present in full-blown RPGs, but between it and acquiring new weapons, the game succeeded in giving the player a sense of progression by presenting them new gameplay options at a steady rate. Secondly, the game presents a player with stealth combat arenas where they're tasked with clearing out all the enemies to trigger success and receive experience which feeds into the game's progression system. Even though the first and last stealth combat arena wouldn't be all that different from each other, the expanded gameplay options present would keep the challenges feeling fresh. Thirdly, the stealth combat arenas existed seamlessly as outposts on two expansive and visually interesting open world maps. The main benefit this provides is the ability to approach outposts from multiple angles. These three pillars came together to solve the problem of monotony that plagued the first Assassin's Creed game. The last stop before we reach CDPR's open world legacy is GTA V, which came out just a year after Far Cry 3. I'm about to say something very controversial. Grand Theft Auto V is not all that great of a sandbox open world game. I have simply never found police chases fun enough to go out of my way to engage with them. I've heard people describe open world police chases in GTA V as reliable, and I'm inclined to agree. They're reliably bad. The police AI cheats, there's no actual point to them, and the actual game gameplay you engage with is repetitive as hell. Instead, GTA V's open world succeeds as a setting. Understand that the GTA series has changed over the course of its existence. Up through San Andreas, GTA open worlds are primarily as fun sandboxes, while merely dabbling with the concept of being a truly well-realized setting. GTA 4 tried to make the transition from a primarily sandbox-oriented open world to a primarily setting-oriented open world, but in my opinion it didn't fully manage to make the jump. GTA 5, however, did. The primary function of GTA 5's open world isn't to immerse a player in a dynamic play space with interesting NPCs, deep gameplay systems, or radiant police AI that doesn't have to cheat to find you, San Andreas is meant to come off as a real place, and I can prove this all with a simple example. Early on in GTA V's story, the story missions intentionally kept the player in Los Santos, driving around, participating in relatively down-to-earth objectives until the first act of the story climaxes with a heist. All of a sudden, the game switches to the perspective of Trevor, who is in the middle of nowhere in a small town that the player isn't familiar with. Uh, upon progressing the story a little further, Trevor decides to travel to Los Santos to find Michael, and after driving over the hills that separate Trevor's small town from the massive city of Los Santos, there's a moment where Trevor pulls off of the road and gets out of his car. At this moment, as you gaze upon the massive city of Los Santos, there's a sudden realization. Not long ago, you were down in those streets. You were but one of those lights that are moving around on the roads, and everything clicks into place. The world of San Andreas suddenly feels both massive and understandable at the exact same time. But more importantly, the way the story contextualizes this journey puts an importance on the world's geography that wouldn't normally be realized during free roam. Moments like these where the story events contextualize locations in realistic ways are why GTA V's take on San Andreas excels more so as a setting than as a sandbox. The Witcher 3 was CDPR's first attempt at an open world game, and the result was something that both borrowed from convention and stood on its own. The first thing worth mentioning is that The Witcher 3's open world features no noteworthy dynamic elements whatsoever. Don't believe me? Just try picking a fight with a guard and tell me that they spent more than a day working on this feature. Much of the content in The Witcher 3 consists of Ubisoft-style open world outposts, but these have a big problem. The character progression in The Witcher 3 is extraordinarily lackluster, giving the player virtually no ability to expand Geralt's moveset in any meaningful way. This combined with the non-existent level design and lack of variety in enemy behavior means that every enemy encounter feels painfully similar. So yeah, it's clear that CDPR didn't fully understand what made Outpost open world games palatable, which meant that the authentic elements in The Witcher 3's open world had a lot of heavy lifting to do. And yeah, they did.
The world of The Witcher 3 succeeds primarily as a setting, and this is easily provable. The Witcher 3's open world is hollow without its quests. All the meaning given to the locations present in The Witcher 3's open world are absent without the context given by the narrative elements. Let's take a look at a few examples from the game's prologue. When Geralt and Vesemir first arrive in the region, they ride to a nearby tavern to ask after Yennefer, which contextualizes this location as a hub for information and rest. Despite this purpose only being real in the context of this quest. Geralt goes to a formerly abandoned fort that an Elfgardian garrison has recently occupied to ask about Yennefer. While this fort is a visually interesting location, there is no meaningful open world interaction to be found here outside of how this quest presents it as a location with importance to the war effort. This quality exists throughout the side quests as well. There's a Witcher contract where Geralt helps a local man search for his brother in a corpse-ridden battlefield, thereby giving significance to this location beyond mere set dressing. Near the fort, there's a man who asks Geralt to find a box for him which he claims to have lost when someone attacked him as he passed through the swamp. After investigating, it turns out that this man is a Temerian soldier who is attempting to prevent the Nilfgaardians at the fort from receiving medical supplies. This quest portrays the otherwise meaningless countryside as being geographically important to the war effort. While this quality did exist in the quest design of the first two Witcher games, I found that the restrictive and partition nature of the environments harmed my ability to perceive them as real places. Places. Despite having many qualms about the streamlining that took place between The Witcher 2 and 3, it's undeniable that the decision to make The Witcher 3 an open world game did have its benefits when it came to immersion. In an industry that is oversaturated with Far Cry 3 clones, The Witcher 3 had something different to offer, and it's a shame that Cyberpunk 2077's open world design didn't follow in the footsteps of The Witcher 3. Cyberpunk's open world took the full step into the Ubisoft model that The Witcher 3 only dabbled in, and this wouldn't have been a problem if it didn't mean losing what made The Witcher 3's open world unique. Cyberpunk's quests don't share the authentic quality of those of The Witcher 3. Instead, Cyberpunk's open world serves primarily as a pretty backdrop for a bunch of Ubisoft-style outposts. And while I can't say that Cyberpunk's outposts are any worse than those found in your average Ubisoft game, I can't help but lament CDPR for turning their back on what made The Witcher 3 so unique. People claim that the newer Assassin's Creed games are just Witcher clones, but I couldn't disagree more. Ubisoft wholeheartedly misunderstood what made The Witcher 3's open world so special. They got the scale right, but the quests serve as little more than an excuse to shove the player back into the stealth combat arena gameplay loop with little to no consideration put into contextualizing the world as a real place. Cyberpunk 2077 might not be a bad outpost open world game, but it is yet another outpost post-open world game, and for many that will be enough to write the game off there and then, and I can't blame people who take this view. The Witcher 3 was a deeply flawed game, but because it attempted to do things that few other games did, most people were able to overlook its flaws and appreciate its unique qualities. Cyberpunk does not benefit from this. It will be judged harshly because it has contemporaries to be judged against. Before moving on, I want to give the disclaimer that I have a lot of problems with Cyberpunk's story. While I firmly I firmly believe that neither Cyberpunk's story nor side quests do much to enhance the open world as a setting, it's worth stating that your enjoyment of the story will be subject to your level of tolerance to plot holes and poor pacing. Both of these things bother me quite a bit, so brace yourself for yelling. Overall, Cyberpunk's story manages to feel bloated and incomplete at the exact same time, which is actually quite the feat when you think about it. There will be heavy spoilers from this point onward. I'll be going through the entire story in every single side job, in addition to spoiling much of The Witcher 3's main story. You've been warned. When starting a new game of Cyberpunk 2077, you first choose your difficulty, followed by choosing your life path, followed by choosing your character's appearance, and finally followed by choosing your character's starting attributes. We'll get into discussing the ramifications of these choices in time, but initially your life path will have the biggest notable impact on the game. There are three life paths in Cyberpunk 2077, Nomad, Street Kid, and Corpo. Each one of these has a different starting mission that introduces the player to Jackie Wells, a character who ends up being important to the story for reasons we'll get into shortly. Before I go on to outline these three missions, I want to state firmly that each one has strengths but also weaknesses. But more importantly, I can't help but feel like each one is left somewhat incomplete. Let's start with Nomad, which has far more excitement than the Street Kid and Corpo intros put together. All three of these missions have V start right next to a mirror, most likely so that the player can see how V looks in-game and have one last chance to go back and change their appearance before they get too invested in their playthrough. Because as of patch 1.2, 
2.2, you can't change V's appearance after you start the game. I'm seriously shocked that it's been five months and this still hasn't been patched in. Like, seriously, what the fuck? The first thing that V does is remove his patch that signifies his allegiance to his former Nomad Clan, the Backers. This is a trend you'll start to notice with these openings. V here isn't a Nomad, he's a former Nomad. He had a falling out with his clan and is now just an independent smuggler. This is a problem with all the life paths going forward. You don't really get to choose who V is, you get to choose who V was. After fixing the car, which the mechanic was unable to fix for some reason, the local sheriff waltzes in and urges V to get out of town. The next objective is to drive to a radio tower where V radios a member of his former clan, asking if his contact left any messages for him. This leads V to meet with his contact Jackie Wells in a shack outside of the town. Jackie is a good character for three reasons. He's likable and sympathetic, he's roughly a match for V's station in life, and finally, he has ambitions. These three factors come together to make Jackie a very good supporting character, whose presence creates a highly understandable dynamic between himself and V. Two friends ready to face the world together. The two depart the shack and head for the border, where they're stopped and forced to bribe the officials to let the two of them pass with the contraband they're carrying. As was foreshadowed, their car gets ambushed by the Arasaka Corporation, whom the border guards tipped off about V and Jackie transporting something that belonged to them. After the only combat of the three intro sequences, Jackie pulls into a shack before stomping around while complaining about how poorly the job went. After a bit of bickering, the two decide to open the Arasaka container that the two were tasked with smuggling, which turns out to be harboring an iguana. The two get to talking, one thing leads to another, and Jackie offers to become V's partner in Night City. This intro is probably my favorite of the three. It has the best introduction for Jackie, it has by far the most excitement, and it actually involves moving around an open ended environment. If there's one thing that I could criticize this intro for, it's that it doesn't put quite enough emphasis on Arasaka, the corporation who will prove a huge factor in this game's story moving forward. The Corpo Life Path intro solves that last problem by making V a literal employee of Arasaka. Once again, it starts with V looking into a mirror, but this time, Jackie calls him almost immediately. This seems like a pretty bad way to introduce Jackie. The game doesn't even fully explain V's current relationship with him or how a Corpo came to be friends with some hoodlum. Unlike the simplistic nature of V's circumstance during the Nomad intro, this time around, the players overwhelm with exposition about some huge data leak that took place at the Arasaka Corporation. This intro overloads you with a lot of unimportant details, and I assume that's intentional, to show the player the chaos that Corpo life entails. After taking a crowded elevator up to a higher floor, there's an optional interaction with a co-worker named Frank that will come up later when we discuss the side jobs. The one thing I'd like to notice is it's a nice attention to detail that V has a different HUD during this section because he has Arasaka software installed. Next, V goes to meet with his boss, whom the player is introduced to as he orders the execution of the Europe European Space Council. It's not necessary to understand the exact nature of the corporate conspiracy that's taking place, just understand that things are serious. V's boss wants him to hire someone to kill a corporate rival named Abernathy. There are some more minor details and interactions that are meant to add to the feeling of chaos associated with corpo life, but none of these end up mattering, so let's just move on. After an AV ride during which V talks to his life coach, the AV lands atop the club where he's to meet Jackie and pay him to kill Abernathy. Upon being confronted by some thugs, you have the option to have V use some Arasaka-issued implants to neutralize the attackers. After meeting up with Jackie in the club, V greets him as if they've been close friends for some time. The way that they choose to portray Jackie in this intro is even more bizarre in the context of the Street Kid intro, but we'll get to that in a moment. Suddenly, some corpos from Arasaka confront V and shut down his Arasaka-issued cyberware, in addition to seizing his bank account. The conspiracy to kill Abernathy has been uncovered and the jig is up. Just as the goons are about to take take V away, Jackie steps in and intimidates them into leaving V alone. I assume that this was done to make the player feel indebted to Jackie, but it just comes off as inconsistent. So far, the corporate culture at Arasaka has been shown to be cutthroat, even murderous at times. So how am I supposed to believe that these goons would let V off so easily after he was part of a conspiracy to murder a high-ranking director at the Arasaka Corporation? Boy, I guess they were really scared of Jackie now, weren't they? Anyways, with nothing left to lose, V becomes partners with Jackie. This intro does two things well. It puts a heavy emphasis on the presence of Arasaka and gives the player a flyover of Night City. However, it's a pretty weak introduction to Jackie's character and the world of cyberpunk as a whole. Overall, it's probably the weakest intro of the three.
Like Nomad and Corpo before it, the Street Kid life path starts with V looking into a mirror, but not before we get a good look at V's bruised hands. This intro introduces the player to a few non-Jackie characters that end up showing up later in the game for non-exclusionary side content, the first of which being Pepe. Pepe tells V that he owes money to a local loan shark named Kirk, and V agrees to help him negotiate his debt. After standing up, the game draws some attention to a woman whom you'll later learn is Jackie's mother. After going up stairs, V sits down with Kirk and begins discussing Pepe's debt. This encounter has a lot of personality to it. Kirk's bodyguard, Big Joe, sits down next to V when he begins his conversation with Kirk, and it's a really amusing intimidation technique. V agrees to steal a car owned by a corpo in order to pay off Pepe's debt, and Kirk gives V a tool that's supposed to unlock this particular type of vehicle before sending him on his way. On his way out, V runs into Sebastian Ibarra, who is better known as Padre. Padre is a godfather archetype, a well-respected patriarch who is kind of viewed as a spiritual figure by the members of this criminal organization. Padre offers V a ride to his destination, and on the way there's exposition revealing that V has spent the last two years in Atlanta. So once again with the street kid life path, V isn't really a street kid, he's a former street kid. The ride gets stopped by the rival Six Street Gang, and when the rival gang member shows disrespect to Padre, you have the option to have V stand up for him. If you instead choose to have V remain silent, Padre Padre has a hauntingly subtle line where he says, Atlanta broke you. Meaning, you know what I mean. I think it's really good writing when characters are able to convey so much subliminal information with so few words. However, none of this ends up mattering as he ends up offering V employment no matter what when he lets him out of the car. It's a real shame that Padre's character isn't used much after this interaction. He's a fixer and all, but other than that, he's a criminally underused character. This next part is where this life path intro starts to slip in quality. Jackie's introduction in this life path makes no sense. So let's be clear, all the characters we've seen so far are Jackie's people. V grew up in the same neighborhood as Jackie did in this life path, but somehow they've never met each other. If that wasn't bad enough, then when V attempts to steal the car, Jackie just pops out of nowhere and attempts to steal the exact same car for no clear reason. It's just the writers deciding that he needs to get shoehorned into the story all of a sudden. Then the police show up, then the owner of the car instructs the police to dispose of the two of them, then the police don't because they're actually really nice guys, and then all of a sudden V and Jackie are friends for some reason. The contrived nature of the series of coincidences was already bad enough, but Jackie not knowing V in the first place manages to be even worse. Corpo V knows Jackie, but Street Kid V doesn't. That doesn't seem to make a hell of a lot of sense. The obvious solution would be to start V and Jackie's mild acquaintances who get sent on this mission together. All of this is a real shame too considering how good this intro was leading up to this point. This life path comes in at second for me. It has the highest highs but also the lowest lows. Also, the Arasaka connection was really minor and essentially missable. All of these life paths lead into a scripted cinematic where V settles into his new life as a merc. The only difference is what clothing V is wearing. I am very conflicted about this cutscene. On one hand, it is very well put together and technically impressive. The entire thing is real time, not some pre-rendered video. On the other hand, this cutscene is a horrible way to introduce the player to all these new characters in this new phase of V's life. The Witcher 3 had a similar problem where it just threw the player into the middle of someone's story without sufficient context, even if you played the previous games. But unlike like The Witcher 3, Cyberpunk 2077 has no excuse. V is a custom character who's meant to serve as an avatar for the player, and this disconnect between V's understanding of the world and the players is one of the contributing factors that ruins that. It is a major problem that this huge, crucial chunk of V's life is just summarized with this minute and a half long cutscene. I can't stress enough how much it harms the overall stakes of the story going forward. The player isn't given sufficient reason to care about anyone other than perhaps Jackie. You might might recall Pepe or Padre if you went Street Kid, but they don't come back into the player's purview for some time, and even then that's just for side content. What's more, there are much more relevant characters whom you don't get to meet at all, such as T-Bug or Wakako. Neither of these characters prove to have a major role in the long term, but it still baffles me that CDPR thought that this pathetic little cutscene was a sufficient way to introduce the player to Night City and all of these new acquaintances.
I think I know why they did this, however. Many people would have you believe that Cyberpunk's prologue is too long because they mistake the first act for the prologue. The real prologue ends just half an hour into the game, but because the prologue did such a poor job setting things up, CDPR treated the entirety of the first act as if it were the prologue, and the story never fully recovers from this. The game abruptly cuts to V and Jackie sitting in a car. The two of them are about to do a gig for a fixer named Wakako. Quite awkwardly, Jackie offers V a Militech training shard that will allow the player to experience an overview of the game's mechanics and cyberspace. This is awkward because the game just showed us a montage of all of the work V and Jackie have already done together. Why of all times would V need to train now? On the ride up the elevator, the game abruptly introduces the player to T-Bug, a character whom both Jackie and V already know, but someone that the player will be painful oblivious of. What ensues is the tutorial mission that was shown at E3 2018. And, well, it's actually alright. If it was meant to be an introduction to the concept of gigs, it fails, being overly cinematic and under-contextualized at this point in the game. But as an introduction to the gameplay loop, it works pretty well. There are a relatively small number of enemies who are positioned to encourage a player to test out the game's early mechanics under relatively little pressure. It's also a good thing that the game makes sure the player knows how to hack things before entering the apartment. However, it's here where I feel it appropriate to level a criticism at how Cyberpunk, and most of its contemporaries if we're being honest, handles its more complicated world building. Cyberpunk 2077 has a lot of background information that would be inconvenient to convey through a cutscene, such as a backstory about the trauma team insurance that retrieves a woman that V and Jackie end up saving. Cyberpunk's solution to this problem is to include a random data shard that just so happens to be sitting in this apartment which explains the backstory behind the trauma team insurance. Now, I don't know about you, but when I boot up a AAA game on my rather power-hungry graphics card, I don't particularly enjoy stopping the flow of gameplay to read a wall of text every few minutes. Even if the lore was interesting, which it really isn't, I'd still much prefer to read a wiki page on my own time on a web browser that won't melt my GPU. Some games have tried to avoid disrupting the flow of gameplay by instead transcribing these notes onto recordings that the player can listen to at their leisure, and while much prefer the cyberpunk solution, this still comes off as half-assed and inorganic. Interestingly enough, the Deus Ex series has already come up with an immersive way to communicate world building. The Deus Ex games still have the data terminals with the overwhelming walls of text that I refuse to read, but when all you want is a tidbit of unintrusive information, all you have to do is walk up to an NPC and interact with them. They will then proceed to spout off a condensed, informative line that relays that particular NPC's perspective on the events taking place at any given point in the story. This is an efficient, organic, and immersive way to implement world building without tasking the player to read a goddamn wall of text or flood their ears with someone's speech going forward. There are a handful of instances where Cyberpunk attempts to do something like this via optional conversations, but it's nothing compared to the simplicity and convenience offered in the Deus Ex games. On the elevator ride down, V calls Wakako, the fixer who orchestrated the gig that V and Jackie just pulled off. Wakako, like T-Bug, is a character that V is well acquainted with, but yet another character that the player will be absolutely clueless about. As we'll eventually discuss, gigs orchestrated by fixers make up a considerable portion of the game, and the game simply does an unacceptable job introducing a player to these characters whom they'll constantly be getting calls from. The tutorial mission isn't over yet. Jackie insists on driving V home in V's car. On the way, they get attacked by a van full of scavs, who have been tailing them since they left their hideout. This ends with their driver crashing their van into a wall for absolutely no reason. These car chase sections are pretty bad, but they pop up infrequent enough that I don't have much to say about them. Getting V home turns out to be more complicated than they thought, however, as Watson has been put on lockdown. I was actually quite excited when I first played through this section because I mistakenly thought that various districts locking down was going to be a mechanic that would be used throughout the rest of the game. Game. But nope, turns out this is just a one-off scripted sequence, not an open-world gameplay mechanic of any sort. It's the same deal with the VTOL attack that the two run into just a minute later. Jackie intentionally draws the player's attention to this event as having a greater importance in the same way he name drops characters who end up being somewhat important to the story later on. I was really hoping that getting chased by VTOLs would be the consequence of higher wanted levels or something, but that's obviously not the type of game that CDPR ended up making. Jackie lets V off and claims with a surprising amount of confidence that he is fully capable of making it back through the police barricade. On the way up the elevator to his apartment, V gets a call from T-Bug, who tells him that she has a gift waiting for him at a Netrunner shop. 
This is such a bad way to introduce a side job. During all three of my playthroughs, I had absolutely no clue when T-Bug let me know that she had this gift waiting for me. The only way I even know about this now is because I carefully went through all the footage when writing the script. A huge portion of the game's side content is introduced like this, either through a call or a text. And this problem was so bad during my first playthrough that I had to stop at the point of no return because I had literally done less than 20% of the side jobs that I received throughout the game. Leaving the apartment complex is blocked off until you enter V's apartment and sleep until the next morning. Upon waking up, V gets a call from Jackie and a notification about a system malfunction, both of which are meant to prod the player into continuing the main story. Unlike the night before, the gate is now open. You're free to explore V's apartment complex and enter the open world. Before we move on, I need to point out a huge missed opportunity. I've made it clear that I'm a pretty big fan of the Deus Ex series, and one of the most interesting things that the Deus Ex series does is drop the player into large detailed hub areas where they're welcome to explore every little nook and cranny to find hidden secrets and additional equipment. I know it would have been unrealistic to expect the entirety of Night City to behave as a hub area, but would it have been too much to ask to turn just a few areas, such as V's apartment complex, into Deus Ex style hub areas with a few dozen secrets for the player to find? There are a few quests that take place here throughout the game, but that's not what I mean. I was personally hoping to be able to sneak into V's neighbor's apartments and find interesting things. I was hoping for there to be secret passages that reveal hidden locations with interesting stuff to find. I can accept the technical and developmental limitations that prevent this design philosophy from being implemented across all of Night City, but it's still disappointing that just a few areas couldn't have gotten that extra level of care that would have elevated them to be anything more than just set dressing. Since these areas are separated from the open world via loading screens disguised by slow elevator rides, this wouldn't have been overly ambitious in a technical sense either. As it stands now, V's apartment complex serves as a dull, lifeless box that literally kills you when you try to explore it. There are two optional interactions on the way to the elevator, picking up V's gun and boxing a dummy, the latter of which leads to getting informed about the fights that happen around Night City. This interaction with the boxing coach is a much better way of introducing the player to side content than forgettable phone calls or text messages. Speaking of, it's around this time when you'll get a call from a fixer named Regina, who ends up being one of the most important characters in the game if you intend to pursue the side content. I know I keep repeating this, but it is so astonishingly bad to introduce characters this way, especially characters who will be communicating with you throughout the entire game. It's the same for all the other fixers I haven't mentioned yet. These random people just start calling up without any formal introduction, and it's confusing as hell for players who are even paying close attention to what's going on. Next, V leaves the apartment complex and meets up with Jackie. Or does he? During my third playthrough, I didn't immediately progress through the main story. Instead, I proceeded to do every possible gig that I could in the area of Night City that I had access to. Like GTA 4, Cyberpunk 2077 contextualizes this restriction by shutting down the bridges that lead to the lower section of the map. And when that fails, they just flash the turn back, nothing out for you just yet, and reset V's position. Get used to this message because as as we'll eventually get to, Cyberpunk's map isn't nearly as open as it first appears. There are positives and negatives to ignoring the main story and pursuing side content at this point in the game. The first negative is that unless you progress through the next 20 or so minutes of story, you'll be leaving at least one story-related NPC idly waiting for V indefinitely as he goes gallivanting around Watson. The other negative side effect is that a lot of the open world content remains locked until you get a second call from Regina, which happens automatically right before you go and see Dex. That's right, you get a second call from Regina, not the one I just mentioned. You get a second call from her where she introduces you to the presence of cyber psychos. Once again, this is just a terrible way to introduce side content. Regina especially really needed a formal introduction to give the player a reason to care about both her character and her gigs. Because when she starts radioing the player non-stop, they're gonna be confused as hell as to who this chick is and why they should care. However, the first possible positive side effect to doing side content early is that you'll actually feel like somewhat of a mark when you go to visit Dex, not some jackass who just started playing the game half an hour ago. Secondly, when the time comes, you'll have more options during the upcoming mission where you retrieve a bot from the Maelstrom gang. Uh, upon meeting up with Jackie, he'll inform you that he's landed a sweet-ass J-O-B from a fixer named Dexter Deshawn. Only the top fixer in Night Fucking City! Fat-ass Black Jesus of the Afterlife!
But before we get to that, V has been experiencing technical problems after jacking into that woman during the previous gig, so the two head over to Victor's to get it checked out. This is when the game first introduces the player to Misty and Victor, two characters who will end up being somewhat important to the story going forward. Victor Vector, yes that's his actual name, is a former heavyweight boxer who retired to the quiet life of a ripper some years back. A ripper is someone who specializes in installing and maintaining cyberware. Primarily for Merc work in Vic's case, Misty runs a new age healing sort of shop that's in front of Vic's back alley ripper business, and she also just so happens to be dating Jackie Wells. This is the player's first formal introduction to these two characters, but V has known these two characters for six months. The introduction of these two characters isn't quite as bad as the introduction to the fixers, but it still would have been preferable for the game to have slowed down and given all of these characters a proper introduction. The main problem with Cyberpunk 2077's story is that it's in a desperate rush to get itself over with. CDPR claimed that most players didn't finish the main story in The Witcher 3, and that's the reason why they made Cyberpunk stories so short. But here's what they didn't understand. The main reason that people didn't finish The Witcher 3's main story wasn't because it was too long. It's because the game did a horrible job giving the player an understanding of what was at stake. Even if you play The Witcher 1 and 2 prior to The Witcher 3 like I did, you will have no no clue who Yennefer or Ciri are unless you read the books, and even then there are still some major plot holes, such as why Yin didn't contact Geralt earlier, but I suppose that could be explained away with her just being a bitch. Funnily enough, in CDPR's attempt to fix the biggest problem with The Witcher 3 story, they ended up creating the exact same problem in Cyberpunk 2077. The player is given no real reason to care about anything that's going on because the game skips over all of the important context. In Cyberpunk's case, this has less to do with the main character's motivation, and more to do with the lack of connection with the game's world and the important characters who inhabit it. For contrast, GTA V's story took its time to breathe, to let the player gradually soak in the feeling of what it's like to live in Los Santos, by putting them in the shoes of two of its inhabitants, Franklin and Michael, before elevating them both to the status of big time players. Cyberpunk 2077 skipped all of that. V and Jackie have already made a name for themselves to the extent that they're ready to pull off the biggest heist of their careers. During this sequence with Vic, the game introduces the player to the concept of cyberware, which is pretty much just a weaker version of Deus Ex's augments. Wise word of warning, do not pay Vic in advance. In the game's current state at the time of making this video, paying him early does not trigger the proper quest progression, and you'll end up having to pay him a second time. At this point in the game, V is broke, unless you ditched Jackie and went around doing a bunch of side content like I did in my third playthrough, so the vast majority of players won't be able to pay him anyways. This is a bad introduction to cyberware because almost all players won't be able to purchase anything at this point. The game really should have encouraged a player to make some money before sending them to Vic. Both before and after the appointment, Vic is watching a boxing match, and afterwards you can choose to ask him who's winning, along with some other options that give the player a better understanding of Vic's character and station in life. Next is the meeting with Dex, one of Night City's more prominent fixers. V takes a ride in Dex's car, and learns about what they need to do to prepare for the big heist. V and Jackie are to rob Arasaka, the corporation that all three intro sequences attempted to draw some attention to. This meeting with Dex establishes that V needs to complete two separate tasks before the heist can commence. V needs to meet with the client who's orchestrating the heist, and obtain a military robot called the Flathead which is needed to hack Arasaka's security. These two objectives can be done in either order. As for this meeting itself, it's great. I can't think of a single moment in the game that has more atmosphere than this sequence with Dex. It's also a perfect introduction to his character, largely because both V and the player aren't yet familiar with him. The graphical presentation is superb, especially with ray tracing enabled, and it does a great job getting the player invested in the events of the story, something that simply hasn't occurred up until this point. This is the exact introduction that every other fixer needed, an atmospheric in-person meeting that leaves a lasting impression with the player. It's also during this exchange when Dex asks V a question, which I think is meant to signify the main theme of Cyberpunk 20. Would you rather live in pieces, Mr. Nobody, die ripe, old, and smelling slightly of urine, or go down for all times in a blaze of glory, smelling near like posies, without seeing your 30th? Quiet life, or blaze of glory? Hmm? Essentially, go big or go home. I'll end up getting back to this later. Just keep this part in mind for now.
Before moving on with the story, we need to discuss how I will be addressing side content in this video. Cyberpunk side content can be split into four categories. Blues, gigs, cyber psychos, and side jobs. The first three warrant their own section, but as for side jobs, think of them as side quests, because that's exactly what they are. The best moments in The Witcher 3 were found in its quests, more specifically how the hundreds of various quests breathe life into the otherwise hollow open world. I've already gone over how the quests in The Witcher 3 enhance the design of the open world as a set Setting, but I think it's worth stating that their writing deserves praise as well. There are remarkably few side quests in The Witcher 3 that I can describe as outright bad, while in the newer Assassin's Creed games there are remarkably few I can describe as outright good. While the gameplay and mission design of the quests in The Witcher 3 often left much to be desired, the vast majority of them were carried by their writing. Even the most simple of side quests, such as the frying pan retrieval near the start of the game, managed to be greater than the sum of its parts because of how it managed to contribute to the world building. Cyber Cyberpunk side quests are disappointing. They're still better than the quests found in most AAA games, but in my opinion, they're a pretty severe downgrade from those found in The Witcher 3. The Witcher 3 had two types of narrative-focused side content, side quests and Witcher contracts. Likewise, Cyberpunk has side jobs and gigs, but most people won't view gigs as a sufficient replacement for full-fledged side quests. Gigs are great in their own right, but people who value the narrative-heavy focus of Witcher contracts won't find gigs a sufficient replacement. When looking at a list of Cyberpunk side jobs, it appears as if Cyberpunk is a decent quantity of narrative-focused side content. Not the boatload that The Witcher 3 had, but a respectable number nonetheless. Lists like these are deceptive. Many of these missions are simply fractions of larger quest lines, and many others are so short that they really shouldn't be considered side quests at all. For example, V picking up his gun from Wilson after he wakes up is considered a full side job. No, really. Walking into his shop, entering his inventory, and collecting V's gun is the entire side job. Also, paying Vic for his Ripper Dock services is considered a full side job as well. Really, it is, I'm not kidding. And it's not just these two. A surprising number of side jobs are just as short, and it makes me wonder if their inclusion is nothing but a deceptive attempt to make it look like Cyberpunk has more side quests than it actually does. Next up is the side job where you pick up T-Bug's gift as she left for V at a Netrunner store that is conveniently positioned right next to where Dex dropped V off after their talk. Most players won't even remember the call where the side job was introduced, or even who T-Bug is if we're being honest. This moment, right after Dex drops V off, would have been the perfect time for V to receive the call about the gift, and it baffles me that CDPR thought it okay to introduce his mission at such an awkward time. The gift that T-Bug left V is a very useful quick hack called Ping, which highlights nearby enemies and points of interest. It's alarming to think that so many players could end up missing this due to this job's poor introduction. So yeah, V walks into the shop, gets the quick hack, tries it out, and leaves. That's the entire job. For a slightly more substantial job, V comes across a man named Jesse who's augmented junk is malfunctioning, and the player is tasked with driving him to a ripper dock. This job is quite amusing, as every street crossing just so happens to have some obstruction that delays the journey to the ripper. Not exactly a sprawling epic, but it serves its purpose as an amusing distraction nonetheless. For an example of a much more substantial side mission, there's a job where a monk asks V to save his friend, who's about to be augmented against his will. This mission is better played later into the game for reasons I'll get into, but as it stands now, it's a pretty decent side job with multiple ways it can turn out. Firstly, the mission lets you skip talking to the first monk altogether and go directly to saving his brother, and there's unique dialogue reflecting this choice. Being able to do objectives out of order was a major strength of The Witcher 3's quest design, and Reminence's approach to mission design remain in this game as well. Secondly, when you save the monk, his reaction will differ based on whether you dealt with the Maelstrom goons lethally or non-lethally. I really like that the major choice of this quest is performed organically instead of selecting between multiple text options. Options. And thirdly, these two monks end up showing up again much later, but we'll discuss that when the time comes. I like this side job quite a lot. It may be short, but it's one of my favorites in the game due to how much organic depth it has. These last two side jobs have one crucial flaw, however. Once available, both of these jobs are broadcasted on the in-game map for absolutely no reason. Prior to either of these jobs, V didn't get any calls. So how the hell did he know to go to these two locations? Is he psychic or something? Setting aside 
bad logic, broadcasting the existence of these side jobs undermines the value of exploration. It would have been much more immersive if the player was able to find these on their own. But it's not as simple as that most of the time. The introduction to the fist fights from the boxing coach is a rare example of a side job that can be introduced in such an organic way. The player is forced to walk by that particular area during that section of the game, which means that they're very likely to engage in the interaction that introduces them to the quest line. The flaming crotch man and these two monks are extremely easy to miss without the icon on the map leading you to them, and with so few genuine side jobs in the game that's a real problem. The Witcher 3 tried to solve this problem with message boards, but the presence of the message boards was still broadcasted on the map, so I don't really think that it was all that successful. Still, other modern games don't even try. There isn't one obvious solution to this problem. If you remove the icons altogether, immersion will go up, but at the cost of the assurance that the player will be able to find these missions at all. My preferred solution would be a modern day take on the NPC design of Daggerfall. Have NPCs from this region of the map mention that they witnessed or heard about a public spectacle involving two monks, and from this information the player can organically be directed towards this particular side content. NPCs in their current state are merely backdrop. Training the player to view them as useful information dispensers would give them an actual reason to exist in addition to making finding side jobs more immersive. None of this could be implemented with the snap of a finger, but none of it would be mind-bendingly complicated either, and I hope CDPR and other developers consider such mechanics for future projects. So, those are all the side jobs that can be played during Act 1. And yes, I left out the fights in Gary for a reason. I will continue going through all the various side jobs between subsequent story missions, but for now, now let's continue with the story. While the player can do the two heist preparation missions in either order, first we're going to attend the meeting with the client, Evelyn Parker, who V is supposed to find at Lizzie's bar, the same bar from the Corpo intro sequence. This is probably my least favorite section of the game for multiple playthroughs, mostly because of the painfully slow brain dance sequences you have to endure. Evelyn Parker is a character who won't fully make sense until later in the game's story, but for now, let's just stay focused on this section of the game. Evelyn overhears V conversation with the bartender and drags him off to a private room to talk about the job before they both head downstairs. Before we go on, we need to talk about science fiction. Science fiction is specifically about speculating about the ramifications of plausible scientific advancements or discoveries. It's not enough just to introduce wacky technology for the sake of it. For example, if a fictional setting has robots, it isn't necessarily science fiction unless the narrative explores the ramifications of said robots. Do they replace human workers? Do they overthrow humanity? Etc. Cyberpunk 2077 establishes a technology called Brain Dance, or BD for short, which essentially allows people to relive experiences that have been recorded and edited for viewing pleasure, or more often than not, perversion. BDs can be recorded from a behavioral chip that's installed in a person who is living out an experience, but generally said experiences are edited before distribution. The game now introduces the player to Judy, the Brain Dance editor who edits pornographic BDs at Lizzie's. Judy walks you through how to use a brain Brain Dance Editor, which in actuality is more of a Brain Dance viewer. This technology allows you to pan around the scene that the Brain Dance technology captured instead of just viewing it from the perspective of the person who captured it like a normal Brain Dance. These sections were fine the first time around, but I absolutely hated these on subsequent playthroughs. I already knew what I was looking for, so all I was doing was going through the motions. The first BD you're shown is of a thug who gets shot by his partner. This Brain Dance doesn't merely show V this man's death, it actually allows him to experience a simulated version of his death. So, already then, this technology sounds pretty powerful. In addition, it seems like this tech must be pretty common if some random thug off the street has access to it. From this, a few questions can be raised. What are the limits of this technology? What are the exact requirements to record a brain dance? Are there any limitations on how long or in what circumstances a brain dance can be recorded? In other words, why doesn't everyone have a BD recorder built into their head that allows them to record anything at will? This question is actually quite personal to me, as I record clips for my videos using Shadowplay, which allows me to press a button and save the last 10 minutes of gameplay at will. For BD technology to be interesting science fiction, and for its inclusion not to break the plot further down the line, it needs to be answered why it isn't commonplace for normal people to have Shadowplay-like BD recording software available to them at all times. And this question isn't answered at all, which ends up having dire ramifications moving forward. Anyways, the brain dance that V is here to see is the one that Lizzie 
Daisy took her cell phone in Yorinobu Arasaka's room in Arasaka Tower. Yorinobu is the son of Saburu Arasaka, the CEO of the Arasaka Corporation. He is shown to be a reckless, spoiled brat who doesn't have very much respect for his father or the legacy he's built. He doesn't like how his father runs things and thinks that he could do much better. Evelyn is acquainted with Yorinobu. She is his output, as one might say. You can directly question her as to whether or not it's a good idea for her to orchestrate a heist against someone whom she's so close with, and she just shrugs it off. The thing that Evelyn wants V to steal is a biochip that Yorinobu has hidden in his room, and she is so obsessed with profiting from this, she offers to cut Dex out of the deal and give V 50%. You can refuse or say that you'll think about it, but as you'll soon see, this choice doesn't end up mattering. This is probably the weakest section of the entire game for me. Nothing interesting happens and there aren't any important choices to make. It's just an array of linear conversations and tedious brain dance sequences. The highlight for me would definitely be the swinging beads you can play around with. Let's break to talk about how Cyberpunk's character progression works. Quick disclaimer, if you don't want to get bogged down with a lot of minor details that you might not care about, skip this section and continue with the main story. Character progression in Cyberpunk can be divided into five separate categories. Leveling, Skills, Cyberware, Gear, and Economy. While certain aspects of each of these do bleed into others, such as how leveling up rewards skill points, and how the economy is used primarily to acquire better gear and cyberware, splitting Cyberpunk's character progression into these five distinct categories helps concisely explain the strengths and weaknesses of the various progression systems. The ideal character progression system serves to keep the gameplay experience fresh, such as introducing new abilities that expand the scope of gameplay. However, progression systems can also be an outlet for the player to make interesting decisions, such as having the player choose between one of a few mutually exclusive perks that uniquely shape the gameplay experience. All too often, character progression in AAA games becomes little more than completing objectives to increase your character's level, which allows you to complete higher level objectives to further increase your character's level. This loop in and of itself is pretty boring, dare I say unpalatable, unless the developers sprinkle in some genuinely interesting character upgrades such as new abilities that allow you to approach objectives in different ways. The Witcher 3's character progression didn't sprinkle in enough new abilities on top of its already pretty basic gameplay loop, and this resulted in the combat becoming stale rather quickly. Every facet of progression being dedicated to increasing damage output or resistance in one of only a few ways also becomes grating rather early in the experience. Cyberpunk 2077's character progression is a massive improvement over that of The Witcher 3, but that doesn't mean that it's perfect. Let's start with leveling. The Witcher 3 had levels for both the player character and enemies that determined the overall health and damage output of each. This system still exists in Cyberpunk, but it's disguised by a vague danger level that only communicates the level of an objective or enemy relative to that of the player character. This change isn't any better or worse than what was present in The Witcher 3. Both are pretty bad for reasons we'll get into. I personally can't think of a game that does enemy leveling good, but Fallout 4 is an example of a game that does enemy Enemy leveling all right. Making a certain percentage of the enemies outlevel the player can sometimes serve to make the combat scenarios a little bit more interesting. For example, you might choose to target less powerful enemies first because their TTK is much shorter before focusing on the few that pose a greater threat. This approach is generally referred to as level scaling, wherein enemy levels are always adjusted to be somewhere around the players, often with a little bit of variation to make things more interesting. The other main approach to enemy levels is leveled areas. This is what the newer Assassin's Creed games do. In my opinion, this approach to game design is absolutely awful. By having objectives and enemies in specific regions all cohere to a similar level, this artificially transforms what was originally one massive open world into 20 or so smaller ones. Nothing is gained from arbitrarily gating off content in this way. This form of guided linearity has no place in an open world game. The reason behind doing this is likely to disguise how bland the act of exploring the newer Assassin's Creed games open worlds really is, but in the end it just makes the problem even worse. The Witcher 3's take on leveled areas was even worse than this. Leveled areas still existed, but they weren't even broadcasted to the player like they are in the newer Assassin's Creed games, which arguably harms exploration to an even greater degree. Cyberpunk 2077 kind of has leveled areas, but the harm they do is mitigated by a few factors. Firstly, the danger level of every single outpost is broadcasted 
on the in-game map. This means that unlike in The Witcher 3, where you are shown white question marks and nothing else, you know whether or not an objective is feasible before you go there. Secondly, there is very little danger when traveling across Cyberpunk's world. This means that even if an area outlevels you, you don't really have to engage with the more difficult enemies. And thirdly, exploring Cyberpunk's world is just plain boring. That last one might sound a little bit harsh, so let me explain. Cyberpunk's open world isn't really the type of open world that you explore. It might be something to look at, but there isn't really a reason to go anywhere beyond completing objectives. Objectives that are visible and can be tracked from an in-game map that's accessible at all times. All of this just makes the act of exploring Cyberpunk's world just plain boring. So in conclusion, while I maintain that leveled areas are absolutely terrible, they manage to be somewhat less terrible in Cyberpunk 2077 than in other games. Good job, CDPR, I guess. The only other thing worth mentioning in regards to leveling is that street cred exists, and overall it's a pretty pointless stat that just serves to mirror your character level. Having high enough street cred allows you to buy some things, but I don't really see why these items couldn't have just been gated based on your character level. There's also this one instance in a side job where high street cred helps me get into a club, and it seems like a missed opportunity not to expand that mechanic in hindsight. The skills in Cyberpunk are better than those offered in The Witcher 3, but that was a low bar to clear. Cyberpunk's skill system is split into five core stats, intelligence, body, reflexes, technical ability, and cool. Each of these categories contain two to three separate skill trees, some of which seem rather unrelated to each other. Both of the skill trees under intelligence are directly related to hacking, but the body trees feel somewhat mismatched. The athletics tree contains a lot of general upgrades, which most players will likely find themselves gravitating towards. But but Annihilation, which mainly contains buffs to LMGs and shotguns, and Street Brawler, which applies to melee, are much more specialized, likewise with the Stealth Tree and Cool. In addition, perks that relate to the three different weapon types, Smart Tech and Power, are all located in the Engineering Tree found within Tech. The skills found in Cool's Cold Blood and Tech's Crafting are pretty boring, mostly just overcomplicated ways of increasing various stats. You might notice I'm not mentioning any particular skills, and that's because there aren't many individual skills worth mentioning. If I had to guess, I'd honestly suggest that the reason that the perks are laid out this way is to make Cyberpunk's skill system seem more complicated and interesting than it actually is. While Cyberpunk's skill system does offer the ability to specialize your character to some degree, every one of these skill trees could have been simplified down into just a couple skills that enhance their respective facet of gameplay. But CDPR wanted their skill tree to look deeper than it actually is, so we ended up with this mess. As for how skill points actually work, there are two types of points. Perk points and attribute points. Perk points are pretty self-explanatory, as they allow you to unlock perks. Attribute points raise the level cap on the sub-skills in each category. This is more important than you might think, because one of the best ways to gain perk points is to level up subcategories just like you would in the Elder Scrolls games, but your stealth level won't increase past your cool level. This encourages a more spread out approach. Put attribute points into otherwise useless categories to avoid getting certain sub-skills capped. However, on all three of my playthroughs I found myself un motivated to spend skill points after a certain period of time due to how iterative all the skills were. Still, this skill system is an improvement over The Witcher 3's, mainly because it does actually allow specialization beyond choosing whether to upgrade your heavy or light attacker, which sign you want to be slightly more powerful. It's also worth noting that you can pay to respec your character, but not the attribute points, only the perk points. The last thing worth mentioning is that there are occasional skill checks that test these five core stats, but most of the time these are just conversation stat checks that relay unnecessary information. However, a high enough intelligence stat is required or at the very least helps the player get certain outcomes in a noticeable number of quests. The primary usage for skill checks is being able to open various entrances. However, only the body and tech skills are used for such things. People have criticized how many gated locations will just put up multiple entrance skill checks right next to each other, and while there are cases where this is true, I found this complaint to be a little too exaggerated. Also, the fact that there are only two skills that allow you to access these entrances still encourages specialization more than it would have if all five skills unlocked various doors. 
Let's move on to Cyberware, where all of the more interesting character upgrades happen to be. As a side note, many of these upgrades can be found in the open world and set locations and don't require purchasing, but you still need to visit a ripper to get them installed. Also, different rippers sell different cyberware, which might initially prove confusing for new players. Also, various cyberwares might have requirements to purchase them, such as a certain reflex skill or sufficient street cred. Just like with the perks, there's a lot of bloat cyberware that distracts from the more interesting ones. Let's start from the bottom. There are two augments that affect jumping, but only one can be installed at any given point. Most players will likely gravitate towards a double jump, but the boost jump actually goes quite a bit higher, which might prove more useful if you're going for a stealth build that won't require the flexibility that the double jump offers. This is the best example of two equally balanced options that the player will have to decide between. The nervous system has two available slots for an array of cyberware that will slow down time under various circumstances, getting seen by enemies, when dodging, when your health drops below a certain level, etc. And of course there's a handful of much more generic stat modifying bloat. The immune system is like the nervous system except the effects triggered are more defensive. The hand cyberware dictates which weapon types you're able to fully utilize, which seems like an unnecessary hoop to make the player jump through if we're being honest. The frontal cortex, skeleton, and integumentary system all just mostly contain boring stat increases of various sorts. Your operating system houses your cyber deck, which which is where the various quick hacks can be installed, but upgrading the cyber deck itself only changes boring variables such as how much RAM you have access to. Finally, there are an array of arm augments that can prove very useful if properly utilized. There are the mantis blades, which serve as a melee weapon without the requirement of micromanaging gear. Despite lacking mechanical depth, I found the mantis blades rather fun to use due to the visual spectacle offered by the animations and dismemberment effects. There's the mono wire, which while visually interesting isn't all that great of a weapon. It has to charge outside of combat to be fully effective, and even if you get the perks that make it viable as a stealth weapon, it's kind of pointless considering how effective silenced revolvers are for stealth kills. There are the gorilla arms, which in addition to increasing melee damage, are supposed to have a couple of other perks, such as the ability to force open doors and rip out turrets even when your body stat isn't high enough, but in the game's current state this doesn't appear to be working. I didn't find the gorilla arms to be all that interesting. They pretty much just came off as a less visually interesting version of the mantis blades. Finally, there's a projectile launcher, which essentially serves as an unlimited supply of grenades that explode on contact. I found this weapon fun and overpowered, though I believe they have since patched out the exploit that allowed you to use a tranquilizer mod to one-hit kill enemies. So in conclusion, this isn't a terrible selection of character upgrades, but it does pale in comparison to the scope of gameplay expanding augments offered in Deus Ex Mankind Divided. There's an NPC who mentions some kind of cloaking augmentation, but but nothing of the kind can be found in-game. I wouldn't be surprised to hear that most players never got the chance to experience half of these because of the unintuitive nature of how the Ripper Dock inventories are laid out. Just like the skill trees, the Ripper Dock inventories simply have too much bloat. And this only gets worse when you look at how cyberware mods are implemented. Mods are strange. How exactly does installing a mod onto V's eye make all of his weapons non-lethal? Why did CDBR think it necessary to make the player install a separate mod to unlock the power weapons target? targeting systems. Overall, the cyberware options are decent, surpassing the level of choice provided in your average Ubisoft game, but they're introduced in such an unintuitive way that I can't blame people for ignoring them altogether. Gear in Cyberpunk 2077 is slightly better and slightly worse than gear in The Witcher 3. Let's start with the most obvious downgrade. Gear in Cyberpunk makes V look stupid. Very, very stupid. There are certainly clothing items that don't look stupid, but you'd be a fool to wear them because there'll always be another piece of gear with better specs, and that other piece of gear will more often than not look retarded. I'm not the biggest fan of in-game character customization. I generally just equip whatever makes my player character look presentable or the complete opposite. However, it seems like GTA Online-esque fashion was something that CDPR was going for based off of the Styles of Night City trailer, but tying buffs to gear essentially ruins that aspect of the game. Also, it's just plain unfun to micromanage gear. The newer Assassin's Creed games don't have inventory limits, and frankly, I can't think of a single reason why a pseudo-RPG should. There's nothing fun or challenging about having to fuck around with all these generic items. In the Deus Ex games, managing inventory space can actually be somewhat fun and engaging 
engaging at times, because the balanced inventory restrictions force the player to make important decisions that often have interesting ramifications. In my opinion, the most important improvement to gear is the removal of that stupid weapon durability repair system that The Witcher 3 had. Having to constantly visit blacksmiths to get your gear repaired was so goddamn pointless. It did nothing but make the game less fun to play. Likewise, with The Witcher 3's inventory limits, it had you constantly running to merchants to sell your excess weight. This is still a problem in Cyberpunk, but the one saving grace is that you can now dismantle excess gear in your inventory instead of selling it at shops, which saves a considerable amount of time. However, this process itself is unnecessarily slow, requiring the player to disassemble every useless item one by one. Forgive the crude metaphor, but having to disassemble items in Cyberpunk is like when a cat has to lick its asshole. Is it enjoyable? No, but it's apparently preferable to having a dirty asshole. At some point, you might find yourself wondering why you bother picking up all this junk to begin with. And the answer is obvious. Money, which transitions nicely into the economy. My biggest issue with the economy is that there isn't anything interesting to buy outside of cyberware. Being able to loot weapons and gear trivializes merchants, and you'll obtain pretty good vehicles throughout the main story and side content, so there isn't really a reason to buy vehicles. GTA 5 also had this problem by the way. So yeah. Other than cyberware, the economy is mostly pointless, which is a real shame too, because there are so many merchants that have impressively detailed shop interiors that come off as superfluous when taken into account how useless they are. Like seriously, I can't even begin to imagine how much effort went into making these. But there's literally no reason to visit them. There's one thing that Cyberpunk's economy does well. Main story missions don't give you much money. This might come off as a bizarre compliment, but frankly I'm sick of games where simply playing through the main story leaves you a millionaire by the end of the runtime. Rockstar games are extremely guilty of this. Because the player is given so much money from story missions, there's no economic incentive to engage with the side content. It was frankly a breath of fresh air to look at my bank account at the end of my second playthrough where I didn't engage with any of the gigs and see that I was broke, because I deserve to be broke. It was gratifying to see my lack of effort punished because it gives meaning to the hard work I put in during my first and third playthrough. So, are Cyberpunk's progression systems good? Despite being bloated and unintuitive, I found that the depth offered from cyberware and the various weapon types did allow me to create unique character builds on all three of my playthroughs. The skill system came off as less successful, however, as there were far too few perks that provide anything more than generic stat modifiers. Attributes and perks did end up playing a minor role in character specialization, but it goes without saying that the system as a whole could have been drastically simplified without losing anything. So, in conclusion, and while failing to come close to the balanced and meaningful progression of Deus Ex Mankind Divided, Cyberpunk's progression systems work to allow the player to carve out a unique playstyle of their own, something that couldn't be said about progression in The Witcher 3. However, we'll have to wait until the gameplay section before we explore this further. The subsequent mission, titled The Pickup, is the most complicated and well-executed mission in the entire game. If you consider the various endings to be all part of the same mission, then yes, there is more depth to be found there, but as for a singular scenario that can play out in multiple ways, The Pickup takes the cake by far. This mission, like the tutorial with the scabs, was part of the E3 showing that got so much attention, and from what we were shown, the mission has been left mostly intact since 2018. It's likely that this level of complexity with CDPR baseline goal for Cyberpunk's mission design early on, but developmental trouble likely restricted how complicated they can make other missions going forward. V's goal is to obtain a flathead, which is a spider-like bot that is capable of walking on walls and hacking things remotely. The mission starts with an option to explore a lead about a Militech agent who has been attempting to seek information about the flathead, which was taken from a Militech convoy a couple weeks back. The agent, Meredith Stout, doesn't know that the Maelstrom gang was responsible for the hit on the convoy, and she suspects that a mole might have leaked the relevant information. Since V knows that Maelstrom was responsible for the hit on the convoy, the player can choose to use this information to leverage her assistance in obtaining the bot. Or so you'd think. V can call her and arrange a meeting at a location that just happens to be a few hundred yards away from Maelstrom's hideout. But never mind all that, let's just move on. I'd like to quickly point out that it's kind of dumb that you're unable to attack or kill the corpos when V goes to meet with them. It really wouldn't matter if you were to kill them at this point, so it's bizarre that the game doesn't let you. At first, the Militech 
Sonic agent is hostile to V, but she eventually agrees to let him have a credit chip to pay Maelstrom in exchange for the information he gave her. Okay, so everything I just covered was optional, but by no means does that mean that there aren't consequences to your actions. After meeting up with Jackie, the two approach Maelstrom's hideout and intercom in. A dude called Dum Dum asks what they want, and V tells him that Dex sent them. After being let in, V and Jackie make their way through Maelstrom's trap-laden hideout before they ride up an elevator to where Dum Dum is waiting for them. Dum Dum won't let them pass until V tells him what they want, which might come off as strange if you haven't been paying attention to the circumstances of Maelstrom's internal politics. You see, the Maelstrom gang has recently gone through a change in leadership, so even if Dex has already paid their former leader, Brick, for the flathead, the new leader, Royce, and his buddies don't know about this arrangement. After sitting down, you have the option to calm Jackie, who is more reluctant to let his guard down. If you don't, a shootout ensues that leads to an unavoidable stealth combat arena. After showing off the tech, Dum Dum and V get down to discussing payment, and after informing Dum Dum that the payment has already been made to Brick, Royce charges out and sticks a gun in V's face. This is where the quest branches into a few distinct paths based on your past and immediate decisions. If you didn't visit the Militech agent, your only option is to pay using your own money, or say the hell with it and begin the shootout, either by killing Royce or letting him escape first. If you didn't visit the Militech agent and chose to pay using your own money, you pick up the flathead and Dum Dum peacefully escorts you out of the building. If you did, however, visit the Militech agent right before this interaction, then things become much more complicated. Not only do you have the option to give Royce the shard, but you can hack it and wipe the virus that the Militech agent put onto it before handing it over to him. V even tells Royce that he did him the favor. If you give him the shard without wiping the virus, it damages Maelstrom's network, though not to the extent that shuts down the security cameras throughout their base for some reason. Royce thinks that V tricked him, so a firefight ensues that leads to a stealth combat arena. However, if you either wipe the shard or pay with your own money after tipping off the Militech agent about Maelstrom's involvement in the convoy job, Militech attacks Maelstrom's hideout, and both V and Jackie are forced to join forces with Maelstrom to fight their way out. The following segment of gameplay starts as either a stealth section against Maelstrom or a team combat section against Militech based on your decisions, but it can turn into a combat section either way. On your way out of the hideout, you might notice that Brick, the former leader of Maelstrom, is being held hostage in a closet. The player can choose to either detonate the explosive inside the hideout and collect the 5000 Eddie bounty that the NCPD placed on his head, or set him free. Setting him free affects a side mission later on where Brick is now the leader of Maelstrom once again. If you choose to kill him or leave him alone, either Royce is the new leader or he isn't because you killed him. The mission climaxes in an arena where you either fight Royce in a mech suit or actual Militech mechs, or you end up fighting neither because you killed Royce and didn't tip off Militech as to Maelstrom's involvement. It's worth noting that if you attacked Maelstrom but didn't kill Royce, it's possible to just walk right out the door instead of fighting him, but as of playing through this mission that option was kind of bugged. The mission still isn't over yet. If you didn't tip off mail tech and paid with your own money, no one is waiting for you outside. Likewise, if you didn't tip off mail tech and then proceeded to start a fight, no one is waiting for you outside either. If you didn't tip off mail tech and gave Royce the shard without wiping it, the mail tech agent is waiting outside, where V can scold her for tricking him. However, if you tipped off mail tech but started a fight with Maelstrom without giving Royce the corrupted shard, V gets to play it a little bit cooler in this conversation. Lastly, if you decide to betray the Militech agent either by paying with your own money or cleaning the shard, the other corpo whom she was holding hostage in her car is waiting for you in her stead. He informs you that she panicked and ordered an attack on Maelstrom's base, at which point this guy used this distraction to his advantage and turned the tables on her. After whichever variation of the scene plays out, V calls Dex and recaps the events that just took place. There are also other smaller details I haven't mentioned, like how if V was a corpo, he can recognize the corrupted shard from the get-go because of his corporate background. And there's a nice detail where if you're a nomad and offers her some help securing her convoys during the initial meeting, she actually comments on this with some unique dialogue afterwards. This is by far the single most complicated mission in the entire game, and it's a shame there aren't more like it. One final thing I'd like to mention is a quality that most games with stealth combat arenas fail to utilize. The process of learning the intricacies of a stealth combat arena before initiating gameplay therein is one of the most fun and rewarding parts of the stealth combat arena gameplay loop, if this part is done right. Most Ubisoft games have resorted to giving a player a drone or a bird that simply allows them to get an aerial view of things, but this approach to scoping out environments is very lazy. A rarely utilized method of allowing the player to scope out an area is 
to allow them to occupy it in safety before it gets utilized as a stealth combat arena. The most interesting instance of this concept being used is with Prague and Mankind Divided. During the first two thirds of the game, the player is able to walk around these streets in safety, only for their knowledge of the environment to be put to the test much later on when Prague is occupied by a police presence. Suddenly, the whole map becomes one huge stealth combat arena, and it's great! I'm not sure I've ever seen a game take this idea so far. During this mission, Cyberpunk tried to do something similar by having the player slowly march through Maelstrom's facility, and it did a passable job at letting the player occupy the environment they're about to fight in. Unfortunately, this is the only time the game tries to do something like this. Other important stealth combat arenas get the drone treatment at most. This isn't meant to put Cyberpunk down as substandard in this regard or anything, it's just to say that it was missed potential not to build on this idea further. Let's discuss Cyberpunk's gameplay in more detail. Once again, if you don't want to get bogged down with a lot of minor details that you might not care about, skip this section and continue on with the heist. The biggest strength of Cyberpunk's gameplay is the ability for each player to carve out their own unique playstyle using the game's progression systems. To better convey this, let's contrast Cyberpunk's gameplay to that of Doom Eternal. Doom Eternal might very well be the best FPS I've ever played, but its approach to weapon types and progression is the polar opposite of that of Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk. Every facet of gameplay in Doom Eternal is intended to be used by the player to overcome particular challenges. The plasma weapon is by far the most effective way to combat energy shielding. Launching explosives into the mouth of a cacodemon is the quickest way to get its health low enough to perform a glory kill on it. Sniping the Revenant's missile launchers with a precision aim of the heavy cannon is one of the best ways to cripple his range capabilities. Doom Eternal makes the player learn these things to overcome the increasingly challenging encounters. It also prohibits the player from playing playing the wrong way by limiting their ammo, thereby encouraging them to try new strategies when the one they've been relying on becomes ineffective. When it comes to the philosophy behind Cyberpunk's gameplay, there is no concept of playing the wrong way. The strength of Cyberpunk's gameplay is the ability to complete challenges in multiple ways that are all equally legitimate. Neither of these two approaches to game design are inherently better than the other. They are just different strategies to keep the player engaged with the gameplay. So without further ado, let's take a look at Cyberpunk's gameplay. Cyberpunk doesn't have the best gunplay, or the best stealth, or even the best hacking mechanics seen in any game, but what it does do is give the player enough options to create a build that feels unique to each playthrough. On my first playthrough, I realized that Power Revolvers offered the best trade-off in terms of flexibility and single-shot damage, which inspired me to build my character's loadout around this concept. With this build, most enemies, even some higher level ones, could be killed in one shot with a simple ping to the head. And upon getting detected, Cyberpunk shotguns prove surprisingly satisfying to use, especially with the higher knockback. I'm not exaggerating when I say that clearing out enemy outposts this way was some of the most fun I've ever had in an FPS game. And from what I've heard online, many other people have come up with unique builds that feel just as special to them as mine did to me, which suggests that Cyberpunk's loadout options are a success. So let's go over the individual components that make up Cyberpunk's gameplay. Gunplay itself is fine, but the weapon types feel unbalanced. The ricochet feature of the power weapons is completely useless. The ability to wall bang with tech weapons feels overpowered, and the smart weapons tracking bullets are a happy medium, with the added gameplay element of being able to aim your bullets so that they curve around cover to hit enemies. Despite the ricochet mechanic of the power weapons being awkward and pointless, the higher damage output that the power weapons provide is reason enough to consider them. But tech weapons, especially the tech sniper, promote camping behind cover, which is much more boring compared to the playstyles promoted by the other two weapon types. The shooting itself feels satisfying, with the knockback provided by shotguns being a particular high point. It's also worth noting that there are some oddities when it comes to the actual shooting mechanics, however. Just take a look at these examples when I slow down the footage. I'm not sure if these irregularities caused me to miss any shots, but sometimes it sure feels like it. Grenades were surprisingly fun to use. I never found the more situational types all that useful, but the basic exploding variants worked rather well with other facets of the gameplay. The nature of ammo and reloading is just as unremarkable in Cyberpunk as it is in just about any other FPS. 
Melee weapons are just bad. That's it, they're just terrible. I tried to go melee only on my second playthrough, but couldn't stomach it and ended up switching back to using guns. I'll go into more detail about the broken nature of melee combat when I go over the fist fights in about 4-5 to five hours, but in summary, the feedback is awful. The stamina limitations are worse than the burden of reloading, and the heavy light attacks that you have access to just don't offer enough depth to be engaging. I found the Mantis Blades more enjoyable due to their feedback and more interesting animations, but mechanically they're still rather vapid. Stealth is decent. I've heard some people complain way too much about Cyberpunk's stealth, claiming that it's broken or something, but in my experience, it's quite fun if a little unpolished. The first thing you need to understand is the enemy alert states. Enemy alert states will function differently based on whether the enemy is guarding a hostile, pseudo-hostile, or non-hostile zone. Enemies guarding non-hostile zones won't react to the player unless they do something forbidden, such as opening a door that they're not supposed to. Enemies guarding pseudo-hostile zones will initially warn the player off when they first see them before transitioning into an openly hostile state, and enemies guarding hostile zones will be openly hostile to the player if the player is detected within the zone. Speaking of detection, while enemies can hear the player's footsteps, they won't react to seeing the player until the detection bar fills up all the way and they transition into an alert state. This means that you can't coax enemies into certain areas by filling this bar partway up like you can in other stealth games, although there is a quick hack that lures enemies to your location. In in addition, you can lethally or non-lethally take down enemies up close, pick up bodies and hide them in containers, and influence enemy behavior a little bit with your hacking capabilities. Silencers make weapons near useless during combat, but are necessary for use during stealth, which is an interesting yet flawed trade-off because you can add or remove silencers to most weapons at will. Treating silencers like mods, and having them destroy themselves upon removal, would go a long way to making silence weapons feel like a permanent choice rather than a cause to micro managed gear. One area where stealth suffers is how punishing getting detected is. Games like the newer Assassin's Creed games allow the player to weave in and out of enemy alert states, allowing for a hybrid predator form of stealth that can often be enjoyable. Cyberpunk stealth is all or nothing due to how enemies behave after an alert state has been triggered and how unnecessarily difficult it is to shake their aggro. Assuming that the player's build accounts for combat, this isn't necessarily a negative however, as shifting gears from stealth to combat for the remainder of an encounter can often be a fun change of pace, but nevertheless, the versatility of stealth is hurt by how punishing it is to get detected. Tagging enemies is serviceable, but I wish you didn't have to use a hacking view that slows down time to tag enemies. Cameras in Cyberpunk are actually useful for tagging enemies because you don't have access to a drone like in Watch Dogs 2. I think this was the right move. It might seem like Ping would trivialize tagging enemies at first, but I only found myself using it to highlight enemies so that I could tag them or to find stragglers in the larger stealth combat arenas. Stealth combat arenas are designed with hacking in mind. Be it hacking cameras, hacking enemies, hacking miscellaneous objects to distract enemies, and hacking the occasional turret to betray its masters. Hacking is a supplemental feature. It doesn't have enough depth to stand on its own, but it works insofar as it provides additional options on top of what is already present. The first aspect of hacking you have to understand is the Breach Protocol minigame, in which you are tasked with identifying strings of letter combinations within an array of procedurally generated tiles. I have mixed feelings about this minigame. After the grid is spawned, there is no RNG, unlike the hacking minigame of the newer Deus Ex games. On the other hand, it's not all that engaging, and especially while using Breach Protocol during stealth combat arenas, it disrupts the flow of gameplay and gets rather tiring. Also, most of its implementations are very bizarre. Hacking most objects just gives you money instead of unlocking any interesting functionality, which seems like a missed opportunity. Since the placement of these letters is procedurally generated, CD DPR had to be sure that the player could always complete at least one of these strings of letter combinations, but subsequent lines aren't always ensured without a higher intelligence skill. Overall, I don't hate this minigame, but it does slow down the gameplay considerably. I just wish that there was a perk that would perform Breach Protocol automatically during the stealth combat arenas. Hacking itself can be split into two categories, Quick Hacks and Demons. Quick Hacks are effects that are applied to a single target at a time, except for Breach Protocol, which uploads demons to the local network. They apply very 
various effects such as disabling cameras or making turrets friendly. Demons are fine, but there isn't really any strategy in using them. You just unlock the perk and it passively aids you whenever you use Breach Protocol. There are some interesting quick hacks, but most of them are just redundant damage appliers. Contagion is an interesting twist on applying damage, but overheat, short circuit, synapse burnout, system reset, and suicide all feel like different power levels of the same attack, despite the pseudo-elemental implications of each. There were a few fun moments where I was able to blind an enemy in order to get past him or take him down silently, but for the most part, hacks like these found relatively little use in my arsenal. Being able to enrage enemies with cyberpsychosis is great for louder approaches, but for some reason I couldn't find this quick hack during my third playthrough, the playthrough where I focused on hacking. It's a real shame that there aren't more interesting quick hacks worth mentioning. I was personally hoping to be able to use hacking to create interesting AI manipulation scenarios like in Watch Dogs 2, or perhaps a more challenge-focused version of that at the very least, but sadly that wasn't on CDPR's agenda. One major problem with hacking is that certain features can be overpowered sometimes, such as the ability to disable turrets and cameras with a simple quick hack. In the newer Deus Ex games, the player has to search around until they find a security terminal or unlock a specific skill that allows them to temporarily disable them remotely. In Cyberpunk, since it takes so little RAM to disable any threat permanently, these obstacles are overcome far too easily. And for some reason, you can't turn turrets to assist mode when you find their controlling computer. The only way is through a line of sight quick hack. On top of that, they're not even all that useful as allies because they have so little health and do so little damage. This is all very disappointing because exploiting hacked turrets was some of the most fun I've had in the Deus Ex series. It's also worth noting that you can't activate friendly or assist mode on any of the patrolling robots of any kind, which is also a missed opportunity. Movement in Cyberpunk is clunky yet responsive. Installing one of the two leg cyberware is a must to fully appreciate much of Cyberpunk's level design, but doing so will also result in the player being able to reach some areas that the devs didn't intend for them to get to. While the presence of invisible walls and missing colliders is more so a criticism of the level design, it's still worth noting that vertical movement options are sometimes limited by how Night City was designed. Whenever I utilized leg cyberware in completing an objective, I felt like I was somehow breaking the game, which is actually quite a good thing. Unlike in the Deus Ex games where there are specific areas and specific routes through levels that are designed with specific augments in mind, utilizing the leg cyberware in Cyberpunk felt much more freeform. Being able to dodge and slide are nice action-oriented mechanics, but I wish the slides were a bit more versatile. The ability to peek around corners is a very welcome mechanic. Stealth would have most certainly been much worse without it. For a game with such over-the-top combat, I would have liked to see even more movement related mechanics, in addition to the ability to remove fall damage altogether, or at the very least that stupid stunned effect that triggers whenever you fall too far. Overall, I found Cyberpunk's movement mechanics to be engaging and complementary to other facets of gameplay. It's by no means perfect, but it certainly leagues above the likes of other open world outpost shooters like Fallout 4, which could have really benefited from better movement options. Healing mechanics are mediocre. You can heal by using various tiers of these medical things you find lying around everywhere, and they're never in short supply, so it's essentially just like Far Cry-esque style healing. There are also skills that allow for greater health regeneration during combat and elsewhere, which is fine. Overall, there's nothing really all that interesting about healing. It's an acceptable middle ground between COD-style regen and Fallout-style stim packs that does absolutely nothing new or innovative. And next we're going to speak about quick saving. Most people probably wouldn't consider quick saving a mechanic, but the way it's implemented in Cyberpunk it becomes one. The player is allowed to save when outside of combat. This makes quick saving and loading during stealth a rather viable strategy. The problem is that when you save and reload, enemy AI patterns are randomized. This means that upon reloading, enemies can behave unpredictably or even change position. Other stealth games that utilize quick saves don't do this. In Deus Ex, when you save, you can be assured the enemy patterns will always play out the exact same way when you reload that save. This means that quick saving is a reliable mechanic in Deus Ex, something that you can't exactly say about the implementation in Cyberpunk. I know that many people dislike the abusable nature of quick saves, but when it's implemented well enough it really can work with the gameplay instead of against it. The one thing I can praise about Cyberpunk's quick saving mechanic is that there are three quick save slots that cycle through before writing over each other. This means that if you don't like your latest quick save, you can go back and load either of the previous two before it. Seriously, this is an innovative concept. I wish more games would implement multiple quicksave slots.
However, none of this would matter if the encounters with enemies weren't designed with the gameplay in mind. In this regard, Cyberpunk manages to surpass The Witcher 3 in most but not every respect. The level design and enemy behavior manages to be much more interesting in Cyberpunk than it was in The Witcher 3, but it fails to live up to The Witcher 3 in terms of enemy variety. To be perfectly honest, one of the reasons that The Witcher 3 sold so well was likely due to the spectacle associated with hunting down and slaying one of the game's many impressive looking monsters. Such things look great in trailers. These enemies did little to differentiate themselves in the gameplay department, but they were certainly a marvel to look at. Cyberpunk 2077 has human enemies, autistic human enemies, humanoid robots, floating robots, mech-like enemies, and turrets. 90% of the time you'll be facing the human enemies, which, while having access to Cyberpunk's relatively wide array of weapon types, are still limited to humanoid behavior. Most of the problems with enemy behavior comes down to stealth-related issues. Enemy patrol patterns patterns tend to be static and predictable, which means that learning enemy patterns or hiding bodies in strategic locations is rarely necessary. This is a criticism that could be leveled at quite a few stealth combat arena type games, from Assassin's Creed to some of the areas in the Deus Ex games, but it's a valid criticism all the same. With all of that said, enemy behavior in Cyberpunk is heaps more interesting than it was in The Witcher 3 due to the inclusion of stealth alone, but that disparity between the two games is nothing compared to the gap in level design. For the first time, in one of CDPR games, level design exists. <laughs> In previous endeavors, fights took place on mostly flat planes where positioning and environmental interaction couldn't be less important. Sure, there was the occasional exploding barrel here and there, but utilizing them proved clunky and pointless. I've harped on about how repetitive The Witcher 3's combat was, but the lack of level design did just as much to make every single combat encounter feel the exact same. Level design in Cyberpunk is nothing special, in fact it's only okay, but the fact that environments can be used to the player's advantage at all adds a whole new level of depth to each encounter. Endlessly popping enemies with my silence revolver remained fun during the entirety of my first playthrough not because the mechanic itself was all that deep, but because each new encounter gave me a new environment with a new set of enemy placements to comprehend and act on. Overall, Cyberpunk's gameplay is fun, but I wouldn't be surprised if many people didn't get to find their niche due to the unintuitive way that so many facets of the progression are conveyed to the player. I didn't go in-depth into cyberware in this section because I already mentioned it during progression, but I imagine that many players have settled into playstyles that utilize those as well. So now that both a meeting with a client and the flathead pickup are out of the way, V and Jackie go to the afterlife, where they're soon to meet Dex and T-Bug to move forward on the heist. There's an important thing I need to note here about the dialogue. As most of you likely already know, your choice in life path unlocks unique dialogue options that pop up every once in a while. What you might not have known is that sometimes, V's dialogue will be altered by your choice in life path and you won't even realize it. For example, as the two enter the bar, Jackie remarks how the afterlife used to be a morgue. And if you're on the street kid life path, V will respond that he was the one who told Jackie that a long time ago. I much prefer minor alterations like like this to awkwardly place dialogue options that almost never do anything genuinely useful. It's a shame that CDPR didn't just scrap the useless dialogue system in its entirety and focus on having more variations that play out automatically based on which life path you chose. After the two sit down at the bar, the game deliberately draws attention to a fixer named Rogue who will become important later in the story. Soon after, they both get called over to the back room to talk with Dex and T-Bug about the heist. When you meet with Dex, you have the option to tell him that Evelyn offered to cut him out of the deal. <laughs> if you do so, he will automatically upgrade your fee to 40% instead of the standard rate of 30. Otherwise, you would have to bicker to earn that privilege. As we'll soon see, none of this ends up mattering, but it's nice that you have the opportunity to tell him nonetheless. Before we go on, we need to quickly talk about Heist from GTA 5. Prior GTA games had heists, but in GTA 5 they were elevated to a whole new level of quality for three key reasons. There was sufficient build-up preceding them, the player was given meaningful input as to how they would play out, and they were fun and engaging spectacles. While Cyberpunk 2077 has failed to provide an adequate build-up to V-Station in life, the one thing it manages to do well in the pacing department is build up to this heist. Yes, the mission with Evelyn was terrible, but at least it served as a ramp to ease the pacing of the story and 
the gear in preparation for this big moment. And the Flathead mission was simply great. It played out as a much more complicated version of those heist preparation missions in GTA V. Unfortunately, it is followed up by what is simply a flat out disappointing climax, by failing at the other two things that made heist in GTA V interesting. At no point do you get to make any decisions related to the planning or execution of this heist. It's just a series of linear, highly scripted sequences that are an absolute chore to endure during subsequent playthroughs. The second massive failing is that the spectacle associated with GTA V's heist is all but absent in the heist we're about to go over. The car ride is fine. It pretty much just plays out like a cutscene and has some relatively good enough dialogue. However, when V and Jackie arrive at Compeki Plaza, disguised as Militech agents, the problems begin to rear their ugly heads. The player is forced to go through sequence after sequence of just walking around without anything to do. Inquisitive sounding dialogue options pop up a few times, but you literally can't fail these. They're entirely pointless. In fact, due to the nature of Cyberpunk's mission design, the only way you can fail story missions is to die. And while people might criticize GTA for flashing mission failed whenever the player steps off the narrow track intended by the developer, that's still preferable to not having any non-death fail states in these missions at all, because the alternative is very immersion breaking. There's an optional area you can visit before going upstairs, but unless you're really desperate to see Hideyoshi Yoshima, this area is entirely pointless. After the two get to their room, there's just more waiting around as unskippable conversations play out. This part has the exact same problem as the brain dance sequences. It's just not fun gameplay to wait around and then do the precise thing that the game tells you to do. At that point, you're no longer playing the game. The game is playing you. All of this painful linearity finally leads to the infiltration of Yorinobu's room. Other than the optional objective to pick up Yorinobu's gun, all that's left to do is to steal the biochip which you've already located during the brain dance sequence at Lizzie's. This next part is by far the worst story moment in the entire game. Perhaps one of the worst story moments out of every one of CDPR's games, period. So many plot holes and coincidences are concentrated into this one singular moment that I can't help but wonder if it was CDPR's goal to make this part as bad as it is. Like some kind of sick joke or something. Most people regard CDPR as a studio that is renowned for their game's well-written stories, but I couldn't disagree more with this premise. The main stories in every one of CDPR's previous games, The Witcher 1, 2, and yes, The Witcher 3, are plagued with plot holes and generally sloppy execution to the extent that I'd call them mostly bad. The Witcher series does deserve praise for its writing, however. Not for the messy, unfinished main stories, but for their game's generally solid world building. Throughout The Witcher 3's 100 plus hours of side content, there are remarkably few drops in quality. In a world where Bethesda or you Ubisoft tier world building is the norm, The Witcher 3 was a remarkable breath of fresh air in terms of the care and attention put into its world making sense. No one played The Witcher 3 for its main story. Hell, The Witcher 3 didn't even play itself for its main story. At every possible opportunity, The Witcher 3's main story veered away from the search for Ciri and into something the player had some hope of appreciating without having to read seven books. The hunt for the Griffin, the Bloody Baron saga, working with the gangs of Novigrad, these might as well have been side quests. They have nothing to do with the main story of The Witcher 3, and were painfully shoehorned into being part of Geralt's search for Ciri. For example, the first act of The Witcher 3 is split into three parts, Velen, Novigrad, and Skellige, which the player is heavily encouraged to do in that order. In Velen, Geralt finds Uma, who at the time seems completely irrelevant to his search for Ciri. In Novigrad, Geralt finds Dandelion, who knows some elven words that Ciri kept chanting to herself. And in Skellige, Geralt learns that Uma is somehow connected to his search for Ciri, and connects that those magic words might be able to remove his curse. Not only does the contrived nature of these three plot points deeply harm the story's overall structure, but it's a massive plot hole that Uma just happened to be in Velen. It's painfully obvious that CDPR thought out these three quest lines first, and lazily added these tidbits of context to make them all come together in the end. And then after a serviceable chapter centered around defending Kaer Morin, the plot just crumbles in on itself in a fantastic blaze of glory. So, on this particular night, 
when V and Jackie are robbing Yorinobu's room, it just so happens that Yorinobu's father, Saburu, decides to visit his son in this very room. Two coincidences off the bat. V and Jackie hide behind a one-way screen that exists for some reason. If you delay, Adam Smasher walks in and kills V, even if you choose a much better place to hide. Both Adam Smasher and Saburu's bodyguard, Takemura, leave the room so the two can talk in private. During this conversation, Saburu states that he knows that Yorinobu took something from him. It's not directly stated, but Saburo is obviously referring to the biochip that V and Jackie are currently in the process of stealing. After the conversation gets more heated, Yorinobu takes his father and slams him against the glass, killing him and leaving a very obvious bloodstain behind. He then proceeds to inform Saburo's bodyguard Takamura that his father has been poisoned, and everyone just fucking accepts it! Saburo's blood isn't even fucking dry yet, and, and everyone just accepts this untrustworthy the brat's word that his father was poisoned when there's a giant bloody gash on the back of his goddamn head. The motherfucking cherry on the top of this clusterfuck Sunday is that V witnessing Saburu's murder becomes a pivotal plot point moving forward. For some dumb fuck reason, everyone just continues to accept that Saburo was poisoned and V's testimony is what is needed to bring Yorinobu to justice. Let me repeat that, V's TESTIMONY is what is needed. The game just spent a considerable amount of its runtime establishing that technology exists that is capable of recording 3D recreations of lived experiences, but V doesn't have access to this technology for no good reason! The game doesn't even try to wave this away with some shitty explanation, like some such software being disabled for discretion during the heist. The story just forgets about this major plot point that it intentionally drew focus to earlier. Why does this random thug on the street have access to this massively useful technology that allows him to record his experiences, but V doesn't. Why the fuck doesn't everyone have this technology installed? The vast majority of cyberpunk science fiction doesn't even attempt to apply its rules in any interesting ways. It's just bad and shallow and manages to undermine the most important plot point in the entire game. After everyone leaves, Jackie and V exit their hiding place and radio in T-Bug, whom they barely get to talk to before she gets killed by another netrunner. The two attempt to flee through the door that leads to a very precarious ledge instead of the door that leads to nice safe stairs. Some VTOLs shoot at them, prompting them to jump off and tumble into another part of the building. All of a sudden, the two aren't being chased anymore, for some reason, but the containment of the biochip has been compromised. The only way to save it is to insert it into someone's head, for some reason. So that's exactly what Jackie does. The two make their way through the patrols via either stealth or combat until they make it to the Del Main limo that brought them to the hotel. Hell. After a close call with Adam Smasher, somehow they manage to escape the Arasaka drones that are pursuing them, which in turn makes Arasaka look really, really incompetent. On the drive to the meeting with Dex, Jackie's condition worsens. After removing the biochip and inserting it into V's head, Jackie dies on the seat next to him. After choosing where Delamain is to take Jackie's body, V solemnly makes his way up to Dex's room at the Notel Motel. Dex is angry that the heist went poorly. He thinks that V is the one who killed Saburo. The game doesn't let you refute this. None of the dialogue options let V say, No, Jackie and I weren't involved. Yorinobu is the culprit, and that is so goddamn irritating because of what happens next. Just like the beginning of the game, V is stuck looking at himself in a mirror, and just like that moment, he is alone, which is admittedly some nice and effective symbolism. And after leaving the bathroom, Dex betrays V and shoots him in the head. This really fucking annoys me because Dex's actions are completely defensible from his perspective. He thinks he's harboring Saburo Arasaka's murderer because V was too stupid to say anything. The title screen flashes, welcome to Cyberpunk 2077. I'm conflicted about whether or not it was the right move to kill off Jackie. He was the player's welcoming hand as they entered the world of Cyberpunk. And and now he's gone. His death does manage to be impactful because of how similar his station in life was to that of V's. It could have just as easily been V who died tonight but it wasn't. What Jackie's death earns the story in stakes, however, it loses in the player's attachment to this world. Jackie was it. 
he is alone now. And while the themes do land, Jackie's absence does harm the connection that the player will have to the world going forward. There are multiple characters whom they try to replace him with, but none really strike the same vibe as Jackie did, two friends facing down Night City together. The mess that is Act 1 is a direct result of CDPR rushing to get to this point in the story as fast as possible. The reason for this will become apparent after what happens next. The game abruptly transports the player into the perspective of an unknown character in an unknown location. Oh, who the fuck am I kidding? Literally everyone playing the game will immediately know that V is living out a memory of Johnny Silverhand, who is played by Keanu Reeves. While I have nothing against Keanu personally, I'm going to be upfront in saying that I think all of the John Wick Matrix and Bill and Ted movies are overrated, by a decent margin. Also, I just can't get over how bad Siberia was. Why the hell would anyone agree to star in a movie like that? With that said, I really don't hate Keanu's performance here as much as some people do. Many people say that his voice acting feels phoned in, but I really don't think that that's a legitimate gripe for reasons we'll get into later. Johnny Silverhand is an edgelord rock star who hates Arasaka with all his heart. For now, we're given the understanding that he holds heartfelt beliefs about Arasaka being an evil empire of doom. The player first gains control of Johnny during his last performance before he leaves to launch an epic assault on Arasaka Tower in the not-so-subtle year of 2023. This section passively introduces the player to a few characters, Carrie Uridine, Rogue, and most importantly, the one and only Spider Murphy, a character who is so important that she never gets brought up again after this mission. Or does she? What ensues is a series of action sequences that I much prefer to the slow, tedious nature of the heist we just went through. Johnny plants a bomb in an elevator, and after some melodrama between him and Rogue, the section climaxes with Johnny failing to make it to the helicopter in time and getting subdued by Adam Smasher. Johnny somehow gets transported down to street level instead of getting airlifted away. When he wakes up, he's in an unknown location far away from Arasaka Tower. He's being interrogated by Arasaka henchmen, but this gets interrupted when Saburo Arasaka walks into the room and tells his henchmen to leave. It's around this point when the player might notice that there's a mushroom cloud in the backdrop of this scene. The bomb that Johnny planted wasn't just meant to melt steel beams, it was a nuclear bomb. After some bantering, a program called Soul Killer gets engaged and things go dark. Suddenly, V finds himself in a digital recreation of Arasaka HQ. This sequence ends with Johnny asking V who he is. V wakes up in a landfill and crawls forward, only to be found by Dexter Deshawn and Takemura. In quite the shocking turn of events, Takemura kills Dex without the slightest hesitation. Takemura then radios into Yorinobu to inform him that he has found his father's killer. When V talks, Takemura slaps him so hard that he temporarily blacks out, heavily implying that he is still completely loyal to Yorinobu and believes his word that his father was poisoned. V blacks out again, this time for a few hours, and when he wakes up, Takemura is in pain and hands via stimulant. This won't be clear to all players, but Takemura has just had his cyberware shut down, just like what happened to V during the Corpo Life Path intro. If it wasn't clear already, the motorcycle assassin sent by Arasaka might give it away that Yorinobu has betrayed Takemura and has ordered both him and V to be killed. The question that comes to mind is, why? From everything we've seen, Takemura was entirely obedient to Yorinobu just a minute ago, but for some reason he suddenly decided to betray his loyal henchman for absolutely no reason. If Takemura had any inclination to betray Yorinobu, the game completely fails to convey that in this instance. This chase sequence is probably the most impressive set piece in the game. I can't think of another action sequence that gave me the illusion of control better than this one. It's a far cry from flying a crop duster into the cargo bay of a private military's massive cargo transport plane, but it's decent in its own right. Takemura, burdened with pain and the assassin attacking the vehicle, crashes into a billboard and drags V out of the car. We're left with the impression that Takemura had a change of heart when Yorinobu betrayed him, because now he cares deeply about V's survival. All of this exposition is poorly conveyed to the player. I understand it all now that I've gone through it a few times, but for most players I imagine this whole part of the game will just be confusing. It probably wasn't the best idea for Takemura's character to go through such a drastic change of heart during such a chaotic action sequence. Using Delamain services, V and Takemura drive to Vic's place, where they're both treated for their injuries. 
It's easy to forgive the average player for wondering what the ever-loving fuck is going on during this part of the game. Jackie dies. Dex shoots V in the head. Johnny who? V is alive for some reason. The top bodyguard for the Arasaka Corporation kills Dex and kidnaps V. And then all of a sudden, Arasaka attacks him and suddenly he's on your side? Yeah, all of this is poorly presented and unnecessarily confusing. This next section, however, attempts to slow the pace down and explain to the player what the hell is going on. V wakes up in the late evening and the player is subjected to an unskippable conversation with Victor inside his clinic. Through the ensuing conversation, V learns that the biochip they stole was a prototype personality construct that is gradually overriding his consciousness with that of Johnny Silverhands. This process started after Dex shot V with a low caliber bullet that killed him but didn't cause any permanent brain brain damage. This prototype biochip proceeded to release nanites that fix the damage. The bottom line is that removing this biochip will kill V. And as things stand, V only has a few weeks to live. While there aren't any earth-shattering issues with any of this, there are a handful of minor ones that need to be addressed. Firstly, this whole scenario just seems like a contrived shoehorn explanation as to why Keanu Reeves gets to be your buddy for the rest of the game. There is no interesting sci-fi here. The rules about how the biochip work exist solely to justify this one plot point without any truly interesting ramifications resulting from the established context. Secondly, despite only having a few weeks to live, after this point, the player can waste as much time as they want and nothing ever happens. This was obviously done for gameplay reasons, but it's disappointing to once again see CDPR refusing to take risks, like implementing some system of time like in Dead Rising or Disco Elysium. So at this point, I feel like it's safe to assume that the purpose of Saburo storing Johnny's engram in the first place was to torture him in some way later down the line. None of that is directly stated anywhere that I know of, but it's a plausible assumption to make. What's left unexplained is how exactly did Johnny's engram get onto the specific prototype that's designed to write over somebody's consciousness. Once again, it just makes this whole circumstance feel contrived. Fourthly, it just really annoys me that the last thing that Jackie did before he died was remove the biochip that would have saved his life were he have kept it in. I know that neither of them had a way of knowing that the biochip would have saved his life, but how close Jackie was to surviving really does annoy me nonetheless. Not really a plot hole, more so just an annoyance. None of these problems single-handedly break the story in two, but they do serve to weaken its overall integrity. V is still weak, so Misty wheelchairs him into his room, where she gives him two bottles of pills. One that will stall the progression of the transformation, and another that will accelerate it. Before leaving, she also gives V the bullet that Vic pulled out of his head, and there's some optional dialogue regarding Jackie. V goes to sleep, but kind of wakes up to Johnny Silver handling against a wall before he taunts V up close. After the screen cuts to black, V wakes up again, only to see Johnny leaning against the same wall, banging his head redundantly. He asks V for a smoke, followed by some confusing dialogue, and upon walking away, Johnny rematerializes in front of V and pushes him to the ground. They point at each other, Johnny beats V's head against the window, V tries to take the Omega blockers that will subdue Johnny, and then Johnny swats him away before he can. But V manages to crawl over to the pills and take one, and Johnny doesn't do anything about it for some reason. I'll come back to this scene in a moment. Sometime later, V finds himself in the shower, where there are some very very inaccurate refraction effects in the water shader, I might add. He then stands up, possibly gets dressed, and leaves his apartment. This is where a crucial problem with Cyberpunk 2077 rears its ugly head. From this point onward, the player will be hit with an unprecedented wave of information, largely consisting of text. This is yet another example of Cyberpunk 2077 trying to be like GTA 5 and failing. GTA 5 had occasional texts and emails that were meant to make the world in its characters feel more alive. The player was even able to respond to some of these messages with a preset response. Two things to note about these messages, however. They were easy to access and didn't require the player to open some full screen menu. Everything was handled on a phone. Secondly, reading text was never required to gain access to side missions. In Cyberpunk 2077, when you get a message, a notification pops up for a few seconds before disappearing. If you press the indicated button to read the message 
message immediately, you can read and reply to the message in a little unobtrusive box that pops up. However, if you miss this narrow timing window, the only way to access messages is by going into the message page in your journal and fishing through what eventually becomes a sea of messages to find the one you actually want to reply to. And this isn't some optional feature. Replying to messages is necessary to unlock certain side quests, and the game just doesn't communicate this well. It would have been much more preferable if all the messaging was handled in that unobtrusive window that popped up instead of hidden away in some menu somewhere. In addition to calls and messages, the game just decides to dump all of the additional fights on the player at this one moment, adding to the barrage of information that the player just won't be able to process effectively. There's also the side job involving V's neighbor that gets shoved in your face, an optional interaction with Wilson, the gun store owner, there's some exposition on the elevator ride down about the death of the mayor, and you get a text from Jackie's mother that seems urgent and leads to an optional phone call that leads to an optional side job. And that's not even to mention the text from Delamain reflecting your choice as to where you told it to send Jackie, the text from the building administrator telling V that he can pick up his car from a nearby parking lot, the cryptic text you keep getting from the Bartmos Collective, or the barrage of unnecessary car ads that fixers will start sending V from this point forward. I mean, seriously, why do fixers keep sending V car advertisements like their microtransactions? What the hell was CDPR thinking with this? I've heard people defending this sudden barrage of information, claiming that it's an intentional design decision to convey what it's like living in Night City. But no, that's a terrible excuse. Other than the sloppy introduction of Regina during the beginning of Act 1, important information is relayed much more thoughtfully, and fundamentally nothing has changed. The game just suddenly decides that it has to rush all this information to the player immediately for no reason. I really don't understand why many of these messages couldn't have been petered out over the next hour or so of gameplay. The most important thing that happens around this time is the call that V gets from Takemura, who wants V to meet him at a nearby diner. This meeting is pivotal because it maps out the course of events that will take place for most of the rest of the game. Takemura, now believing that Yorinobu murdered his father, requests V's help in bringing him to justice. But here's the thing again, Takemura wants V's testimony, fully solidifying the fact that Braindance technology only exists when it's convenient for the plot. And even if the Braindance technology couldn't be used because of some half-assed excuse that the game doesn't even bother providing, why couldn't V's memories be scanned in the same way that Johnny's were over 50 years ago? V isn't merely valuable because of his testimony, his memories contain proof of Yorinobu's guilt. Let me repeat this, the game has gone out of its way to establish not one, but two technologies that could be used to obtain this proof, but somehow no one ever brings either of these possibilities up. Seriously, what's the point of all these science fiction ideas if they're not going to be applied in any interesting ways? Takemura states that he is a fugitive, but if his current situation is anything like V's, then he really doesn't have anything to worry about. Arasaka never makes an effort to hunt down V for the murder of Saburo Arasaka, which doesn't make all that much sense. If the player sent Jackie's body to Vix, Arasaka was able to intercept it, which means that they know who V's acquaintances are and, from that, how to track him down. Act 2 suffers because it wants the player to accept that Arasaka is both an all-powerful and menacing entity, and apparently too apathetic to track down the supposed murderer of their CEO. V is reluctant to help at first, but Takemura manages to convince him by suggesting that Arasaka is V's best hope of survival. There are two main leads that are established here, and a third that gets introduced later on. Track down Evelyn, track down Hellman, the creator of the relic that's inside V's head, and speak to Odo, a former ally of Takemura's who works for Arasaka. Two of these leads turn into something somewhat unrelated before their runtime is over. V's search for Evelyn turns into a search for Alt Cunningham, a netrunner whose consciousness was transported to the net in 2013. The other example of this is Takemura initially needing to meet with Odo, then deciding that their priority is to find a way to infiltrate the Arasaka parade in order to speak to Hanako Arasaka, Saburo's daughter. With this context, we can more accurately describe the three leads as follows. Track down Alt Cunningham, track down Hellman, and hack Hanako Arasaka's parade float. Upon completing the latter two, the story mission where V and Takemura infiltrate the parade will be unlocked. Then it is required to complete both the parade mission and find Alt Cunningham before getting access to the game's finale. 
It wasn't my goal to allocate too much time discussing bugs, but on all three of my playthroughs, at this exact point, a man materializes behind Takemura and proceeds to slide his way past his head and out the door. After Takemura leaves, Johnny materializes and is surprisingly friendly with V, who is justifiably confused after Johnny beat his head against the wall during their previous encounter. So, what's Johnny's justification for becoming a nice guy all of a sudden? Well. Johnny, uh, thought it over a bit, and, uh, decided that he was going to be a nice guy all of a sudden. For me, this is a terrible answer. It really feels like the previous exchange only existed to provide some dramatic tension in a moment that really didn't need it. Later on, we'll learn more about Johnny's character and what he really wants, and I'm not sure Johnny's initial reaction makes all that much sense in hindsight. So yeah, from this point onward, Johnny Silverhand is an Arkham Knight Joker-esque companion that lives in V's head and serves as a sharp contrast to V's relatively subdued personality. This is why the beginning of the game was in such a rush to get itself over with. Johnny often comments on things during side missions, and CDPR didn't want the player to miss out on too much of that. For example, the Monk mission that was available in Act 1 had parts where Johnny popped up and gave his thoughts on what was taking place, but we didn't get to see that earlier because Johnny wasn't inside V's head yet. While the state of the prologue in Act 1 remain inexcusable, I can understand why CDPR didn't want to waste too much time before introducing Johnny. There are no obvious solutions to this problem without restructuring huge swaths of the game. Many people have compared this point in Cyberpunk to right after the opening of Fallout 4, because at this point in both games, there's a serious conflict between the player's and character's motivations. I don't think that Cyberpunk is just like Fallout 4 in this regard, I think that it's much, much worse. In Fallout 4, your attention is split in two directions, exploration and finding your son. At at this point in Cyberpunk, your attention is divided between tracking down Ev, tracking down Hellman, all of the random side jobs that were just thrust on your lap, and good old exploration. Things become even more convoluted when Takemura calls and tells V to meet him by the docks. Say what you want about Fallout 4, but this problem in Cyberpunk is many, many times worse. But wait a second, why exactly wasn't this such a big problem in The Witcher 3? I mean, very similarly to Cyberpunk, The Witcher 3's main story presents three leads on Ciri and a massive open world to explore at the same time. The answer to this question is threefold. Firstly, the oppressive leveling system and more active nature of the world as a whole discourage exploration and pursuing too many side quests early on. Secondly, the player is heavily encouraged to explore the three leads in a linear order. And thirdly, no one but book readers cared the slightest bit about Ciri. And since the average player couldn't care less about Ciri, they were free to interpret story quests as glorified side quests instead of of a desperate means to an end to find Geralt's surrogate daughter and the child of the Elder Blood blah blah blah. I'm sure that many players will want to find Ciri for no other reason than to make Geralt happy, but enjoying the moment to moment experience is bound to be the average player's priority over finding some child of legend or some such nonsense. The player is now allowed to freely explore the entirety of Night City in the Badlands. Well, most of it at least. If you drive over the range of hills that separate Night City from the Northern Badlands, the game resets the player's position. I have no idea why they decided to prevent the player from crossing over this part of the map. Part of this area is dedicated to one of the game's ending sequences, but that's a really poor excuse when you realize that as of this point in the game, the player is entirely uninhibited from walking up to the Arasaka residence and just jumping over the gate. But if you come here early, the guards aren't even hostile to you. Realistically, none of this matters. The player will likely spend a decent amount of time gawking at all of the new sites that they have access to. But let's take a closer look at Night City itself. From the suburbs of Rancho Coronado to the towering mega-buildings of the Corpo Plaza, Night City can be breathtaking to look at. Some areas feel as if they weren't given as much attention, however. The North Oaks fails to pull off the Hollywood Hills vibe due to its pitiful scale, and huge portions of Pacifica just feel like cut content. If I had to level a criticism of the city as a whole, it would be that it doesn't really capture the true feeling of being a cyberpunk metropolis. The reason I say this is mostly due to Night City's lack of scale. In most cyberpunk movies, these futuristic metropolises are portrayed as sprawling off as far as the eye can see, and Night City simply doesn't do that. The city as a whole just feels more like a cyberpunk amusement park than a cyberpunk city, but that was inevitable. Just look at how bad cyberpunk runs on last-gen consoles. Now imagine how bad it would be running if Night City sprawled 
singled out even further. As there are parts of the map that don't live up to the high standards set by Night City itself, however. The northern and southern parts of the map are mostly void of content. The Badlands and its various outposts feel like they belong in the Ubisoft game, and the less said about the mountain of trash, the better. In my opinion, it would have been objectively better to limit the play space to just Night City, and leave the surrounding areas as a distant backdrop. Even in Night City itself, there are some oddities, such as at least one highway without traffic. But overall, it's probably the most visually detailed city in any game ever. I recently got the chance to play Assassin's Creed Unity, and it's quite interesting to think about the similarities that these two games share, both being next-gen games with very detailed cities that released in a buggy state. While the environment of Paris is more dense with interactable elements, Night City is the clear winner when it comes to sheer detail. Massive mega buildings blocking out huge portions of the sky might be the first thing to catch your eye, but it's a superfluous clutter and numerous uniquely detailed interiors which manage to impress the most. Wondering why Cyberpunk runs so poorly on last-gen consoles, the sheer environmental detail is likely the primary factor. Even as dialed back as these things are on last-gen consoles, the poor little outdated CPUs just can't keep up. The Witcher 3's Novigrad was certainly very detailed, but the fact that so much of the detail was static helped those poor little guys chug along. In Cyberpunk, a surprising amount of the clutter has physics properties attached to it, and the civilian AI, despite being pretty lackluster, is still more complicated than that of The Witcher 3. People were surprised to see Cyberpunk running so poorly on last-gen consoles. I'm surprised it's running at all. However, The Witcher 3 is not the first game that people are apt to compare Cyberpunk to. That honor goes to GTA 5. It seems like every open-world game that takes place in a city environment is presumed to be a GTA clone. Open worlds and Rockstar games are renowned for feeling polished and reliable, and those two descriptors couldn't be less true about Cyberpunk's open world. In addition to the surplus of jank, the wanted system is absolutely terrible, even after the patch. Police no longer spawn out of nowhere, but there's nothing exciting about a drone slowly flying towards you either. Cyberpunk's wanted system does manage to be a direct improvement over that of The Witcher 3, but that wasn't exactly a high bar to clear. The reality is that the wanted system in both of CDPR's games aren't there for the player's amusement. They're there to discourage certain activities. Whether Cyberpunk 2077 needed a wanted system at all is a legitimate question to ask. I don't really find this half-assed wanted system to be all that big of a problem for the same reason I didn't in The Witcher 3. Sure, both are bad, but sandbox gameplay isn't the appeal of either game. One thing I will defend Cyberpunk on is how its pedestrians compare to that of GTA 5. While it's true that Cyberpunk's traffic is less than subpar, pedestrians in both games are equally boring and pointless. Neither offer up any interesting gameplay opportunities. For the most part, interesting civvies died with GTA 4. Cyberpunk 2077's open world is not a sandbox open world. It's an outpost open world, and it should be judged accordingly. You wouldn't judge GTA 5's open world on the strengths of its outposts, what few it has, so you shouldn't judge Cyberpunk's open world on its mostly non-existent dynamic elements either. What you can judge Cyberpunk 2 in relation to GTA is its driving. While obviously not intended to facilitate dynamic high-speed pursuits, driving in Cyberpunk works, but only as a means to get from point A to point B, not as a fun mechanic in and of itself. Where GTA 5's vehicle physics are intended to give the player as much control as possible while remaining bound to a coherent physics simulation, Cyberpunk's vehicle handling is clunky and shallow. The only notable skill curve to master is learning how to turn corners efficiently. There is no attempt to make aerial tricks, off-road navigation, or interactions between vehicles the slightest bit interesting. Feel free to hate it, but don't act surprised. In the same way that The Witcher 3 was not an equestrian simulation, Cyberpunk is not a vehicle simulation. A quite disappointing aspect of vehicles is that they are poorly integrated with the rest of the gameplay. Even in The Witcher 3, roach could be used during combat, so it's bizarre that they didn't think to incorporate vehicular combat in the Cyberpunk's gameplay loop. At the very least, I would have appreciated it if V was able to jump off motorcycles in the same way that you can jump off horses in the newer Assassin's Creed games. It just feels disjointed to drive up to an objective and awkwardly dismount the vehicle. The animation for exiting vehicles is very stiff and jerky, by the way. The other big complaint I have with the vehicles is how unreliable it is to summon them. Vehicles will spawn in the ground, spawn on distant roads, and drive away from you more often than they should. Other than running around everywhere, the alternative to driving is fast travel. And, well, it's the same as it was in The Witcher 3, but now fast travel points are much closer together. I still think that it's stupid that you can't just fast travel from any point on the map, but the fact that a fast travel terminal is never that far away does alleviate this problem a bit. 
Another facet of Cyberpunk's world that the player will inevitably pick up on are the presence of various factions that serve as generic enemies for the player to kill. Cyberpunk's factions are pretty bad in my opinion. Most tend to be nothing more than a stereotype with no additional depth or aspirations to make them interesting. The Voodoo Boys are kind of an exception, but every other faction feels like the same vaguely psychotic bunch of yahoos that aimlessly compete with each other for power and influence. That is an oversimplification, but my point still stands. I guess they serve their purpose as visually interesting targets for the player to shoot at, but if you were hoping for them to be more interesting because of their distinct ideals or unique aspirations, such as the factions of Fallout New Vegas or Deus Ex Human Revolution, you're gonna be left disappointed. I have no idea where else to put this, so let's briefly touch on Cyberpunk's TV and internet. Both of these things were obviously inspired by their parallels in GTA, and in just about every way they're inferior to their counterparts. TV is bland and somehow an even lower quality render compared to that of GTA. It serves its purpose as filler media that plays on TVs that you pass around Night City, but I wouldn't watch it unironically like the TV in GTA. The internet is an even bigger letdown. I get the internet never existed in classic Cyberpunk punk media, which means that the general concept would have to be adapted to fit the genre, but what we ended up with is just dull. Pages don't feel like actual websites. There isn't any in-game search engine that they're built into. You just select one of the few sites that you have access to from a menu. This alone makes the internet feel a hell of a lot more like a handful of PDFs in the World Wide Web. And that's not even taking into account the bland nature of the design of the sites themselves. There is one website that actually works really well in the context of a particular killer quest, but we won't get into that for a few more hours. Next, we move on to graphics. Most modern AAA games, especially the open world ones, aim to be visually striking first and visually detailed second. While I don't outright hate the visually striking approach, I find it much more impressive when developers put in the effort to create environments and assets that hold up under scrutiny, rather than just flooding the screen with volumetric god rays that stretch out across massive landscapes that look great at a glance. To better understand this, let's take a look at how the environments of Red Dead Redemption 2 and Kingdom Come Deliverance compare when examined up close. Kingdom Come Deliverance has much more detailed assets than Red Dead Redemption 2, and while many will just dismiss this shortcoming by stating that Red Dead Redemption 2 has a much bigger world and therefore can get away with having lower quality assets, I disagree. Rockstar games are known for their cutting edge visuals, and if there's any area where some glorified indie studio is showing them up, I'd call that an L. Anyways, I hope that this footage speaks for itself. While I don't think that it would be accurate to say that Red Dead Redemption 2's world is and detailed, there is a clear difference in priorities when it came to designing the visual presentation of these two open worlds. While the LODs are far superior in Red Dead Redemption 2, it's undeniable that War Horse Studios put much more effort into ensuring that every square inch of its world is presentable than Rockstar did with theirs. Red Dead Redemption 2 did have some nice aspects to its visual presentation, but it was disappointing to discover that some aspects of Red Dead Redemption 2's visuals were a downgrade from GTA 5. Cyberpunk, like The Witcher 3 before it, manages to strike a balance between being visually striking and being visually detailed. As a whole, the assets used to construct Night City hold up under scrutiny, but there are some specific areas where things are much more variable. I don't know what the environmental artists were thinking with this soupy mess that I believe is meant to represent an oil spill. It just doesn't manage to pull off the illusion. Same with the texture work underlying the mountain of trash in the underwater bed. It's also worth noting that the reactive elements of the surface simulation is a huge downgrade from that of The Witcher 3. However, Cyberpunk has no shortage of high points in terms of both being visually striking and visually detailed. The authenticity of most surfaces is often realized through high quality textures, but the material work often pulls its weight as well. Most notable is the material work done for wet pavement, which simulates light playing off of its surface in a more striking way than I've ever seen in any game. One of the most observable ways Cyberpunk's visual presentation boasts its detailed nature is the density of NPCs that can fill the screen at any given time, even though it has the same issues with reusing NPC models that The Witcher 3 had. One thing that CDPR has improved since The Witcher 3 is the lighting, which now utilizes volumetrics to simulate light reflecting off of particles in the air. A more subtle aspect of Cyberpunk's visual presentation would be the bloom and lens flare effects, which in addition to matching the Cyberpunk aesthetic, are probably the best I've seen in any game. A sneaker hit for Cyberpunk's graphical presentation is the destructibility of its environments. While nothing compared to the madness of Red Faction Gorilla, 
Nebula. The number of physics objects and the fidelity at which they break far exceeds that of GTA 5. My favorite are these advertisements that use the same destruction system that much of the glass does, but the occasional concrete pillar that can be shipped away at is impressive as well. There's also a magazine rack model that's absolutely amazing. Each magazine is its own physics object, which means that upon tipping it over, the individual magazines will often fall down and scatter about in interesting ways. The problem is that these objects rarely seem to be situated around places where firefights take place. It would have been amazing to look around after a firefight and see all the specific, non-scripted destruction that had been wrought, but moments like that are very rare. All of these effects I just mentioned are wholly inconsistent and rarely utilized in interesting ways, but when the destructible environments are at their best, they far surpass that of GTA 5. But those clickbait comparison videos wouldn't tell you that. Lastly, I'd like to praise the game's reasonable install size, and the inclusion of a dynamic resolution scaler, which allowed me to hit a respectable FPS during much of my playtime. It also goes without saying that Cyberpunk's ray tracing features add to its visual presentation, but since I haven't been able to get a hold of an RTX GPU, I can't study those features as much as I'd like. Another more overlooked aspect of Cyberpunk's presentation is the game's soundtrack. Cyberpunk's soundtrack has some really good tracks that complement specific scenes perfectly, but as a whole, there aren't too many tracks that stand out. In my opinion, too many tracks fall into one of two categories, overly ambient monotony and a cat trying not to drown. The Witcher 3 soundtrack was truly great, having specific themes that complemented each region perfectly, but this attention to detail isn't as well expressed in Cyberpunk's score. I tried to use Cyberpunk's soundtrack as much as I could for background music during this video, but I often found myself reaching for the Deus Ex OSTs to find the right match instead. Alrighty, before continuing with the main story, let's go over a few more side jobs. At some point, the player might come across one of the tarot cards, which introduces them to Fool on the Hill, a side job that tasks the player with scanning the 20 tarot glitches, the location of which are visible on the in-game map. In my opinion, this mission was missed opportunity to encourage exploration. If scanning these cards offered something useful in return, they could have been used as a lure to get the player to travel around and unlock fast travel points early on. As it stands, this side job is an adequate distraction. The conclusion serves as somewhat interesting foreshadowing to the conclusion of the game, bonus points for letting the player scan them from a vehicle. That one factor helps the side job feel a hell of a lot less like padding than it otherwise would have. Next, there's a really short mission where you visit Wakako in Japantown, and she gives me instructions to visit a Ripper to pick up a smart weapon compatible cyberware implant. This side job is really bizarre. I think it's meant to serve as a formal introduction to Wakako, like I suggested all the fixtures should have, but it kind of feels pointless and out of place, considering that V already knows Wakako. This might be an afterthought for the average player at this point in the game, but some might remember that side job that was introduced where those two cops were knocking on V's neighbor's door. I hate this side mission because it breaks one of the few rules that Cyberpunk's dialogue system always abides by. Blue dialogue options are optional. After agreeing to check up on Barry, a co-worker of the two cops who has recently left the force, V comes back and gets led into his apartment. Barry tells V that his best friend Andrew recently died of old age, a suspicious rare occurrence for someone living in Night City. Selecting a blue dialogue option will reveal that Andrew has a niche, which is essentially a tombstone ashbox thing, at the Columbarium on a hillside overlooking Night City. The huge problem is that the objective telling the player to find the niche doesn't come up unless they select this specific dialogue option, and if the player doesn't know that they need to find Andrew's niche, they will end up failing the mission when Barry kills himself a while later. This is the only instance where a blue dialogue option isn't optional for quest progression. Many players will surely be left baffled upon failing this quest, and what's worse, it might trick them into thinking that Cyberpunk 2077 has timed quests, which it doesn't. After finding the niche, it's revealed that Andrew wasn't a person, he was a tortoise, and after telling the cops about Barry's troubled mental state, they talk to him and there's an implied happy ending. This side job had such potential as a way to get the player to visit the Columbarium where a few people who who die later in the game end up getting a niche. For example, Jackie already has a niche set up for him, and it can be a really cool moment when you discover that on your own. 
At some point, the player might realize that they don't have a car, and upon reading through the barrage of text messages they were just bombarded with, they might discover the text that says that their car is waiting to be picked up in a nearby parking garage. What starts as a simple objective spirals into a massive questline, however, as V's car is immediately rammed by a rogue Delamain limo, which prompts V to visit Delamain HQ for recompense. Delamain proceeds to explain that a bunch of his automated cars have gone rogue and are exhibiting unique personality traits, and he wants to hire V to retrieve them. I like these side jobs quite a lot, though the quality of each retrieval does vary. Some merely consist of driving to a certain point and waiting through a glorified cutscene, one suffers from overly rigid pathing, and one in particular has far too much fan service for my taste. However, these do succeed in giving the player a reason to explore certain parts of the map in addition to making the world feel a bit more interesting for just a short while. The finale is also quite good. Upon retrieving all of Delamain's cars, there's an end game where a supposed virus has caused Delamain to lose control of his facility and his cars to rebel. After fighting your way through the factory, you have the choice to delete the AIs of the rogue cars, or merge them all and Delamain into a singular entity. The latter option is only available if the player has invested enough attribute points into intelligence, which is a rare instance where your core stats genuinely matter. No matter what, the player is awarded with a Delamain cab upon completing this mission. If you chose to merge the AI, the cab has a wholly new AI built into it that's supposed to be Delamain's son. But it only speaks when you first meet, which is very, very disappointing. If you decided to send Jackie home or had Delamain wait for you and you went up to talk to Dex, there's an optional side job where you get to go to Jackie's ofrenda, which is essentially a funeral. This is a pretty good side job, but I'm not sure why they decided not to give it to you if you chose to send Jackie to Vic's shop. The poor pacing of the prologue in Act 1 makes it feel a little awkward to associate with all these different characters, whom V knows very well but the player is barely interacted with at best. It feels like this mission is meant to substitute for character development that really should have occurred much earlier, but in the end it's better than nothing. There are a few decisions that don't end up mattering, like what object you choose to bring to the ofrenda, whether Misty is to go to the memorial or not, or what you choose to say on behalf of Jackie's memory. When you talk to Mama Wells after the ceremony, she gives V the keys to Jackie's bike, which is really useful since V's car likely just got smashed by the rogue Delamain. It's worth noting that if you sent Jackie's body to Vix, you still get Jackie's bike, but it's after a call with Mama Wells where she tells V that she left the keys to the bike outside his apartment. All of the side jobs I mentioned so far have been introduced organically, however, that can't be said about the ones I'm about to mention. In Japantown, there's a man playing a guitar, and upon walking near him, Johnny will appear and ask V to give his opinion on the man's talent. This conversation gets redirected towards the topic of old samurai bootlegs, and a club called Rainbow Cadenzas, which used to exist nearby, yet has since been replaced by a ramen shop. Upon inquiring as to the existence of the bootlegs, the man at the shop will inform V as to the existence of a music merchant and psycho fan of Samurai, who just so happens to have a shop set up right in front of the ramen store. To purchase the bootlegs, V has to prove that he's a fan of Samurai by recalling how Samurai's third gig ended. V asks Johnny for help, and in quite the funny turn of events, Johnny lies to V just to fuck with him before telling him the truth about what really happened, after V gets called out on it. Upon reciting the actual events, the man sells V the bootlegs. Rather unexpectedly, this job ends with Johnny condemning his fan for living in the past and refusing to move on with his life. Despite the actual events of the side job being very, very contrived, it does a decent job better defining Johnny's character both when he intentionally lies to V and when he expresses his disapproval with a man who has dedicated his life to commemorating Johnny's memory. Johnny is an asshole, albeit a somewhat charismatic and sympathetic asshole. He doesn't conform his behavior to gain people's approval, even towards V, the only only person whom he has direct social contact with. In Pacifica, there's a group of Haitians hanging out near a non-functional roller coaster. They can't seem to get it working, but somehow V is able to fix it just by walking a few yards away and paying respects to a circuit box. The Haitians are still quite skeptical of the ride's safety, so they ask V to be the first one to ride it. Johnny boards right next to V, and watching his joyful expressions during the ride is definitely the highlight of the quest. Short, simple distractions like these have their place in open-world pseudo-RPGs like Cyberpunk. Punk, but I can't say the same about the side job that comes next. 
That side job where V saved that monk set a pretty high standard for monk related side content in this game, but I can't sing such praises about the series of jobs where V meditates with the Zen Master. V finds this dude in various places, and gets given four separate meditation brain dances where absolutely nothing happens. You just listen to the Zen Master talk as you stare at very low detail scenery. Every session ends with the Zen Master magically disappearing as a final eclectic fuck you. Also, the dude knows that V is dying because he's psychic or something. I don't know, I really don't like the series of side jobs. The two other distractions I just showed at least managed to make the world feel a bit more alive, but the Zen Master's meditation sessions literally take the player out of the world instead of breathing life into it. Getting back to the main story, the first lead the player is encouraged to pursue is tracking down Evelyn for information about the relic. However, Ev has gone missing, which means that Judy, Lizzie's BD editor, is V's best lead for finding her. After making your way through some forgettable NPCs and some more delightful swinging beads, V finds Judy in the basement arguing about some such subject matter which the player is given zero reason to care about. It's worth noting that V has the option to call Judy prior to this, but doing so isn't necessary and will get abruptly cut off if you do so right before entering Judy's tech hub. This conversation conveys the information that Evelyn is a doll that used to work in an establishment called Clouds, and has now returned there to hide out after the aftermath of the heist. We'll get to what Clouds is and what dolls are in a moment. While we're here, I'd like to quickly note that it remains humorous to me that Evelyn took such harsh precautions to hide herself after the heist while V meanwhile is carefreely roaming the streets. Going forward, it would be both logical and and an interesting gameplay slash story mechanic if Arasaka were pursuing V throughout the course of Cyberpunk's story. This could have materialized in the form of scripted story events or open world interactions, but nothing of the sort ever happens. It just makes Arasaka a giant and supposedly menacing empire look incompetent and weak, and it also makes the actions of Dex, Takemura, and Evelyn look quite unfounded in turn. However, maybe Arasaka isn't Ev's main concern. Before V sets off to search for Evelyn, at Clouds, Judy asks V to call her if he learns anything. So, let's talk about Clouds and what exactly dolls are. Dolls are prostitutes who've had a behavioral chip installed that allows their personalities to be modified to fit the customer's tastes. When V first enters Clouds, he is forced to jack into the computer in order to read his taste in personality and body type. This is an interesting sci-fi twist on prostitution. I can honestly see why something like this would exist if the technology was possible. Unfortunately, nothing all that interesting interesting ends up being done with this base concept. Dolls exist and they serve as a flavorful way to move the plot along, but that's it. The narrative never asks you to make a judgement on the ethics of dolls, and there's only one mildly interesting twist in regards to the extended uses to the behavioral chip that controls a doll's behavior. This isn't a massive issue or anything, but the untapped nature of the sci-fi concept does come off as a little boring when viewed in isolation. The following cloud section manages to have quite a bit of depth compared to most of the sections of Cyberpunk's main story. V's end goal is to find out what happened to Evelyn, which requires reaching the office of Cloud's manager, Woodman. There are two ways into clouds. V can purchase access to a doll, which requires him to surrender his weapons before entering, or V can enter by using either one of the jumping mods to make it to an outside window. The latter option appears to be bugged, however, as Woodman doesn't spawn unless V pays the reception which is quite the odd oversight if we're being honest. Still, it's a viable method of sneaking weapons inside of clouds. Upon entering clouds, V has a few optional leads to pursue. He can visit the doll that he purchased and inquire as to Evelyn's fate, and this will lead V to getting directed to another doll who fills in some more details about what happened to Evelyn. And V can also view a hologram in Ev's booth that displays what happened to her prior to her disappearance. However, in order to talk to the doll whom Evelyn befriended and access the employee-only area of the club, where Woodman's office is located, V has to make it upstairs to the VIP room. The player has options here. You can either incapacitate one of the guards and take their access card, or you can break into a room that leads to an elevator using a level 7 strength stat. The player also has the option to transfer to the balcony to access the same room. Once in the VIP room, the player is bottlenecked into just walking through a door, which comes off as somewhat lame. Before heading to Woodman's office, there are various clues that can be examined to further piece together the circumstances around Ed 
relative's disappearance. Also, V can access a message on the security computer that reveals that Clouds has recently been attacked by a Netrunner, confirming what happened to Evelyn. When confronting Woodman, you can use a high intelligence stat to offer help securing Clouds from Netrunner attacks to barter for information. This isn't the only peaceful solution, however. You see, Clouds is run by the Tiger Claws gang. This is relevant because there's a gig where V could have killed or kidnapped a member of the Tiger Claws, Jotaro Shobo. And if you have already completed this gig, you can threaten Woodman using this information. Lastly, you can just kill Woodman and find out the relevant information from his computer. This is the only option if you've been playing through loudly up to this point. If you kill Woodman, you'll have to fight your way out through a wave of freshly spawned Tiger Claws. However, if you resolve things peacefully, you get to leave via a nearby elevator. Lastly, both the receptionist and Johnny have unique dialogue reflecting whether you went in loud or not. I'm required to return your weapons. Even though I'd rather not. Nice work back there. Ever thought of applying for the Diplomatic Corps? So yeah, this brief mission has a respectable amount of depth for what it is, but I'd imagine that most players won't get to appreciate it. Since most of the game is painfully streamlined, most players are likely to approach this mission in a straightforward manner. Still, this is one of the few examples where Cyberpunk's mission design manages to come relatively close to that of Deus Ex. So, what was the information that V learned at Clouds? For one, Evelyn was put out of commission by a Netrunner attack. Secondly, and much more importantly, V found out where Ev had been taken. Woodman sold her to, um, uh... Uh, uh, a ma man called Fingers, a ripper who operates on Jig Jig Street, which is essentially a red light district. Before V can leave the mega building, however, his plot fatigue kicks in, and the first of a series of conversations with Johnny triggers that are part of a larger mission called Tapeworm. The placement of these sequences comes off as extremely contrived, but they do serve the important purpose of further developing Johnny's character. In this cutscene, Johnny once again conveys that his initial reaction to attack V was ill-guided and he has since reassessed his priorities. As for what those priorities are, he remains vague on the matter. He tells V that he wants to find find someone named Alt Cunningham, who will help them infiltrate Mikoshi, which is some sort of computer that exists in Arasaka HQ. This isn't conveyed in this conversation, but Alt Cunningham turns out to be an AI of an experienced netrunner whose consciousness was transferred into the net around 50 years ago. Mikoshi is a soul prison, for lack of a better term, and Johnny insists that infiltrating Mikoshi with Alt's help will somehow aid V in his bid for survival. At this point in the game, all this new information will raise more questions than anything else. So let's just move on to more pressing matters. Hi! You there! Mysterious stranger! Yoo-hoo! Upon leaving the mega building, the player will likely hear the cries of a robotic sounding voice from behind a nearby dumpster. It turns out to be a talking vending machine who wants V to move the dumpster out of the way to help out his business. However, before we get to that, Brendan offers to tell V a joke and dispenses a free soda for him. Brendan, like the drinks he sells, is nice and refreshing. But what's arguably more nice and refreshing is how well the side job is introduced. Since the side job is unlocked at the specific point in time, when the player is required to walk by general vicinity, it's rather difficult to miss. In addition, the player ends up coming back to this mega building in a future side quest, which serves as an organic opportunity for the player to further this quest line instead of just waiting around for the icon to reappear on the map. I know I keep harping on about this, but I much prefer clever introductions like this to chasing icons on a map, but this sin is far from exclusive to cyberpunk. Interactions with Brendan becomes a series of side jobs, which while enjoyable enough in and of themselves, unfortunately don't have the most satisfying conclusion. In the subsequent interaction with Brendan, you learn that he's become something of a neighborhood therapist, talking to people about their problems and all. Next time, V stops a man who's spraying graffiti on Brendan, and then Brendan attacks V or something. I don't really know, this one's kind of weird. For the third interaction, you learn from Theo, the woman whom Brendan was talking to earlier, that he has been taken to a facility to have his code reevaluated. Using one of a variety of tactics, V manages to talk to Brendan before his software is modified but for some reason the game doesn't let you save him. There are no ways to stop the installation using the computer that's plugged into Brendan, and what's worse, by talking to Brendan, he himself tells V that he isn't a real boy, and V is forced to agree with him no matter what. I absolutely hate this ending. You're stuck with going back to tell Theo that Brendan was either decommissioned or murdered. It just really annoys me so much that there isn't an option to pull the plug to the computer that's wiping Brendan's software. It just really sours the ending of this questline. 
fine. Or better yet, who needs Alt Cunningham? Why can't V just elect to raid Mikoshi with the assistance of Brendan instead of Alt? One AI is as good as another, right? Did I correctly hear you ask if I wanted to join you? You can select from a wide range of beverages. Do you come here often? Can't speak ill of the dead, right? Where was Johnny Silverhand when the bomb at Arasaka Tower went off? I do apologize for taking advantage of you at this early stage in our friendship. How about I tell you a joke? Software update installed successfully. The following section with fingers is one of the most unnecessarily complicated sections in the entire game. Firstly, V has the option to call up Judy and tell her to meet him at Fingers Clinic. This doesn't end up mattering, as even if you elect to keep Judy out of the loop, she ends up showing up there anyways with some half-assed dialogue saying that she'd learned about Ev's whereabouts from a friend at Clouds. This friend happens to be Tom, whom V will act as if he's already met even if you elected to skip the doll lead altogether. But before we can get to all that, there are a bunch of equally pointless ways to get into the building itself. To get past the thugs waiting out front, there are a few different speech options, including a street kid speech check and a body speech check that both operate identically to either saying you don't want any trouble or posing as a whore. You also have the option to fight them either by antagonizing them through dialogue or just straight up attacking them. In addition, you can either boost or double jump to the upper floor. I generally commend such a presence of depth, but it all comes off as extremely pointless in this case. It's just bizarre how much un necessary effort CDPR put into this brief encounter. One of the joy toys inside even has a few funny dialogue lines commenting on FV elected to get into the building. That's just a straight circus act. Fucking acrobatics flying in and shit. Yeah, yeah. Twitty burn. <laughs> Town descends on this Hope ship that hole. teaches those candy you ass got a fat suckers not to come around here court. no more. But wait, it's not over yet. Once you reach the waiting room, there are an unnecessarily large number of ways to get in to see fingers. There are an array of stat checks, including a currency stat check, that can persuade the two women waiting to give you their place in line. However, once again, this isn't necessary. Not only is there a fully functional option to wait, but you can just ask nicely and they'll let you cut in line. But wait, we're not done. You can also just circumvent the door and perform a tech skill check on the window to get in to see fingers that way. The the really funny thing is that Judy just barges through the door at the same moment when you choose this option. What's worse, you can choose to literally jump through the window without calling Judy or talking to her in the waiting room, and she'll just happen to barge in at that exact same moment all the same, without even commenting on the coincidental meeting. I imagine someone actually did this, and was left confused as to how the hell Judy knew to find fingers or why she just happened to barge in on that exact same moment. The fact that Judy doesn't even comment on this chance meeting is highly bizarre, and probably should have been a priority over all this unnecessary depth. The initial meeting with Fingers will play out slightly differently based on a few factors. Surprisingly, if you've already visited Fingers Clinic, he'll actually remark that he's seen V before, which is a nice touch. If you barged in, he'll still be working on his patient, and you can elect to let him finish or force him to talk with you immediately. In the following scene, Fingers gives the two a new lead on Evelyn, either by beating the information out of him or tolerating his creepy remarks. If you elect to beat the shit out of him, he won't be available as a ripper any longer. The the new lead on Evelyn's whereabouts is a shady BD studio that sells virtues with the Death's Head logo on them. There are two ways to obtain one of these BDs. You can buy one off a dealer, who just so happens to be a stone's throw away, or you can purchase one through Wakako, but only if you've done enough gigs for her. If not, she just points you to a nearby shop that points you to the dealer from before. Either way, this leads to V and Judy viewing the brain dance of someone being tortured for the sadistic pleasure of the viewer. It kind of seems like a plot hole how the BD in Act 1 one where the thug was shot actually allowed V to experience the pain associated with that, but this one where the victim is tortured doesn't do likewise. In this BD, there are sufficient clues to determine that it was captured in an abandoned industrial plant, which the two drive to immediately. Or not, V can opt to meet Judy there later, even going as far as to skip talking to her in the first place and just charge in. After an overly linear stealth combat arena, the two find Evan take her to Judy's place.
So, let's talk about The Witcher 3. One of the most impressive things that The Witcher 3 did was account for the player doing things out of sequence. For example, there's a quest where Geralt takes on a contract to kill a wraith for an old woman. However, if Geralt finds the clues ahead of time, he can receive the quest before even picking it up from the message board. He'll actually comment, wondering if there's a contract out on the wraith. Maybe there's a reward for her. Another example would be the quest where Geralt takes on the grave hag who's been killing children. If Geralt finds the children's skulls ahead of time, he can fight the hag at a nearby cemetery and finish the quest when speaking to the gravekeeper for the first time. Was? Mean to say it's dead already? This attention to detail was pretty consistent throughout the game, and while there were some examples of the game cheating to gate off certain content, moments like these were relatively rare. Cyberpunk 2077's mission design cheats quite often in this regard, and this industrial plant is a prime example of it doing so. Unless you trigger the proper quest progression, V can't get into the plant. It actually appears to be abandoned, even though this is the exact location where Ev has been held for quite some time. The Witcher 3's objectives were better struck for this type of quest design, with more direct, piecemeal objectives that embrace its open world in more clever ways. Other than one surprising skip we'll soon get to, Cyberpunk doesn't embrace this quality to nearly the same extent that The Witcher 3 did, and that's disappointing. Now that Evelyn is safe, Judy manages to extract a couple brain dances from Evelyn's behavioral chip. I could once again go on a tirade on how BD technology doesn't make any sense and only exists to move the plot along, but I'll spare you the repetition. These BDs convey whom Evelyn had set up to buy the relic with Johnny's construct on it, but not so directly. The buyer is first established to be a very experienced netrunner, so much so that they are able to hide their identity in Evelyn's recording. I'm not sure that makes all that much sense, but let's just roll with it. After analyzing some other factors, such as the fact that these people speak Haitian, they conclude that the buyers are members of the Voodoo Boys gang. What's more, they're the ones responsible for flatlining Ev at Clouds, establishing them as clever, experienced netrunners with a grey moral code. This manages to raise further questions, such as why they felt it necessary to flatline Ev but not anyone else associated with the heist, but we'll speak about that much, much later when we revisit the Voodoo Boys lead. For now, we're gonna shift the topic to Cyberpunk's open world outposts. Cyberpunk has three types of open world outposts, blues, gigs, and cyber psychos. Let's kick it off with mediocrity and discuss the blues. Most blues are essentially just copy and pasted enemy groupings that are guarding something that the player is tasked with collecting, but some manage to be a little bit simpler or a little bit more complicated than just that. The organized crime activity skull icons are massive enemy encampments that start with a call that attempts to contextualize the reason that the player is about to kill a bunch of people. These more complicated blues can actually be quite fun, but the calls also always go on far too long, and you can't quick save while they're playing or tag enemies without disrupting the call. This problem is also present with the calls that play before gigs by the way. Some blues are elevated by the location they take place in. The brainwash always stuck out as a pretty cool location for such a simple objective. The same can be said about the gas station out in the Badlands. A small detail worth mentioning is that many of these locations will be visited by the police after you clear them out. There are also some blues that aren't even marked on the map for some reason, but these tend to be much more inconsequential. While these activities are serviceable outlets for Cyberpunk's core gameplay loop, there's a reason that most people hold them in such low regard. These activities existed in The Witcher 3 as white question marks that transformed into other icons upon discovering them, and other than the fact that the gameplay in general is much better in Cyberpunk, they're just as generic here as they were in CDPR's previous effort. The rewards for completing them are boring, and unless you like reading shards, don't visit blues expecting any form of narrative payoff. What's worse, the blues where a group of enemies are guarding something are completely broken. Quite often, you can just run in and steal the item that triggers the completion of these objectives without even alerting the guards because the alert timer is so slow, even on the highest difficulty. So, these are awful, right? Someone would have to be out of their mind to 100% all of these objectives on two separate playthroughs. Wouldn't they? There's a reason I have 250 hours logged in Cyberpunk 2077, and it's not just because I had to play through the story three times. I found Cyberpunk's gameplay so addicting that I essentially 100%ed the blues during both my first and third playthrough. But wait, I just explained why these blues are awful. How could I possibly justify completing every single one of them twice? Well, here's my guide on how to have fun with blue objectives in Cyberpunk 2077. Complete a blue. Drink. Complete another blue. Drink.
have to drive your bike to get to the next blue? Use your mouse hand to drink. Attempt stealth. Fail. Resort to chaos. Drink as you loot the bodies. Uh-oh, your inventory is full. Drink while you disassemble items. Drink as you manage your inventory. Drink as you craft. Drink as you scout out the next area. Drink as you pull off consecutive headshots. Drink as you get detected. Drink as you hit two enemies with one shot. Drink as you take cover to heal. Drink as your final opponent burns alive. Drink while you wait for your bike to arrive. Drink as you drive. Drink as you stealth. Drink as you fight. Drink as you hack. Drink as you hack. Drink as you stand. Drink as you walk. Drink as you drink. Never stop drinking! Please drink responsibly. Next, we move on to gigs, which just so happened to be one of the most innovative concepts I've ever seen in an outpost open world game. Most open world outposts just exist to recycle the core gameplay loop, just like the blue objectives we just went over. But gigs and cyberpunk are the closest thing I've seen to the style of Deus Ex's stealth combat arenas transplanted into an outpost open world. This is primarily achieved by reintroducing social elements into the stealth combat arena format. As I've already gone over, modern Ubisoft games have managed to boil down the basic gameplay loop that the original Deus Ex introduced back in 2000 to an easily reproducible blueprint, but in the process something was lost. That extra touch of complexity that basic social interactions add to approaching missions. This isn't something that developers can just copy and paste, it actually takes thought and effort to implement. When you first arrive at a gig, a fixer calls and explains the objective to V, an inelegant solution perhaps, especially since most fixers receive such poor introductions, but still a reason to care about completing the objective beyond some Ubisoft style checklist. Objectives fall into one of a few categories. Gun for Hire, Agent Saboteur, Thievery, Search and Recovery, SOS Merc Needed, and Special Delivery. This might mislead you into thinking that gigs are just these six ideas copy and pasted ten or so times, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Even though multiple gigs ask you to sneak into a hostile area and interact with a computer, it's the journey there that makes these objectives feel distinct for a few reasons. Firstly, gigs take place in vastly varying environments, penthouses, nightclubs, suburban houses, desert outposts, restaurants. One even has V breaking into a mental hospital. The sheer variety of these locations puts Outpost and Cyberpunk's contemporaries to shame. And that's not all. Similar feeling objectives are often complemented by a varying degree of choice and reactivity, such as the ability to kill your target or take them alive during the gun for hire gigs. There's one gig where a client tasks V with breaking into a place and stealing some video footage. Infiltrating this location plays out as your standard stealth combat arena. However, the player has the option to take a peek at the footage and discover that the footage shows the client murdering someone. When V goes to deliver the data to the client, you can choose to confront him about the footage or merely deliver the recording as promised, the latter of which makes Johnny mad but closes the contract peacefully. However, if you choose to confront him, you can either extort him for more money or take him out lethal or non-lethally, both of which will prompt a different response from Regina after leaving the building, and this level of depth manages to be much closer to the rule than the exception. There's a gig where Padre tasks V with killing or kidnapping a man named Gustavo who apparently did something that put a woman named Martha in a coma. Uh, upon arriving at the apartment, the player has an array of options when it comes to getting to Gustavo. There's a nearby window that V can use to get into the apartment, and having leg cyberware installed gives V an even easier route to get to Gustavo's office on on the upper floor. If he has a high enough strength stat, he can just break into the front door. But what fewer players are probably aware of is that there's a street kid dialogue option that allows V to persuade the guards into letting him in to see Gustavo. While most life path dialogue options are pointless, there are actually a respectable number of instances where using a street kid dialogue option will help you out during side content. This is both good in the gameplay and story sense, as a street kid background does seem like the kind of thing that would be beneficial for a merc. When confronting Gustavo, the player can kill him, kidnap him, or hear him out and discover that he really isn't the one who should be blamed for Martha's situation. There are a handful of gigs that don't manage to embrace the strengths of Cyberpunk Stealth Combat Arena gameplay loop, such as the gig where Via's task was driving a car with a captive in the trunk, whom you have the option to set free, and the gig where V drives a car from the middle of a minefield to a garage on the other side of the Badlands. This is probably the weakest gig in the entire game if we're being honest, but even though there are 
are a few lackluster examples that feel more like mediocre side jobs and proper open world outposts, there are far more examples of gigs that stand out for being good. The Child Murder BD gig, the Hotel gig, the Seventh Hell gig. There are so many gigs with that extra level of care put into them that it would be easier to mention the ones that don't impress. None of these span over that much time or have any real long-term consequences. But that's not what gigs are about. Gigs are meant to be open world outposts. And in that regard, I think they're a success. However, it is worth noting that the quality of gigs does vary from area to area. I found the Badlands gigs a bit too generic. There were some good ones, but overall they felt far too similar to the types of outposts you'd expect to see in your average Ubisoft game. Also, Pacifica only has one gig, which feels like cut content. It's also worth mentioning that just like the missions in Deus Ex, it is much more rewarding to tackle gigs using stealth, and the monetary incentives back this as well. Many gigs task the player with being discreet, and and if they fail to do so, the fixer will lecture V in the concluding call and reward him less than they otherwise would have. However, it is worth mentioning that there are many instances where going loud results in additional enemies showing up to block your exit when departing the outpost, which is a nice detail worth noting. I still find stealth to be much more interesting, but the surprise enemy encounters can result in interesting gameplay scenarios as well. As much as I enjoyed gigs, it's undeniable that the rush nature of Cyberpunk's development has crippled gigs' full potential. The form most example of this is the poor introduction of the fixers, which I have already mentioned a few times. It pains me to think about how many players ignored gigs altogether due to the fixers' pitiful introductions. The other remnant of the game's rush development lies not in what is absent from the game but what is included. In Watson, there's a random shopkeeper who you can speak to, and if you've completed a gig called Shark in the Water, it's revealed that he's the one who issued the gig, and you can ask him more about the predicament and how he got himself into it in addition to extorting better prices out of him. Stumbling across this NPC was one of the last things I did in Cyberpunk 2077, and I was in equal parts in awe at the attention to detail it took to include this interaction and saddened by the missed potential the CDPR must have left on the table. Breadcrumbs like this interaction are evidence of the type of game that CDPR aspired to make, a game where seemingly inconsequential actions rippled outward and had meaningful impacts on the world. There are a handful of other half-finished glimpses you get at this game here and there and it breaks my heart to think about the game that Cyberpunk could have been. As safe of a product as Cyberpunk turned out to be in the end, I can tell that there were developers at CDPR who wanted to re-spark the innovative spirit that fueled them during the development of the first two Witcher games, and it's a shame that we'll never get to see the fruits of those aspirations. I'm not exaggerating when I say that gigs in Cyberpunk are the most fun I've had with an outpost open world game in recent history. In fact, during the process of making this video, I got so bored with Assassin's Creed Odyssey that I decided to 100% all of the gigs a third time with my Corpo V. There was a lot of missed potential with the gigs, but overall, they're an innovative concept I'd like to see a lot more outpost open world games expand on. And finally, we get around to discussing the Cyber Psychos. Deus Ex Human Revolution was a great game, probably one of my favorite games of all time. However, it had one substantial flaw that people correctly picked up on. The boss fights in that game were terrible. Not only do the three bosses feel completely out of place in the game's otherwise sincere and believable story, but the gameplay involved in these boss fights is boring at best and game-breaking at worst. If you're adequately prepared, the bosses serve as bullet sponges that have no right to be included in a Deus Ex game. And if your build is 100% geared towards stealth, well, too bad. Compact Disc Project Red. What the fuck? Why did you choose to transplant the worst aspect of the best cyberpunk game into your own cyberpunk game? Who are these cyber psychos for? When I saw early gameplay of Cyberpunk 2077, I was worried that the bullet sponge nature of the enemies would ruin the gameplay. Luckily, this wasn't the case for most enemies, but I can't say the same about the cyber psychos. Bullet sponge enemies are acceptable if they serve a purpose, namely to force a player to overcome this barrier using creative and interesting methods. Any bullet sponge enemy that makes a player slowly chip away at their health bar is a bad enemy. There needs to be something more to the gameplay than just that. Cyber psychos embody everything that is wrong with bullet sponge enemies. There is no way to tackle them using stealth, there are few to no interesting environmental methods to chip away at their health faster, and this is doubly a problem when you realize that cyber psychos have truly absurd amounts of health, so much so that the suicide quick hack hardly makes a dent in their health bars. 
I didn't find Cyber Psychos fun on either of the playthroughs I did them. Some of them are nicely presented and take place in interesting environments, but unlike the blues, they're just not a balanced outlet for Cyberpunk's gameplay. The game tries to add a little bit of depth to these fights by allowing the player to deal with them lethally or non-lethally, but this mechanic is stupid, because either way, you're shooting these enemies with hundreds if not thousands of bullets. The only way to kill them is to intentionally finish them off after the fight is over. This is such a poorly thought out mechanic. The cherry on top of this shitty cake is that once you complete all the cyber psychos, Regina is just like, okay. Like, that's it. V gets paid, Regina simply states that the research on cyberpsychosis continues, and nothing else comes of it. It's the most unceremonious ending possible. The only positive thing I can say is that Regina congratulates V if you manage to keep all the cyberpsychos alive, which is a nice attention to detail. Before wrapping up, let's take a look at how Cyberpunk handles transversal between outposts. Traveling between outposts should be an engaging experience, otherwise there isn't really a reason for these objectives to exist in an open world framework. The original Assassin's Creed solved this problem by designing the open worlds around a set of interesting movement mechanics and a wanted system that pressured the player into behaving in certain ways in specific circumstances. The newer Assassin's Creed games meanwhile do nothing to make the process of traveling across their worlds the slightest bit interesting. Travel is mechanically vapid, which is likely why the series made towers into fast travel points a while back, to mitigate the tedium of traveling across the world. Far Cry 3's Rook Islands had enemy patrols that disappeared once nearby enemy outposts were cleared. This is an example of introducing dynamic elements into the open world to supplement the shortcomings of the static ones. However, the game that has done the most to make transversal between outposts interesting is 2017's Breath of the Wild. Traveling across Hyrule is exciting and mechanically mechanically deep, featuring an array of interesting movement and survival mechanics that put travel in your average Ubisoft game to shame. However, the best decision that Breath of the Wild made was refusing to broadcast the location of its outposts on the in-game map. This made discovering outposts an interesting experience in and of itself. With all of that said, the process of traveling between Cyberpunk's outposts is pretty boring. I'd put it a tier above the newer Assassin's Creed games, but that was a pretty low bar to clear. Night City had a lot of potential when it came to synthesizing the game's movement options with the verticality of its architecture, but this just wasn't a priority for the devs at CDPR. Night City is something to look at, but it ain't no mirror's edge. Driving, as already stated, is serviceable, but not the slightest bit exceptional, even after patch 1.2. The one thing I can praise about this aspect of Cyberpunk's Outpost gameplay loop is how the various outposts are clearly labeled on the map, which mitigates the monotony of roaming around the world to discover outposts like in the newer Assassin's Creed games. The only exception would be the Cyber Psychos, which show up as normal side jobs for some reason. Still, for the most part, CDPR recognized that traveling across its open world was mechanically bland and made doing so as direct of a process as possible. So, while it is fair to view Cyberpunk's open world outposts as a mixed bag, I still think CDPR deserves praise for what they got right. Cyber Psychos might have been a letdown, and Blues might have been overly generic, but the gigs were immensely fun. Overall, I think that Cyberpunk's outposts are above average, mainly because of gigs. The level design combined with the expanded gameplay opportunities of the progression system combined with the social elements were enough to keep them feeling fresh across all three of my playthroughs, which isn't something that I can say but any of the Ubisoft games I've played in recent history. This might not mean much to you if you're burnt out on the Outpost open world format, but if you haven't uninstalled Cyberpunk from your hard drive yet, consider giving gigs another try. Maybe with a different character build, or a different set of ethics when it comes to approaching Merc work. You might very well find yourself having a good time. The Anders Hellman lead is the easiest to define. Hellman is the inventor of the relic that's stuck inside V's head, so it's pretty self-explanatory why finding him would be a top priority. The problem is that Anders, as Takemura puts it, has dropped off the face of the Earth. For some reason, all of Takemura's leads led to the afterlife, but he was dismissed by Rogue when he tried to get information from her because she viewed Takemura as too high risk of an asset. This means that V has to continue where Takemura left off. Rogue is the same person who aided Johnny in nuking Arasaka 50 years ago. And god 
Damn, this 2077 Rogue look a thousand times more fuckable than 2023 Rogue. This isn't me calling out a plot hole or anything. I understand that technology has kept her looking younger and all of that. It's more so me questioning why she looks so goddamn ugly back in 2023. When V goes to the afterlife to talk to Rogue, he finds her arguing with a smuggler named Pan Am who seems discontent with Rogue's performance as a fixer. After Pan Am leaves, V gets his audience with Rogue. Rogue is correctly hesitant to give V any information, just like she was with Takemura, citing all of the people who just so happened to have died while in V's acquaintance. Johnny spots V on this one, prodding him to cite her failure to save him during the attack on Arasaka Tower. It makes sense that V has to earn Rogue's audience by citing this unique circumstance that not just anyone should be aware of. If Ubisoft made this game, they would have just had V walk up to Rogue and get the information without any meaningful barrier to entry for one of Night City's most prominent fixers. V has to pay 15,000 eddies for the information. Rogue tells V to come back the next day, and there's an option to skip ahead time by waiting at the bar. There's also a side job that can be gotten at this location at this point in time, a contractor who wants V's services without going through a fixer. Like Brendan's questline in the introduction to the fights before it, this is a much more organic introduction than most side jobs in this game get. As for the job itself, it's solid. V finds a container with a body in it before getting ambushed by Tiger Claws on his way out. He then has to drive the body to a designated location before being able to ask his contractors for an explanation, which might or might not be bugged in its current state. Where are you from exactly? Green Sanjon to World Best. V also gets a katana as payment, but every time I played this side job, it was significantly underpowered. So anyways, the next day, Rogue comes through with her end and tells V that Hellman is going to be transported across the Badlands in a convoy of a Chinese corporation called Kang Tao. Rogue ends off by telling V that he'd be wise to get help from a native of the area. She recommends Pan Am Palmer, the smuggler she was bickering with the day prior. This is Rogue's way of killing two birds with one stone. She gives V a lead as to who can help him take down the convoy, but said person just so happens to be in a situation where they need to be helped out first before they can help you. you see, Rogue organized a deal between Pan Am and Sixth Street, where she was to smuggle cyber psycho medication for them, but her former partner, Nash, betrayed her and stole her car along with the merchandise. So before she can help V, he has to help her sort out her problems, which just so happened to be Rogue's problems, ergo killing two birds with one stone. This clever introduction made me like Rogue's character. After her prior appearance, I took her for a half-assed Mary Sue with a fuck ugly face, but 2077 Rogue comes off as deserving of her merit. Not not because she overpowers men twice her size or insults the protagonist while smirking like a bitch, but because she's shown to be actually clever and resourceful in a genuine way. Not a video game writer copy and pasted a Wikipedia entry into this character's mouth kind of way, more like a when faced with a challenging circumstance let's introduce a creative solution kind of way. The player can either stumble across Pan Am on their own or just call her and find out where she is. There's slightly unique dialogue for both, but it's only worth mentioning for the sake of being thorough. Pan Am's body language which makes it blindingly clear to the player that she will end up being one of the game's romance options, but more on that later. As Rogue intended, V is stuck helping Pan Am with her problems before the two can go and kidnap Hellman. Before they can do that, however, Pan Am has to visit her former nomad clan, the Avocados, because the story needs a justification to show the player their camp. And yes, I am fully aware that they are called the Aldecaldos, not the Avocados, but I've decided to call them the Avocados instead for the rest of this video just to annoy people just as much as I was annoyed by their dumb name. And let's be honest, Avocados isn't even the worst pronunciation of Aldecaldos we've seen in a video essay in recent history. The Aldecardo, the Eldecardos, the Aldecardos, the Aldecardos, the Aldecardos. Before we can get to the Avocados camp, we need to go through the first of this questline's many passenger driving sequences. Because nothing screams quality open world game design like being driven around said open world by an NPC. While this isn't the first passenger driving sequence in the game, it is the first that really managed to annoy me. Jack Jackie driving V to his apartment was fine because it was a scripted introduction to Night City where actual things happened. Dex briefing V about the heist was okay because it was atmospheric and packed full of visual information. The Delamain limo rides were acceptable because they were either meant to build up to a big moment or acted as a cutscene where something important was happening. Judy's driving sequence was optional and therefore not a deal breaker, but the Pan Am passenger sequences are not optional and don't even give the player any interesting scenery to observe out their windows. 
yes, you can skip most of them after a certain point, but that doesn't really solve the core issue that they're inherently bad. Pan Am is only an interesting character if you're playing as a nomad, and that's me stretching the term interesting pretty far. I went nomad on my first playthrough, and upon meeting Pan Am, the reasoning behind her inclusion in the game was obvious from the start. Pan Am, like V, is not a nomad. They're both former nomads. The player is intended to feel an immediate connection to Pan Am and the character arc she is on, because the game lets you put V on that very same character arc alongside her, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Upon arriving at the Avocado's camp, Pan Am is greeted by Mitch and Scorpion, two old friends of hers. Every single interaction between Pan Am and the members of the Avocados feel extraordinarily stiff. You see, the game has to provide exposition to the player, but the player character V couldn't be more irrelevant to the topic of discussion. This results in awkward scenarios where Pan Am walks up to her friends, they talk about stuff, and the player is left with nothing to do but gawk at them like a goddamn voyeurist. The Avocados camp is kind of silly. The game wants you to view it as something akin to a private military encampment, but it just feels a hell of a lot closer to an RV campout most of the time. This was yet another missed opportunity to create a mini Deus Ex style hub area, with hidden details to find and even interesting NPCs that talk about the ever-changing circumstances of the gang, just like Deus Ex NPCs, but uh, well. After Pan Am retrieves her gun, there's a driving sequence with 100% optional dialogue, which is nice, and finally the two arrive at Rocky Ridge, where Pan Am plans to ambush the band of Raph and Shiv who are in possession of her car. In games with dynamic elements, planning ambushes can be quite fun. The player can choose how they wish to use the game's established mechanics to complete a set objective. In sharp contrast to that would be a game like GTA V, which doesn't have deep enough dynamic open world mechanics for an activity like this to be all that interesting. Instead, GTA V has scripted moments where the player is deliberately denied control to ensure that the given spectacle is executed in an exciting as is possible manner. CDPR developers, what the fuck were you planning to achieve with with this ambush. First, the game tediously marches the player through a series of linear interactions, scanning the town for power, talking with Pan Am, scanning more things, talking with her again, waiting for Pan Am to drive her car around, interacting with the trunk of the car, interacting with the engine of the car, interacting with the computer. None of this is fun! I think that CDPR were trying to capture the essence of GTA V's linear polished mission design, but they missed the boat entirely. GTA V doesn't make the player perform a linear series of interactions, for the most part. Interactions like these are generally triggered automatically in a cutscene that don't attempt to give the player the illusion of any meaningful input. So, if the player isn't going to be given any meaningful input, such as deciding how the ambush is going to play out, then just make the whole thing a scripted cutscene like in GTA V. By the way, this criticism could also apply to The Witcher 3, but there's something even more jarring about all of this taking place in a locked first person perspective. After nighttime falls, the Raph and Shiv arrive, and Pan Am and V execute their plan to turn on the power Power of Rocky Ridge? I honestly have no clue what Pan Am was thinking when she came up with this plan. V is supposedly trying to be stealthy, so why would turning on all the lights help out with that? I think the plan was to draw their attention away from the car, but it still sounds kind of bizarre, all things considered. This is also the first example of fully functional technology just being left out in the Badlands for the player to find at their convenience. Like seriously, why is Rocky Ridge dead if it was this easy to turn the power on all along? The the mission now opens up into your typical stealth combat arena, where the player can deal with the enemies however they wish, or just steal a car after obtaining the keys. In the end, Pan Am is reunited with her car, so all that's left is for her to do the deal with 6th Street, right? Wrong. Pan Am's gotten it into her head that she needs to get revenge on her former partner, Nash, who's hiding out in an unfinished freeway that just so happens to be nearby. Despite the excess of dialogue options, your only choice is to say yes or no. Most players, wanting to get in her good graces and and good other things, we'll likely elect to do this favor for her. I've mentioned how bad I think Cyberpunk's leveling system is. While not quite as bad as that of The Witcher 3, it's still arbitrary and among one of the worst aspects of the game. Stealth is sometimes a saving grace for completing higher level objectives, but if your only option is to engage in a firefight with opponents who outlevel you, you're in for a bad time. On my first playthrough, I started this quest line with a moderate danger level, and that general level of difficulty persisted until Pan Am and V attacked Nash's band of wraiths. What ensued was by 
far the worst experience I've had with the entire game. Say what you want about the boring mission design and the inadequacies of the open world, when a game forces you into a scenario with near unbeatable opponents, highly unpolished gameplay, and no easy way to back out of an objective, your patience is going to be tested. I died countless times to these overleveled enemies, many times because of the unpredictable and wonky damage mechanics. And to put the cherry on top, every time I died, the game spawned V at the autosave where Pan Am drives into the encampments inside her head. Every time I got insta-killed in the blink of an eye. Every time I got shot and killed through a wall. Every time the enemy netrunner inflicted fire damage killed me so fast that I couldn't heal. I spawned inside of Pan Am's head and had to watch the same broken passenger sequence where they drive into the enemy base and get placed into combat before given the opportunity to quick save. As of patch 1.2, this bug is still present. There is no excuse for this difficulty spike. This isn't even something you can easily back out of like the open world outposts. I eventually managed to kill enough enemies to get a break between waves where I could quick save and forgo the busted spawn, but it was still an uphill battle before this nightmare was finished. Dear CDPR, stop adding arbitrary leveling systems to your games. I know that dumb people think that leveling systems make a game an RPG, but in reality it adds nothing to the type of game you're trying to make. Please stop. If you elected not to help out with Nash, Pan Am gives V the silent treatment on the ride to the motel. Next comes the deal with 6th Street, where Pan Am delivers a cyber psycho medication to them without a hitch. This is a minor detail that I mostly will skip over, but NPCs like Rogue will sometimes text a player in circumstances like these, with messages commenting on the player's choices. The only choice a player had so far was whether or not to help out Pan Am get revenge on Nash, and Rogue has two unique texts that reflect what decision you made. Most players will likely miss small details like these because the messaging system is so bad, but it's an alright attempt to make the world feel a bit more alive than it actually is. Pan Am gets a beer, and you have the option to do likewise. If you decided to help her get revenge on Nash, a rather interesting dialogue option comes up. Pan Am suggests that the two of them spend the night at the motel, and the player can have V suggest that they should share a room. She agrees for purely economic reasons, but the player can have V suggest that this arrangement should be more than just about savings, and she replies maybe some other time, but not tonight. Oddly enough, you can also choose to get a room alone, and the mission simply doesn't progress until you sleep in your bed. On my third playthrough, I put the mission on hold at this point and fully completed the other Takemura lead in addition to finding Evelyn before I got around to continuing the mission. During that whole time, Pan Am just lay in her bed with her eyes open, waiting for V to return and enter eternal agony. V meets with Pan Am in a nearby garage, and she outlines her plan to take down the transport carrying Hellman. Emphasis on her plan. The player isn't given any input as to how this job will play out. In hindsight, I really do hate this entire quest line because of how damn linear it is. Once again, we have an NPC just telling V how the job is going to play out without giving the player the slightest bit of input. As linear as The Witcher 3 was, that game at least allowed the player some input for the story's more significant moments like how to deal with the botchling during the Velen section. These divergent storylines weren't massive. In my previous video, I compared them to Heist and GTA 5, but Cyberpunk 2077 really could have used more sections like Clouds in its main story to interrupt the endless linearity. It also doesn't help that the Badlands feels extremely generic. Odo's lead is similarly linear, but because it takes place in Night City, its backdrop is simply much more appealing. On the way to the site, there's a brief tutorial section teaching the player how to aim the turret this mountain on top of Pan Am's car. The player has the option to have V ask Pan Am what the weirdest thing she's ever smuggled was, and if V is a former nomad, there's some unique dialogue referencing the iguana that he and Jackie smuggled during the nomad intro. Small detail, but it's worth mentioning. Pan Am drives V up to a hillside overlooking Night City. This was likely done to give the player an atmospheric view of the city, but it has never particularly impressed me due to how much fog obscures the buildings. The time skips forward yet again, to a bit before when the transport is meant to pass over this big sci-fi energy tower. In a hectic, chaotic action sequence, Pan Am drives V to the base of the tower while V fends off defense drones. This is the best example to show how bad Cyberpunk's NPC controlled driving is. In GTA, when an AI drives, said AI organically pathfinds from point A to point B, using artificial input to control what is fundamentally the same vehicle physics that the player has access to when they drive. Civilian NPCs in Cyberpunk seem to use an inferior version of this type of system, but during 
during the more scripted action sequences, vehicles will seemingly use a rigid pathing instead. They are quite literally on rails. This results in extremely unnatural and jerky vehicle movement. I trust that this example speaks for itself. Blah blah blah, techno babble, blah blah blah, access computers. All of this seems to damn near kill Johnny and V, which comes off as cheap, shallow, dramatic effect rather than anything genuinely interesting or meaningful. Uh, upon returning to the cliffs, V and Pan Am wait until the transport passes by. Then there's more unnecessary dramatic tension when the pulse initially doesn't work. And then even more unnecessary dramatic tension when the pulse doesn't take the transport down. And yet even more unnecessary dramatic tension when Pan Am has to take out a rocket launcher and shoot the thing down manually. Question, why didn't she just do that to start with? Was there some kind of defense system that the pulse coincidentally disabled without disabling the engines? Well, kind of actually, but as we'll see in just a few minutes, the defense system is still working. So I have no clue why that rocket hit works. Also, doesn't it seem just a little too easy to take down this valuable corpo transport? I mean, if all it takes is two nobodies cobbling together some half-assed plan like this in less than a day, then why don't things like this happen more often to the extent that these corporations or the government act to put up better security measures? This whole part of this mission is meant to serve as a flashy spectacle, but its rush nature really undermines the entire ecosystem that Cyberpunk's world was going for. Also, I decided to play through the section of the game a fourth time after patch 1.2, and seemingly the patch broke the animations of Pan Am's rocket launcher so that it was invisible when she initially fired it. What's more, it reappeared moments later, and remained glitched in her hands for roughly the next five minutes of game time. Despite all of this taking place roughly half the map's length away from the Avocado's camp, somehow Mitch and Scorpion see the transport crashing and rush to it to search for survivors. Pan Am is unable to radio them despite them being able to send out a radio signal to her, for some reason, which means that V and her have to get to the transport as soon as possible to warn them. On the way, there's some more unnecessary dramatic tension when Pan Am gets hit by a ricochet when trying to fix the turret. This means that she has to stay behind while V goes into the crash site to save Mitch. Actually, let me rephrase that. If V goes into the crash site to save Mitch, it's here where the story allows for a pretty damn big skip that should, but doesn't end up having greater ramifications. You see, at this point, V can literally abandon Pan Am and go find Hellman on his own. The game, of course, doesn't tell you where the corpos fled to, but if you already know, you can literally take a beeline to the gas station where Hellman is and completely forget about saving Mitch. The game fully recognizes this as well, but we'll get to that in a moment. If you choose to save Mitch, you get to participate in a very brief stealth combat arena that's made trivial if your short circuit hack is powerful enough, but can be rather difficult if you're not equipped properly. Either during the drone sequence or when you save Mitch, you learn that Scorpion has been killed, which motivates Pan Am to further aid V in a search for Hellman. There's this rather annoying bike sequence where you have to follow tracks, kind of like many of the tracking sequences in The Witcher 3. The track takes you through an abandoned airstrip, where enemies are waiting for you for some reason, before leading onto the gas station where Hellman is being held. The gas station is a decent stealth combat arena, with a few neat details, such as the owner of the establishment being locked in a room. This place also has an abundance of turrets, which while glitchy and somewhat underpowered in my opinion, are still fun to toy around around with. After finding Hellman, Johnny suggests that V use Hellman as a bargaining chip against Takemura, but V, being a nice guy, outright rejects Johnny's advice. This is probably a result of cut content, where the player was initially supposed to be able to show more distrust with Takemura, possibly resulting in interesting ramifications later on. When V carries Hellman outside, any remaining enemies will just disappear because of the presence of the nomads. This is where Pan Am calls out V if he just up and left her earlier. Pan Am? Why are you so surprised? Did the sun bake your brain? Unlike you, I don't bail. Especially if I've already given my word. I managed to help Mitch at the wreck. But Scorpion... We didn't make it. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. I understand what she's trying to say, but seriously, V just completely fucks her over by leaving her to save Mitch on her own while she was wounded and unable to call for backup because the radio wasn't working. She shouldn't just be snarky with V in this circumstance, she should be hunting him down like she did with Nash right now. Still, I have to admit that I had a pretty big grin on my face when I came across this moment during my third playthrough, and saw that the game accounted for me doing something so drastic after all. If Ubisoft made this game, they wouldn't have cared enough to put 
included an alternative dialogue, and I genuinely appreciate that CDPR gave me new things to find on my third playthrough. Before the avocados leave, we get formally introduced to Saul, the leader of the avocados. Saul is, simply put, a prick. He walks up to Pan Am, facial hair in tow, and grunts at her with a fatherly tone of disapproval. Saul is a bad character, and there's no better way to explain this than by comparing his formal introduction to that of rogues. Both Rogue and Saul are leaders of various sorts. Rogue is referred to as the Queen of Fixers, and Saul is plainly put the leader of the avocados. However, the game does a much better job justifying why Rogue is worthy of being on top of her hierarchy than it does with Saul's position in the avocados. Rogue's introduction was clever. Quite often when a writer wants to make a character appear smart or worthy, they just puppeteer the other characters to outright state that that character is so amazing, telling instead of showing. Or worse, they make the protagonist or an otherwise beloved character pathetic just to create a contrast between them and the newly introduced character. Rogue's introduction managed to avoid these pitfalls while still conveying the cunning that has earned Rogue her status as the Queen of Fixers. Saul, meanwhile, is nothing. There isn't any clear reason given why he should be the leader of the Avocados at this point in the game or any point going forward. He lacks charisma, he doesn't do anything clever, he isn't portrayed as having any meaningful leadership skills, he's just there. Oh, and he gets worse. Way worse. A boobs. An important interjection I'd like to make is that after this exchange, V gets Scorpion's bike. This happens to be the most interesting vehicle in the game, because if you game its pathfinding correctly, you can actually manipulate which direction it'll be facing before you mount it. This was probably an unintentional mechanic, and knowing CDPR's record with patches, they'll probably end up patching this cool feature out eventually, so enjoy it while you can. V takes Hellman back to the hotel and interrogates him before Takemura shows up. There really isn't much new information that is learned here. The biochip was a mere prototype, Hellman is at odds with Yorinobu which makes him a convenient ally, and V is still dying. The only really useful thing that was obtained from this venture was taking Hellman hostage, which will raise some issues going forward. When V leaves the motel room, there's another scripted fatigue sequence, just like the one at the Cloud's mega building. Three things to note about this interaction. Firstly, the sequence can be skipped by taking the Omega blockers that Misty gave V, which wasn't available the previous time. Secondly, these sequences play in order no matter which of objective you complete first. In other words, if this is your first time meeting one of these triggers, the first interaction with Johnny will play instead. Thirdly, during his tirade, Johnny says the following, referring to his war against Arasaka. Do whatever it takes to stop him, defeat him, gut him. If I gotta kill, I'll kill. If I need your body, I'll fucking take it. This line is completely inconsistent with what Johnny had previously said and what he will inevitably end up doing. Johnny never forcibly takes over V's body. In fact, if V decides to ally with Arasaka in the end, he pretty much just accepts it. This might seem like a small thing, but I'm confused as to why they had Johnny say this at all. Let's take a break to interject a few more side jobs. If V worked with Meredith Stout, the Militech agent from Act 1, there's a side job where V has sex with her in a motel. That's it, that's the entire side job. At some point, V gets a call from Wilson, the owner of the gun shop in V's apartment complex, where he learns about a shooting competition that Wilson is hosting. The rest of the side job is pretty straightforward. No matter where you place, the job ends with Wilson bitching that his marketing scheme didn't work. A job called A Day in the Life starts with V meeting a random food vendor whom he may or may not already be acquainted with. I don't really know, it's hard to tell from their dialogue. Suddenly, a couple thugs try to steal the vendor's bike because his sister is a corpo. So V intervenes, the vendor thanks V, and that's it. It's a pretty dull and confusing side job. This particular side job starts with the objective to call Azob, who answers a call without showing his face. Upon arriving at the meeting spot with a two or more person vehicle, a large man with a grenade for a nose enters the vehicle and tells V to drive to a specific location, which just so happens to be right next to Vic's clinic. Azob gets out of the car, picks a fight with a few tiger claws, and that's it. That's the entire mission. I am honestly astonished that this was the limit of CDPR's writing staff's creativity when it came to possible missions that featured a clown with a grenade for a nose. There's a cafe on 6th Street Turf that just so happens to get robbed right when V is patronizing it. V can either resolve this peacefully with either a currency, body, or street kid stat check, or he can just kick the shit out of them. Other than feeling extremely contrived, this side job is fine. It is very, very short, but it gives the player just enough choices to justify its existence. 
Eventually, a marker will appear on the map that tells the player to go to a random location in Southern Night City. There, V will find a few bums guarding a computer. One way or another, V gets a hold of the computer and learns that they found it on a dead body next to a nearby dumpster. The computer triggers some launch sequence, which prompts V to drive out into the desert to intercept whatever was just launched. After incapacitating the guards who are idling around it for some reason, V learns that the capsule launch contains some artwork which had been stored on the moon for some reason. And that's the mission. Pretty unremarkable. After doing a certain gig, a side job called Sex on Wheels will unlock. In this side job, you go to a garage and get in a car, which then becomes yours. I, I, I'm not making this up, this is considered a side job. Following yet another marker on the map will lead you to an alley where you'll find a talking smart gun named Skippy. Skippy is more than happy to become V's property, which entails the player selecting whether or not Skippy is to aim for the head or limbs, which is meant to be a choice between lethalities. Skippy would have been a neat idea for a weapon, but for some reason his damage kept switching between something respectable and something pathetic on the fly. A bug? Who knows? But it's enough for me to dismiss Skippy's useless in hindsight. However, I did spend a considerable amount matter time during my third playthrough using Skippy in an attempt to trigger the state where he demands to be returned to his rightful owner, Regina, but this never happened after many hours of play. Upon doing research, I learned that this was because I had a cyberware mod installed that made all weapons non-lethal, and this mission state only triggers if you get enough kills, which appears to be an oversight on behalf of CDPR. Skippy was a neat idea, but the execution was just too inconsistent. Premature discharge. I'm sorry. Similar to the shooting contest at Wilson's gun store, Sixth Street is holding one of their own. Although, this isn't a marketing ploy, and there's a lot more booze. I like this side job quite a lot for a few reasons. Alcohol is used as an actual gameplay mechanic, which is quite rare in most video games. Deputy Mayor Weldon Hull's head being the target absolutely exudes personality. And finally, this whole area has a lot of verticality that's fun to navigate. Just like Wilson's shooting contest, you get a prize if you get first place, and overall it's a nice little Distraction. A dude named Stefan can be found selling suspicious BDs next to a market in Japantown. What's more, after buying the sketchy BD, he states it will only work using his headset. This is obviously a scam. The player would have to be an idiot to fall for this ploy. But here's the thing, almost every player will end up intentionally falling for the scam because refusing to do so ends a side job abruptly. This means that making the smart decision in this circumstance results in missing out on content. So yeah, V blacks out and wakes up in the scavs hideout where he and Jackie saved that woman during the prologue, and after retrieving his gear, he dealt his back to the guy who scammed him in order to either kill him or let him off with a warning. This mission is fine. In any other game, I'd accuse the developer of being lazy and reusing a level to save on development costs, but considering how efficient CDPR must have gotten at creating building interiors, this probably isn't true. Speaking of that tutorial mission with the scavs, there's a side job that pertains to Sandra, the woman whom V and Jackie saved during the prologue. This one's really weird. As far as I can tell, there's a gig called Last Login where you find a databank which you return to Sandra on a side job called Full Disclosure. Apparently on my third playthrough, I somehow did the first half of this before Sandra ended up calling me, leaving me absolutely clueless about what was going on. When I visited her, she insisted that I'd apparently read whatever was on the databank, which cost her to cut my pay, which caused me to kill her in retaliation, which caused her security system to turn on and chase me out. Under a closer inspection, I apparently checked her databank on accident at some point, which prevented me from turning it in normally. Also, the databank apparently reveals some corporate conspiracy of some sort that I don't feel like it's necessary to get into. So let's just go over the possible ways you can play it after having read the databank. If you are dishonest, she sees through your lie and pays you less than she otherwise would have. If you fess up, you can remain apathetic to her cause and get awarded the standard rate. You can butter her up and get awarded extra, or you can blackmail her and accidentally start a fight. Sorta. Of. Overall, this side job is fine when taken into account how it's kind of an extension of a gig, but I really wish that it weren't so easy to perform an action that ends up gating off certain options later on. Spellbound is supposed to start with a guy named Nick sending a text to V after completing the Hellman job, but this never happened on my third playthrough. I was able to do the side job anyways by kind of accidentally doing the subsequent side job Cold Mirage first, but none of this is necessary to understand so let's just move on. Nix is a netrunner who works for Rogue at the Afterlife, and he needs V to deal with the corpo named R Reno for a spellbook, some sci-fi shard thing that has magic hacking powers, I don't know. One way or another, V gets a spellbook and brings 
it back to Nyx, where the player has the option to barter for more money if they have a high enough intelligence skill. Contract closed. Uh, apparently decrypting the spellbook gives you some coordinates, but I was able to start Cold Mirage by simply finding it in the open world before even doing Spellbound. Right next to where Dex was shot, there just so happens to be an ancient Netrunner freezer that just so happens to be still fully functional and just so happens to contain the corpse of the legendary Netrunner Rake Bartmos. A lot of coincidences going on right now. V takes Bartmos' deck and, one crash later, gives it to Nyx who nearly shorts himself while inspecting it. V is forced to save him and yeah, that's it. Odd pair of side jobs these two. The Highwayman is yet another strange job. I actually missed it on all three of my playthroughs and had to check the wiki to find out that it even existed in the first place. This mission is a prime example of what happens when side jobs in Cyberpunk don't get icons on the map. The player simply doesn't end up finding them. There's this random garage in Rancho Coronado where V finds a bike and a photo of two people next to a bench. The player is entrusted to find this bench on their own with minimal help from the journal entry. It's here where V meets James, who tells V that the girl in the photo, Josie, has gone missing, which sends V on another blind hunt to find her. She happens to be dead in some random alley somewhere. This side job concludes after V confronts James and gets yet another objective to find the tiger claw bike in a bizarre location gated behind some passcode. So this side job consists of four parts. Finding the garage to start the job, finding the bench where James is hanging out, finding Josie's dead body, and finding the bike. Finding the bench and finding the bike are reasonable because the journal entries give the the player's efficient context to figure it out on their own, but the other two objectives are simply unreasonable. The journal entry you get when you're told to find Josie is simply useless, and if we're being honest, relying on walls of text to guide the player is lazy to begin with, especially with the poorly designed journal. I like games that trust that the player is smart enough to find objectives on their own, but there needs to be some form of clue or a clever introduction of some kind. The vast majority of players are going to miss this job, and even the ones who find it will likely end up resorting to a guide because of how poorly these objectives are presented. The following side job, Bullets, is the only side job that never appeared once during all three of my playthroughs. A bug? Who knows? In the side job, which I never got to actually play, a cyber psycho walks into a clothing store after V, a fight ensues, he gets neutralized, Max Tax shows up, V gives his account of what happened, and that's it. Not gonna act like missing this side job ruined the game for me. Lastly, there are three side jobs that are exclusive to each individual life path. Nomads get a side job where they're tasked with finding the car that they used during the prologue. I'm not exactly sure when it went missing, but whatever. Turns out that some woman is in possession of it, and you can decide whether or not you want to let her keep it to leave Night City, and that's it. Pretty inconsequential overall. In the Corpo exclusive side job, V gets a call from Frank, a former associate that was featured during the Life Path intro. He tells him about some files that he wants him to pick up, but it turns out to be a trap, and based on what you said to him in the prologue, you might have the option to talk him down, but otherwise you have to kill him. Interesting idea, but rather unremarkable execution. The Street Kid exclusive side job manages to feel a bit more substantial than the other two. V gets a call from Kirk, the guy from the Street Kid life path intro. Uh, upon meeting up with him, he pitches V a job to rob some Valentinas. Uh, upon doing so, V finds out that the stuff he was supposed to steal isn't there, and upon returning to Kirk, him and his associate have been killed. I'm not really sure what this side job was supposed to convey. It seems like someone just remembered that Kirk was in the Street Kid life path intro and decided to shoehorn him back into V's purview for no reason. Odd. At the start of the third lead, V meets Takemura by the river, and the two of them discuss the nature of their predicament. The following sequence of objectives primarily serve to develop Takemura's character, and the pseudo-friendship slash respect the two end up gaining for each other. But the sequence also serves as a crucial stepping stone for the story events that will lead into the endgame. Sandayu Oda, whom I will simply refer to as Oda, is the bodyguard of Hanako Arasaka, and a longtime friend of Takemura's. Takemura hopes to get Oda's help in contacting Hanako to convey V's testimony. Oda refuses to accept V's account of events. And once again, the game has set up multiple technologies that could be used to confirm V's testimony. Brain dances and some application of Soul Killer. At least have the courtesy to give some half-assed sci-fi explanation as to why they wouldn't work. Maybe the biochip that's in V's head would inhibit the ability to accurately read his memory. That would at least be a viable explanation, I guess. After Oda drives away, Takema reveals that it was never his plan to get Oda to come over to his side so easily. He simply wished to coax 
notes Hanako's whereabouts from Oda during this interaction. Oda let it slip that Hanako will likely be attending the Arasaka Parade in Japantown, so V and Takemura's new goal is to learn more about the parade. Takemura asks V if he knows a fixer who could help them, prompting V to suggest Wakako, the most prominent fixer in Japantown. The player can then choose whether they want to ride with Takemura over to Wakako's or not, which will likely appear to be nothing more than a fast travel option to most players. If you elect to have V ride with Takemura, there are a few dialogue options to help you get to know him better, but other than that, it's pretty uneventful. However, if you elect to meet him there, something unexpected happens. Firstly, I'd like to note how his car will actually pathfind all the way to the correct destination, though when he gets out of the car, things start to get a little buggy. This is only relevant because before leaving, he states that one other matter requires his attention, but he ends up just going directly to the pachinko parlor anyways, which comes off as a little odd. Here's where things get really interesting. When V arrives at the pachinko parlor after Takemura, there's a hidden dialogue interaction where Takemura is talking with a man who has confused him with a Japanese celebrity named Hideshi Hino, whose catchphrase is better buckle up. Do you know who this is? Hideshi Hino, the late night comedy host. He was brilliant before he fell off the wagon. Takemura insists to this man that he has him confused for someone else, but V can pressure Takemura into saying Hino's catchphrase to appease the mistaken fan. Beta Bakurap! Wow. Hino-san, what happened to you? I do not know. I do not recognize myself. The depression in this guy's voice after hearing Takemura half-ass the slogan is so great. But wait, that's not all. During the ensuing dialogue sequence with Wakako, there's a reflex skill check that allows V to introduce Takemura as Hideshi Hino. Hideshi Hino, the comedian. Yamero, do you did that? And if all of that wasn't enough, V can find a poster of the actual Hideshi Hino at a random point in the open world and comment on it. Hey, Goro. Wow. You look like a million eddies. Moments like the huge skip during the Hellman lead in this hidden series of interactions are why I don't view my third playthrough as entirely wasted. Wakako is initially reluctant to help, but she ends up giving them desired information anyways. If you're on the street kid life path, you can have V bring up the fact that Arasaka was responsible for the death of her grandkid. She of course decides to help them even without this option, but this additional insight helps the player understand why she'd be willing to take such a risk with nothing to gain. If more life path speech options offer genuinely insightful information to the player like this one does, they probably wouldn't be viewed so negatively. The information on the shard gives Takemura the necessary insight he needs to begin planning the infiltration of the parade, so he bids V farewell until he's ready for the next stage of the plan. This is as good of a time as ever to mention the text that Takemura sends V as you progress throughout the story. One of the best ways that Cyberpunk 2077 uses Takemura's character is by having him send V periodic messages throughout the game. These range from Takemura being snobbish about food to accidentally sending V an out-of-focus selfie. This is the closest Cyberpunk comes to mimicking how texting works in GTA V. Takemura's texts are usually funny, optional distractions that reward the player for paying close attention to their incoming messages without punishing those who don't. Sometime later, Takemura will call V, asking him to meet at the location where the parade will take place. This part only exists to further develop Takemura's character. Other than a very brief section where V goes off to hack something, this entire mission is just V talking with Takemura. This was the first part of the game that I played after the 1.1 patch, and somehow the patch managed to break Takemura's animations when leaning against the rail. Overall, the section suffers from similar problems to what the Pan Am section suffered from. It feels like it's trying to capture the slow low cinematic nature often present in GTA V's presentation, but it comes off as far as too stiff and mechanical and doesn't allow for the choices that an RPG would. In The Witcher 3, most of this section would have taken place in a cutscene, but ironically, in CDPR's attempt to increase immersion by locking the player into a first-person perspective, they managed to achieve the exact opposite. Anyways, after a bit of chatting, Takemura asks V to break into a room and pay respects to a computer. After that, the two sit down and order some yakitori, the quality of which Takemura strongly disapproves of. Later on, Takemura texts V asking him for advice on where he can get some good food in Night City. Moments like these, where characters exhibit traits and then the game later reinforces said traits during optional exchanges, give said characters an extra bit of depth needed for them to feel a little bit more than just mission dispensers. During this conversation, Johnny signals his distrust of Takemura, which is really just an expression of his general distrust of corpos. Takemura lays out his plan, which is to break into the Arasaka warehouse where Hanukkah's parade float is being 
stored and hack the float, which will somehow aid Takemura in getting onto the float during the parade. In addition, V is to take out the snipers who will be guarding the float externally. There's a funny line where V can criticize the plan, implying that Takemura is carrying out an elaborate seppuku ritual. Either way, V is forced to agree, and the player isn't given any meaningful input as to how the rest of the mission will play out. Like the Arasaka heist, the parade mission has plenty of buildup, possibly even too much considering how Hellman's quest line is required before taking part in the parade. But the game still doesn't give the player the necessary input to give them a feeling of investment in the mission as a whole. However, the decision that you make at the end of this conversation is actually very important. Not because it actually affects anything, but if the player chooses to let Takemura scout out the Arasaka facility on his own, they'll miss out on an important interaction with Takemura. If you choose to accompany Takemura, the game immediately cuts to the two breaking into a construction site adjacent to the warehouse containing the floats. This part of the mission has a lot of waiting around with little dialogue as the two ascend the unfinished building. However, when the two make it to the roof, things start to get a bit more interesting. To understand why, we need to take a step back. What made The Witcher 3 so interesting was how well realized its world was, but not all parts of that world were created equal. The Novigrad section of the game was always the weakest to me because of how boring its main conflict was. The Eternal Fire is radically anti-mage to the extent that they're burning them in Hierarch Square, and for a series that is supposed to be about choosing the lesser evil, this is an extremely black and white conflict. I have a lot of problems with The Witcher books, but one thing that they did much better than The Witcher 3 was painting the Eternal Fire as a believable force inside Novigrad instead of just a 2D villain. Novigrad is a populous trade hub with a lot of money moving through it, and because of that, a myth needed to be created that monsters were unable to enter the city due to the force of the Eternal Fire. Otherwise, there would be chaos and distrust among the populace, in a similar manner to what we end up seeing in The Witcher 3. In the books, the Eternal Fire still isn't an all-around good and decent organization, but that's not the point. It's a morally gray actor that is interesting to think about precisely because of how more really gray it is. So far, Cyberpunk's world has been Novigrad stretched out across the entire game. Like the Eternal Fire, corporations are purely unjust actors. And that's it. This premise doesn't give you all that much to think about. Mercs hate the corpse. Street kids hate the corpse. Nomads hate the corpse. Corps hate the corpse. No one in this world likes corporations, yet they exist and keep gaining power. This raises the question. Why? Even if corporations are bad, why do so many people view them as preferable to Johnny's brand of anarchy? This conversation between V and Takemura is the closest that Cyberpunk comes to showing two sides to this world by allowing the player to prod Takemura as to why he believes in corporate order. Where'd you grow up, anyway? I am from the slums of Chiba 11. I remember the chemical stench of the canal. Where we boys washed our shirts. Corporate transporters sometimes passed through our slum. Arasaka selecting children, but only the clean ones. Let me guess, so they could turn them into Corvo soldiers? Exactly. When they chose me, I felt I had won the lottery. In the army, I was given everything I lacked before. Discipline, regular meals, and when I proved I was gifted, an education. So how's a corpo rookie go from cleaning latrines to being Saburu Arasaka's bodyguard? The highest grades at the academy serves in the special forces, and Arasaka-sama's a matched eye for talent. You're not saying Saburo fell for you at first sight. To make the right decisions with imperfect knowledge, that is how you become the world's most powerful man. 100 candidates standing at attention, and Arasaka-sama looked into each of our souls and chose the one who would serve him best. Arasaka gave me what no one else could. Values I could honor, live for. This was most important. You dirty your hands for money. I in the name of principles. Wasn't judging you. And true, you oppose the corporations, their order, their world, in a mindless way, yet you offer no worthy alternative. Take a look around. It's here, your corporate world in its glorious splendor. You show me filthy streets as if no other world exists, as if nothing else is possible. 
What of the millions who work for Arasaka and receive stability? Safety. Cheap 11 slum rats? They're there, scraping scraps out of scop tins. Corpse decided that, too. We cannot fix everything at once. In Takemura's mind, corporations provide a structure that was absent in the anarchy of his childhood. A structure that Johnny would detonate a nuclear bomb on without hesitation. The conflict presented here is one between chaos and order. The same conflict that was so eloquently presented in the first two Witcher games. When is it necessary to embrace the status quo as a means to survive? And when is it necessary to send everything into chaos in hopes of rebuilding something better? As stated, this is not unfamiliar ground for CDPR. It's pretty much the exact same quandary that the first two Witcher games focused on. But it's not bad either, and it's a shame that the storytelling didn't embrace this topic more clearly. Because this is it. This brief interaction is pretty much the end of the debate. V gets to express either a passive understanding or rejection of Takemura's worldview and that's it. Back to Corporations Bad. All of this is a shame because the cyberpunk setting has a lot of room for morally gray storytelling. Science fiction author Philip K. Dick wrote a book called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which is hailed as one of the first in the cyberpunk genre. It has a movie adaptation, but it's really not worth mentioning. The book asks the question, what makes life valuable? Portraying a future society where common animals are treasured, yet humanoid androids are viewed as disposable property. This moral conflict isn't as cut and dry as it first appears, however, as androids are shown to be somewhat sadistic, and there are even efforts made by them to infiltrate, demoralize, and dismantle human society. Overall, it's a book that really makes you think. I wish I had a proper movie adaptation. Lastly, I'd like to talk about Deus Ex Human Revolution. Not the original, not Mankind Divided, not the one that everyone pretends doesn't exist, specifically Human Revolution. Human Revolution's story is centered around the conflict between various factions with distinct ideologies that pertain to the ethics of human augmentation. Every single actor views their stance on the issue as morally and philosophically correct. David Seraph thinks that his corporation is bringing on the next stage of human evolution. This technology is likened to stealing fire from the gun. Gods, one of many nods to Greek mythology that are found throughout the game. Bill Taggart views the speed of this advancement as detrimental to society, and is willing to risk inciting riots to push for regulation of this technology. Hugh Darrow, the original inventor of the technology, now views his innovations as sinful, and is willing to sacrifice the lives of countless innocents to bring an end to his own creation. This moral quandary is complicated. Most will view Darrow's extreme measures as unacceptable, but upon learning of the Illuminati and the reach that augmentations would give them, in controlling mankind, you begin to understand his point of view. Seraph, however, is obsessed with spearheading human advancement. He views augmentations not as some cash grab or even as a source of power, but as a purpose, a goal that mankind can strive for. Right in the middle is Taggart's ideology, which might seem like the moderate option at first, but can easily be viewed as either a slow roll into tyranny by Darrow or as a suppression of innovative fulfillment by Seraph. This dilemma forces you to stop and think, perhaps to a greater extent than any other work of science fiction I've ever experienced. Some people criticize Human Revolution setting, saying that its world building is hurt by society's obsession with augmentations, and that large numbers of people wouldn't realistically surgically remove their arm just replace it with some fancy robotic one. It's best to respond to these people with a question. Can you not think of any modern day trend wherein people surgically remove their body parts in an attempt to transcend genetic determinism with the backing of every major corporation? Transhumanism is not merely science fiction anymore. It's reality. And despite what some would have you believe, this fab is not rooted in empathy or kindness. A record number of people are suffering from depression and lack of purpose in their lives nowadays. And to some, a transhumanistic fab seems like the best option to give their lives a sense of meaning. I'm participating in something greater than myself. The next stage of human social evolution. We'll take fire from the gods and use it to cauterize the wound where my testicles used to be. This section also features one of the most interesting stealth combat arenas in the entire game. I want to stress the usage of the word interesting, because I'm not entirely sure it's all that good. From this vantage point, Takemura and V discuss the various ways that V can infiltrate the warehouse. There are multiple guarded entrances, a few locations where V can utilize jumping augments, and a lead about a series of vans that keep driving in. As for the vans, I have no idea how to utilize these. After managing to hijack one, the guards still got alerted to me when I drove in, so I really don't understand what the game designers were thinking here. As for the base itself, it's 
split into two distinct parts, the hangar and the exterior sections. The biggest problem with this design is that there are multiple ways the player can circumvent almost the entirety of the outdoor portion of the base, rendering it kind of pointless. The newer Assassin's Creed games encourage exploration in their larger encampments by utilizing optional objectives that are broadcast to the player. Likewise, there is a legendary smart weapon that can be found in this area, but since this fact isn't broadcasted to the player, this entire half of the base really does come off as unnecessary. A possible solution to this would have been to require the player to unlock a door to the warehouse by interacting with some computer hidden in the outside portion. The interior is mostly fine, but the ability to walk around the edges can come off as pretty cheap. It's also worth noting that after the 1.1 patch, this area crashed on me four times, which if you couldn't tell is four more times than it should have crashed. Despite this being one of the largest stealth combat arenas, I can't say that it's all that amazing. It has some good ideas, like the underground pathways in the exterior section, and the opportunity to overlook the exterior from such a high vantage point, but overall it's disappointing. The weather effects that trigger are spectacular though. This is one of the most visually striking sections in the game in my opinion. After uploading the virus to the float, Takemura opens the ceiling somehow. Also, it really seems like Arasaka would do a sweep after V made so much noise, but the game doesn't account for that, which is really strange. Anyways, this concludes the necessary preparation for V and Takemura to infiltrate the parade. It's worth reiterating that the parade mission doesn't unlock unless you've already found Hellman as well. Before we go on to the parade, let's cover some more side jobs. A marker on the map will lead V to find a corpo getting beaten by some cops, and upon getting them to leave him alone, V can extort him using multiple skill checks. If you're a street kid, you can actually extract quite a bit of information about what's really going on. It turns out that the corpo was giving girls spiked BDs, one of which put a daughter of the cop's friend into a coma. This is actually a pretty good example of life path dialogue choices being used well. Knowing this additional context gives this encounter a whole whole new light. A side job called Raymond Chandler at Evening starts when V enters El Coyote, the bar where the street kid life path starts and where Jackie's ofrenda was held. These are two missions that the player might very well have missed, which is a huge problem as Pepe acts as if V and him know each other very well, even though this might very well be the player's first time encountering him. A corpo is getting harassed by a couple of Valentinos, and V has the option to intervene. None of this ends up being the slightest bit relevant, however, as the rest of the side job is about Pepe and his concerns that his wife Cynthia may have been cheating on him for a long time. His evidence for this is that the kid they had together looks nothing like him, which is certainly a solid foundation for such doubts to spring from. In addition, Cynthia's been staying at work late recently, which all starts to add up to something quite suspicious. After agreeing to follow her around, Johnny starts commenting on the entire scenario. CD Barr's betrayal of beguiling woman sounds like something out of a pulpy noir thriller. This commentary continues after V finds Cynthia and begins tailing her, which makes what would otherwise be an awful tailing mission rather amusing. It was her, the lady in pink, breaker of hearts, framed by a halo it's of fun. cigarette smoke. I followed her. Dreaming of the day, the narrator put a fucking plug in it. Eventually, Cynthia enters a suspicious building, and V catches her alone with a man. Hey you! What are you doing here? Fuck Cynthia. Told you to make sure nobody followed you. Doesn't matter. Seen enough. But... Huh? What the hell is going on? After that, V reports his findings to Pepe and the job is concluded. But actually, it isn't. Not if you probe Cynthia as to the reason behind her seeing this back alley ripper. She reveals that she's been seeing this ripper who specializes in plastic surgery since before she met Pepe in order to maintain an altered appearance. This answers why Pepe's son looks different than he'd expect. It's not that his genes are absent, it's that Cynthia's genes, which she passed down to her son, are completely detached from her outward appearance. This is probably the best sci-fi in the entire game if we're being honest. In this world where body modification is so prevalent, how can you really know if someone's appearance accurately reflects their genetics at all? After telling Pepe the truth, you can either have V encourage Pepe to accept his wife or condemn her for lying. And yeah, overall, this is one of the best side jobs in the entire game. Violence is a strange yet interesting side job. Out of nowhere, V gets a message telling him to meet someone at the Notel Motel, the sleazy stay where V was shot at the end of Act 1. The introduction to this mission is one of the few moments in the game that manages to capture the neo-noir vibe that the more classic cyberpunk films are known for. The client is Lizzie Wizzy, an eccentric singer and songwriter who replaced the near entirety of her body with chrome. She wants V to investigate her boyfriend, who she fears is cheating on her. Pretty classic film noir 
setup to go with the aesthetic of the setting. Her boyfriend Liam hangs out at a pretty popular club. So popular, in fact, that there's a not so obvious street cred stat check that might prevent V from getting in through the front door. However, there are many other ways to get in. I'm honestly surprised that street cred stat checks aren't used as an actual mechanic beyond a bizarre implementation like this. There's an unmanned security terminal where V can download footage of Liam talking to an Arasaka Corpo. It turns out that Lizzie's fears about Liam cheating on her were incorrect. Instead, he's in talks with Arasaka to make an engram of Lizzie's personality. This is one of the relatively few side jobs that actually feed into the main themes of the game. At this point, the player has a few options. You can confront Liam and decide whether or not to take his bribe, and you can report back to Lizzie whatever you want regardless of your prior decision. If you decide to have V tell Lizzie the truth, she lures Liam to her room at the Notel Motel and strangles him to death. The job concludes when V disposes of Liam's body in a nearby dumpster, a pretty abrupt ending that feels like a result of rushed development. Next, we're going to talk about Gary's questline, and the reason I put it off so long is because it's likely that most players will end up playing it later into the game due to how strung out it is. In fact, I didn't end up finishing it organically during any of my playthroughs. I only knew that Gary's questline had a conclusion because I saw it on the wiki and went back to finish it later on. The reason for this was twofold. Firstly, it's not until you interact with Gary's final sermon that his questline is actually added to your quest log, which means that I simply forgot about him when it came to pursuing side quests. Second, his icon only appears when he's awake, and since he's asleep a lot of the time, I wasn't reminded all that often that he even existed. Still, his introduction is organic, as you are forced to go by this general area during multiple points in the game. But I still can't help but feel like the overall presentation of this questline is quite sloppy. If you listen to enough of Gary's sermons, eventually you'll get to the point where a couple nomads from the avocados are mad that he called nomads werewolves or something. This encounter can go one of a few ways. The nomads kill Gary, V kill kills the nomads, or the nomads recognize V and agree to leave Gary alone. That is, if V is familiar with the avocados. If Gary lives, he tells V about some Alpha Centauri artifacts from some Technomancers, I, I don't know. Anyways, V goes to the designated meeting location and witnesses some suits doing some strange deal with some Maelstrom goons. Upon ambushing the suits and taking the shard, he returns, only to find that Gary has been abducted. Unfortunately, this is where the mission ends. There isn't any fun expedition where V goes and saves Gary from from some government facility. It kind of just fizzles out and Gary is replaced by his protege. I don't like this conclusion. Stories in the Witcher series were full of tragic endings, but they generally had some sense of finality to them that Gary's tale just lacks. For some reason, someone thought that Cyberpunk 2077 needed races. I was hoping that this person would have been fired after previously suggesting that The Witcher 3 would benefit from races, but unfortunately we weren't that lucky. In the same way that The Witcher 3 wasn't an equestrian simulation, Cyberpunk is not a vehicle simulation. However, the problems with the races go beyond mere poor vehicle handling. Firstly, upon release, the LOD streaming was so bad that my CPU couldn't manage, leading me to choose not to play them until this problem was patched. Secondly, Claire's shooting posture was questionable. I believe this has since been patched, but it's hard to know for sure. Three main issues persist, however. Rubber banding, rubber banding, and rubber banding. Did I say rubber banding? Perhaps I should instead call it steel banding. Cyberpunk's driving AI is so unreliable that CDPR had to resort to repositioning the enemy cars a set distance away when they get too far away from you. This means that if you just sit still at the beginning of the race, all of the opponent's vehicles will just remain suspended about 100 yards yards ahead of you, and if you get too far ahead, you'll end up just dragging them along. This was way worse on release, by the way. It used to be if you looked behind you, the opponent's cars would spawn ahead of your vehicle because of how poorly implemented the rubber banding was. Just like any other rubber banding racing games, you can lose at the very end of the race because of a minor slip-up, which could set you back far enough to get disqualified from further races. This is the only side job in the game that I would strongly recommend against playing. There are four races, they are all boring at best, and the revenge plot rings hollow and contrived. As for Claire himself, I think a suicide cult would be an interesting topic for a cyberpunk game to explore, but Deus Ex already did it better. 
Cyberpunk 2077 has two optional quest lines that unlock separate endings, and one of these is the quest line where V helps out Pan Am and the Avocados. After some time, Pan Am will call V and request his help with urgent matters. Now, up until this point, V could have refused to let her get revenge on her former partner Nash and left her and her best friend to die while she was wounded, so I'm not exactly sure why she would view V as someone who could be relied on, but whatever, let's just move on. The entire Avocados quest line suffers from the same problems that the Hellman mission suffered from, mainly that they rely on rigid and poorly tested set pieces that just aren't all that fun to play. When first talking to Pan Am, she tells V that the Wraiths took Saul and are holding him prisoner, reinforcing the perception of Saul as a weak and pathetic leader. After yet another boring pseudo-cinematic walk through the camp, V meets with the other members of the Avocados who are planning his rescue. In one of the most awkward moments in the entire game, everyone suddenly stops talking as Mitch Path finds his way up to V in an over-exaggerated arc. Both the Avocados questline and the Hellman lead are full of bizarre moments like this that detract from the atmosphere that the game is trying to present. Also, this entire mission just makes the Avocados look like incompetent fools. When their leader gets kidnapped, they have to rely on some nobody who showed up less than a week ago to save him. I'm sorry, but this scenario doesn't make V look like some badass merc. It just makes the Avocados look like absolute idiots. Like the drone sequence during the Hellman lead, the game lets you observe a drone that's flying over the base where the rays are holding Saul. One huge caveat is that tagged enemies don't persist, which is disappointing. But still, this is an okay introduction to a stealth combat arena. Before heading over to the encampment, Mitch gives V a rhino shot that's supposed to stimulate Saul's central pump. Strangely enough, if you select to ride with Pan Am this time, V drives instead of her. This is one of the few times in the entire game where V drives an NPC around instead of vice versa. This stealth combat arena is pretty solid, but when scrutinized in the context of its associated mission, there are some pretty notable flaws. For example, if you visit it early, like literally right before you start the mission, Saul and most of the enemies don't spawn. This means that V can essentially just charge into the basement and unlock the hidden exit early, which makes saving Saul during the mission a walk in the park. I'm just really annoyed that there isn't a skip here. Saul should have been present in the basement from Pan Am's initial call onward. V could have just called Pan Am at this point, telling her that he's found Saul, and the rest of the mission could resume from there. If it's insisted that the player absolutely can't skip the camp section, the explanation as to why V can't extract Saul is already there. V doesn't have the rhino stimulant yet, which would mean that Saul would be unable to travel. The most unique aspect of this encounter is that a massive sandstorm blows in just as V and Pan Am extract Saul. If you raise an alarm during Saul's rescue, Pan Am uses the cover of the sandstorm to drive up to the warehouse entrance to pick up V and Saul in her van. If no alarm is raised, Pan Am's van is parked outside. Alrighty, so now all that's left to do is hop in Pan Am's van and continue with the scripted events of the mission, right? But wait a second, hang on. Why should V have to share Saul with Pan Am? What's stopping him from taking his new best friend and just fast traveling away? Surely the mission designers wouldn't have left in an oversight like that. God bless Cyberpunk 2077's troubled development cycle. Not only does doing this drag Saul around as a fully functional AI companion, it takes the sandstorm along with him. Night City actually looks pretty damn amazing at some angles when it's consumed by this massive volumetric cloud of doom. The wind effects carry over as well. It's surprising that Night City's residents tolerate such a hostile climate. So yeah, I ended up hanging out with Saul for about 25 hours before going back to Pan Am to advance the mission. This humorous bug really outlines how much more fun Cyberpunk's open world would be if you could take AI companions with you, just like companions in Fallout 4. I mean, the companion AI is already present. Other than the general bugginess that embodies AI companions, there were no additional issues tied to Saul following me around. So yeah, dear CDPR, please make AI companions a thing. I truly believe that this would do a lot to breathe life into the open world. Anyways, let's continue with the main story and see what happens. God. All the time. We finally really did it. Damn you all to hell! 
So, after finding Hellman and uploading the virus to the float, Takemura calls V and tells him that they're ready to move on the parade. Ah, uh, Goro. If you're here to jump, remember that there's help available. There's a round-the-clock hotline. That is not funny. Modern games are full of moments where time moving forward is solely dependent on the player's actions, but in my opinion, this parade sequence is an exceptionally bad offender in this regard. The Kang Tao transport carrying Hellman just so happening to fly by the EMP emitter at the player's convenience was also a massive coincidence, but in terms of sheer scale and level of importance, this parade takes the cake. This entire sequence exists on behalf of the player's volition, which in turn makes it feel trivial and shallow. For a sequence like this to truly impress, every Everything has to feel bigger than the player character. V needs to feel like one of many attendants at a spectacle that trumps all of them in importance. Having such a massive event start precisely when the player wills it to just makes it feel cheap. But unfortunately, this is a problem that most modern day games share. Hopefully one day video game writers will learn to overcome this hurdle. Another thing that detracts from the value of the spectacle is that the other attendants literally serve as an invisible wall that keeps the player on an insanely narrow path. Also, Saul seems kind of lost. I don't know what's up with him today. V's objective is to eliminate the snipers who are guarding Hanako Arasaka's float from various vantage points. In gameplay terms, this means running from point A to point B to point C, killing or non-lethally incapacitating a few enemies as relatively boring exposition pops up on occasion. Cyberpunk's gameplay is designed around open-ended stealth combat arenas, not corridors. The game hopes that the visual spectacle will be enough to distract the player from this mission's shortcomings, but it isn't. Most of the exposition is about Adam Smasher, the guy that the game tries ever so hard to make the player view as their enemy. Open world games have a lot of trouble giving compelling antagonist screen time. The Far Cry series notoriously struggles with this. Adam Smasher is a visually interesting antagonist with very little substance to him. In some ways, he reminds me of the Professor in the first Witcher game. They're both kind of cartoon villains the story tries to turn into MacGuffins. However, all that Smasher did was incapacitate Johnny 50 years ago, and honestly, that's not really enough to make him a compelling villain. It probably would have been better if he was the one to kill Jackie. That would at least give the player a reason to want to kill him in the end. I could keep listing nitpicks. NPCs don't react to gunfire. Riding a float too far away auto kills you. This entire section makes Arasaka security even dumber than it was during the heist, but let's just move on. Eventually, V and my boy Saul make it to the location of an Arasaka netrunner, whom you'd be forgiven for mistaking as T-Bug. Upon attempting to unplug her from the net, Takemura's old buddy Oda shows up to ruin V's fun. Oda is no more fun to fight than a cyber psycho. In other words, he's a bullet sponge enemy who autistically dances around the combat arena until you've left clicked him to death. No strategy or real challenge involved. Upon downing him, he may or may not gain the ability to hover in the air like a true ninja. This is where one of the game's more consequential choices comes into play. You have the option to kill or spare Oda, and we'll get to the ramifications of doing so later on. Now that Oda is out of the way, V hacks into the network to disable the security measures that will allow Takemura to get in and see Hanako Arasaka on her float. This is also where the game remembers that it needs to give some face time to the other more prominent antagonist, Yorinobu Arasaka, though only through this little box thing. On all three of my playthroughs, I'd honestly forgotten what Yorinobu looked like at this point, so I guess it's a good thing that they decided to show his face at all. After the call, in which nothing notable was really said, Takemura charges in and frantically tries to tell Hanako the truth about her father, but for some reason she kind of trots a bit closer to him, prompting him to shoot her with a stun gun, I honestly I have no idea what she was trying to accomplish here. So far, things haven't exactly been going to plan. When V jacks out, he is immediately attacked by Arasaka drones and is forced to flee from the building with his good buddy Saul. Once again, if this mission succeeded in doing one thing, it was making Arasaka look as stupid as humanly possible, especially if you went loud when slipping the virus into Hanako's float. This is even worse than the Hellman job when it comes to undermining any understanding as to how corporations have any sort of grip over this world. The success of this plan doesn't communicate that V and Takemura are clever, it communicates that Arasaka is dumb and unlucky. V makes it to Takemura's hideout and knocks on the door three times. 
Or maybe that was four times. When inside, V finally gets to relay his testimony to Hanako while Saul stands guard by the door. She doesn't seem all that receptive to this information during this point in time. I'd like to quickly interject that while I like Takemura's character, there are some voice lines that his actor completely botches. We can confirm every word he speaks. If only you will help him with the relic. All of a sudden, there's a knock on the door, and Takemura tells V to go and check. As if it wasn't 100% obvious obvious who it was. V, Takemura, and Saul just kidnapped one of the most high-profile people in the world, and Takemura is naive enough to think that there's the slightest chance that anyone but Arasaka's elite death squad just knocked on that door. If you hesitate, Takemura will just keep repeating, go, and well, without moving an inch to find cover for the painfully obvious attack that's about to ensue. Go. Well. I am baffled as to why this attack didn't just play out as part of the cutscene. This moment is made so awkward by the necessity to walk up to the door, open it, and trigger the cutscene where Arasaka attacks. After falling through the floor, Johnny urges V to leave Takemura behind and leave without him. This is the second major decision that happens during this portion of the game. V can save Takemura's life or leave him to die. What's more, this isn't broadcasted to the player in the form of a mission marker. The player is left to assume that Takemura is done for and there's nothing left to do but leave. It was either pretty daring, or a result of rush development, to trust that the player will work it out on their own that Takemura can be saved. When V escapes, his plot fatigue kicks in and leaves him crippled momentarily. If alive, Takemura, being the honorable, reliable guy that he is, simply yells at V that they need to split up before leaving him to writhe in pain on the concrete alone. What a guy. V, Takemura, and Saul split up, and V finds himself at the same motel that he stayed at before the Hellman job. The game cuts to V holding a shotgun at the door, a shotgun that seemingly appeared out of thin air. After hearing a knock, V opens the door to see that a strange woman is standing outside. After barging her way in, she sits down and reveals that she is just a doll sent by Hanako Arasaka. Using the behavioral chip inside the doll, Hanako is able to have something akin to an in-person meeting with V, during which she conveys that after thinking about about it more clearly, she has decided to help V and Takemura, if he's still alive that is. However, at this point in the game, she forgoes telling V her actual plan. This conversation plays out somewhat differently if you've already completed the Voodoo Boy story missions, but I'll get back to that later. The important thing to note is that she is hesitant to go all in yet because she doesn't have enough information on Soul Killer. In other words, the player needs to finish the rest of the story before the game can end. After Hanako's doll leaves, if the player chose to save Takemura, Takemura, V will immediately get a rather jarring call where Takemura just calls up and says nothing. What's more awkward is that if you walk out of the motel room, the call immediately gets interrupted by the next scripted Johnny sequence. This is the only one of these sequences that try to convey that Johnny is gradually taking over V's mind, as the player has the option to make V smoke a cigarette. The rest of the dialogue options allow the player to express their feelings about Johnny. If you are in the middle of a call with Takemura, the call will resume upon exiting this conversation with more ceremony than when initially accepting the call. Hey there, uh, what are we talking about? This call essentially serves as a band-aid to fill in information about what happened to Takemura after they parted and what is currently happening with Arasaka, none of which is all that important. Hey, wait a second, the storm cleared up. I mean, there's still quite the breeze, but visibility is much better. So yeah, doing the parade mission resets the weather to something more standard. Overall, it's a pretty neat exploit. Let's break from the main story once more to get a couple of the larger side jobs out of the way, starting with Judy's loyalty mission in Romance Path. Judy's questline is in many ways similar to the main story mission where V and Judy track down Ev, but that shouldn't come as a surprise. It literally concludes the storyline that was started in that mission. Part of your enjoyment of this quest will come down to whether or not you believe that the writers at CDPR intended for Judy to come off as a hypocrite who is being dishonest with herself. At some point, V will get a call from Judy asking him to come to her apartment where you'll find her crying over Evelyn's dead body. It turns out that Evelyn couldn't live with everything that had been done to her, so she killed herself. Judy seems to think that Evelyn committed suicide because Woodman raped her, which leads her to place the majority of the blame of Ev's death on Clouds and Woodman himself. There are two important problems with this. Firstly, being raped by Woodman simply isn't the worst thing that happened to Ev over the past few weeks. The scavs literally tortured her and recorded BDs of her pain, and I'd wager that that's a hell of a lot more traumatic for 
for a sex worker than getting raped. The second issue is that Judy doesn't seem to place any of the blame on the voodoo boys for zeroing her in the first place. As far as I know, there isn't even an option to tell her about your experiences with the voodoo boys after you meet them. These two factors seem to suggest that Judy is lying to herself to create an overly simplistic narrative that Clouds is solely responsible for what happened to Ev. In a subsequent call, Judy informs V that she has a plan to take over Clouds and that they need to meet with a woman named Maiko, an unofficial manager at Clouds and Judy's former squeeze. This is yet another example of an exchange that would have better played out as a cutscene, as the player has nothing to do but screw around as relatively mundane exposition is laid out. Even Saul is bored. Maiko is an opportunist. She doesn't agree with Judy's moral reasoning, but she isn't outright against challenging Cloud's leadership. Judy, V, and Saul walk away from this meeting unsure if Maiko will help them. This is where the choice to kill Woodman comes up again. If he's still alive, V and Judy can access the maintenance floor using the elevator and kill him. However, afterwards, Judy tells V that she still feels empty inside. For now, Judy drives away. And I'd like to mention that I'm disappointed that she doesn't pathfind back to her apartment like Takemura path found to the meeting spot during his main story mission. Later, Judy will call V, telling him that there's going to be a meeting at her apartment and she wants to know what kind of pizza he'd like. And what do you know, your choice of pizza is present at her apartment when the meeting starts. Judy's gathered a couple of dolls who are in on the scheme to take over Clouds, along with Maiko, who arrives late. This is where Judy unveils her plan to modify the dolls' behavioral chips to give them advanced hand-to-hand -hand combat skills, which is the closest that the concept of dolls comes to interesting sci-fi. To prove their effectiveness, V engages in combat with Tom, and Saul doesn't take all too kindly to it. Brace yourselves! Don't worry your head about it. Not like you can hurt it. No kidding! Tom flips V, base Johnny, Horse. Maiko isn't impressed, and just after everyone leaves, V's plot fatigue kicks in again, which prompts Judy to offer him the ability to sleep it off on her couch. The next thing on the agenda is the takeover of Clouds. The plan is to infiltrate the penthouse and make a deal with the owners to allow the dolls to run Clouds themselves while they get a portion of the profits. V meets with the gang at the base of the mega building before riding the elevator up to the maintenance level where he takes out a few guards in order to allow Judy access to the panel that she needs to hack to upload the combat virus. Next, V heads to the roof, which has a lot of unused open space for some reason. Anyways, there's a brief stealth combat arena before V makes it inside the room where Maiko and the Cloud's managers are waiting. Maiko throws a wrench into Judy's plan by attempting to persuade the owners to replace Cloud's former manager with none other than herself. This is where the big choice comes in. V can betray Judy and go along with Maiko's new plan, or he can fuck over Maiko and start a fight with the owners. This choice is compounded with a subsequent choice. Either to take Maiko's money or not if you sided with her, or to kill Maiko or not if you sided with Judy. Next, V meets with Judy, and her reaction will range from pissed to happy. She also comments on the subsequent choice as well. If you decided to fuck over Judy, she blocks V and never speaks to him again. Kinda. But if you decide to side with Judy against Maiko, there's one more optional side job that we'll get to in a second. If there's one thing that really disappointed me about this questline, it's the choice you make at the penthouse. One of the foremost things that the Witcher series is known for is its interesting choices. Choices that actually make you stop and think about what the right thing to do is. The big choice of this questline is boring. It's pretty much down to whether you want to be an asshole or not. Going the Vosh route and rejecting the worker co-op is portrayed as a purely cynical option. This decision doesn't task you with deciding what's best for the workers at Clouds, it tasks you with deciding whether or not you want to be a dick. The second thing worth mentioning is that right next to where Judy leaves you, the two monks from the side job we did back during Act 1 are just hanging out. I actually really appreciate their inclusion in this specific area. At this point in the game, seeing them after so long comes off as rather nostalgic. Better yet, they actually remember whether you dealt with the Maelstrom goons lethally or non-lethally, which brings a greater sense of continuity to your actions when you'd least expect it. Also, you actually get to ask them about the relic, and whether someone like Johnny is really alive. You even get to hear Johnny's response to what the monks have to say. What's your take, Johnny? You just you or a copy? What difference does it make? You heard him, I'm trapped in a few lines of code. This encounter is great. It's well placed, unique based on your choices, and genuinely insightful and fitting with the themes of the game. Anyways, back to Judy's questline. 
if you didn't pick the asshole option, there's one additional side job where Judy takes V diving to show him her hometown, which was flooded when the evil bad corporations were evil and did bad things. This section has a big problem. It feels like a date. This isn't a problem if you're a female V and actually intend to romance Judy like I did in my second playthrough, but if not, it comes off as awkward and inconsistent. Judy will simply not let you romance her if you're a male V, which means that the sequence of events comes off as anticlimactic and full of mixed messages. Judy's romance mission isn't even the worst in this regard. Pan Am and especially River have their moments where they send mixed signals when it just isn't possible to romance them. Other than the awkwardness if you're a male V, this mission is fine. You get to dive underwater and see a town that's been fully submerged after the building of a dam, which is seemingly based off of the true story of the Trinity Dam in California, and overall this section is unique enough that its linear nature didn't bother me. Eventually, V gets hit with his plot fatigue and has to surface. One thing to note about this section is that Judy is able to hear what Johnny says because of some technology she has hooked up to V. This seems like a very useful concept that never gets brought up again after this. It's just after this where the player can romance Judy if V is female. Doing so will also prompt Judy to stay in Night City instead of leaving like she was planning. She gives V access to her apartment no matter what. Judy's character arc is about her coming to terms about leaving Night City, fundamentally rejecting everything about her cultural sphere, even after working so hard to reshape it in her image. I'm not sure that the writers intended for this surplus of irony, but it works for what it is, and out of all of Cyberpunk's characters, Judy probably has the most understandable arc. So, let's talk politics. Night City mayoral politics to be more specific. Lucius Rhine used to be the mayor of Night City, with the deputy mayor being Weldon Holt. Both of these characters were shown briefly during Act 1. I say used to because Mayor Rhine has recently departed, but the circumstances around his death aren't exactly clear. Just a few days before his death, there was an attempt on his life that the NCPD insist had nothing to do with his later fate. In the wake of Rhine's death, an election is to be held to determine his successor. The two main candidates are Weldon Holt and Jefferson Perales. By this point in the game, the player might have noticed some of Perales' absolutely base campaign ads scattered about Night City, but unless they have a really good memory and were paying attention to the news report that was playing during the elevator ride at the beginning of Act 2, they might be unaware that Mayor Ryan has passed. At some point, V will get a call from Elizabeth Perales, Jefferson's wife, who asks V to meet with her and her husband. During the meeting, they tell V that they're suspicious about Ryan's death and want to hire him to look into it further. Some might find it odd that the Perales' would choose some random merc to look into something like this, and I partially agree with the sentiment. Perales is not some corpo, at least he wasn't during his youth. He grew up poor and outside of the system, so it makes sense that he'd end up putting his trust in someone like V in this situation. However, the logic behind V getting selected for this job is shaky at best. Apparently Perales' wife knew Judy, and she recommended V for this job, but that just comes off as extremely contrived. Anyways, during this meeting, V gets to view a brain dance taken by one of the security personnel present during the attempted assassination of Mayor Ryan. This BD shows a cyber psycho who broke in and tried to kill Mayor. Uh, wait, wait a second, is that Saul? Well, shit! If my boy Saul was a witness to the mayor's attempted assassination, then surely he must know something about the culprit. Well, fuck. If Saul ain't talking, then it's best to pursue other leads. From the BD, V learns a bit about the attacker, the identity of the cop who shot him, and of an establishment called the Red Queen's Race. While this is yet another painfully slow brain dance sequence, it is somewhat unique in that Johnny jumps in with some amusing commentary at times that mitigates the unskippable monotony. Red Queen's Race. Cause any inner synapse zaps? Sure, a bunch of old Brit farts and powdered wigs shouting, OFF WITH THEIR HEADS! You know, you're allowed to say you don't have a clue. Upon uh, exiting the brain dance sequence, V shrinks. Yeah, this happened to me all three times I played through this part of the mission. You can actually sprint around like this and it won't return you to a standing position. Anyways, V's main lead is the cop who shot the attacker, River Ward. V calls up River, who agrees to meet him at a restaurant called Chubby Buffaloes. Upon arriving, you'll find River sitting across from his partner, Detective Han, who suspiciously pressures River to just let the case go, referring to the death of Lucius Ryan. River is a good character for the same reason that Perales is a good character. They both come off as 
as trustworthy and authentic, which for many might come off as a bizarre way to describe a cop and a politician. The similarities these two characters share could have actually been used in some interesting ways. The last two honest public officials in a corrupt city kind of cliche, maybe. Unfortunately, however, Paralysis and River's storylines massively diverge going forward, which really seems like a missed opportunity. River agrees to investigate the murder with V, as he thinks that something fishy is going on as well. Hmm, I wonder if River's partner who literally just pressured him to drop the case could have anything to do with it. Anyways, there are two new leads to follow. The employer of the man who tried to assassinate Lucius Ryan, and River's CI, who might know something about the Red Queen's race. Only the CI ends up being necessary to the investigation, but let's go over the employer first anyways. River pulls up at the market where the assassin for work and tells V that they should split up to find the place that he was employed at. This section always came off as kind of weird. I think that the developers thought that it would be immersive to have the player ask around before finding the person you need to talk to, but it just isn't. Anyways, essentially nothing new is learned here. The guy was insane and didn't like Corpos. Nothing that River didn't know when he went to warn the mayor. Two tiger claws are waiting around River's car when they return. Based on what you say, they either walk away or a fight ensues. If you killed them, River says he has paperwork to do, which only means you can't ride with him to the next location. The CI lead actually turns out to be useful, as the sex shop worker actually knows the location of the Red Queen's race. During this interaction, V can play good cop or bad cop, which will actually affect how this NPC will talk to V going forward. Anyways, now that they know the location of the Red Queen's race, all that's left to do is go there and check it out. Obviously, this club turns out to be a stealth combat arena, one that happens to be chocked full of animals. As for the quality of this arena, it's far too linear, and it's entirely contrived while you can't enter the way you exit. Interrogating this NC resident reveals that Weldon Holt was the one who hired the animals to smash up the club. In addition, the computer in the same room has security footage that shows that River's partner, Han, was involved in the murder of Mayor Rhine. Shocker. V and River return to Chubby Buffaloes and confront Han about the video. He doesn't seem to care. River tells V that he's gonna get to the bottom of this and that's it. When V goes to report to Paralas, Johnny tells him not to get involved. This isn't really a choice. Even if you have V say that he can't draw any real conclusions, the Paralas is read between the lines that V is saying that Ryan's death was the result of a conspiracy anyways, which is simply hilarious. And that's it. V gets paid and leaves. So yeah, this mission is kind of strange. Two quest lines end up branching off from here, one with Paralys and one with River. And not only do the two have nothing to do with each other, but neither do they end up having all that much to do with this mission either. But we'll get to all that later. For now, let's talk about what happens if you visit the Red Queen's race early. Surprisingly enough, you can get inside and access a computer that incriminates Han. However, upon trying to leave via the elevator, the game broke and spawned V underneath the map. After a good deal of trial and error, I managed to escape to the surface. Unfortunately, if you start the mission after having seen the video, there isn't any option to say anything about Han being responsible. Some people might say, of course there isn't, stop trying to break the game. Firstly, Saul disapproves, and secondly, being able to skip objectives is one of the most interesting things that The Witcher 3 allowed the player to do, and it's unfortunate that the same attention to detail wasn't put into Cyberpunk's mission design. It's been fun hanging out with our good buddy Saul, but I think it's about time we return him to his rightful place. Since we left, the sandstorm seems to have calmed down quite a bit. Yeah, there are still a few gusts of sand blowing from the raised base, and the clouds are still moving quite fast, but other than that, the sense of urgency has been somewhat diminished. Uh, upon entering the van, Pan Am drives to a house where the gang takes shelter from the, um, Storm. The Avocados questline continues to embody the poor mission design of the Hellman questline. Making the player walk outside and pay respects to a circuit box is not immersive, it's just boring. Immersion might have flown out the window the second Saul and V ran off to complete half of the game together, but the boring mission design doesn't help either. Anyways, after the power gets turned on, the three sit down and discuss the challenges to face the Avocados. Nomad politics are kind of weird. There are seven nomad nations, not including the Raffin Shiv. 
alive. Only the avocados and the Raffin Shiv are relevant in Cyberpunk 2077, though it's worth noting that Nomad V used to be a member of the Backers, who are a part of Snake Nation. Nomad nations are essentially really large gangs. Reading the wiki, there's a lot of potential when writing a story about nomads and nomad politics, which makes it all the more disappointing when you take a look at how nomads are realized in Cyberpunk 2077. The avocados are a joke. They're supposed to be like 500 members in the Night City area, but there are only like 50 people seen at the camp at any given time. The avocados come off more so as an RV camp than a formidable gang. And by the way, Saul isn't just a leader of this chapter. He's a leader of the entirety of the avocados. All 10,000 of them. And my god, does that go a long ways in lessening my ability to take the avocados seriously. But let's get back to the specific issues that the avocados are dealing with. The avocados own territory, which Saul wants to sell to the Biotechnica Corporation. Pan Am opposes this, which sets up a pretty clear dichotomy. However, the game never really gives you enough information to judge this dilemma yourself. Would the avocados be better off selling to Biotechnica? How the hell are we supposed to know? Are corporations still two-dimensional bad guys? Or is this an actual debate? During this exchange, the game allows you to voice your opinion, yet it hasn't really given you any reason to care. But let's set that aside and move forward with the mission. Saul leaves the room, but not before saying something weird. Do you know what they call these storms in North Africa? Haboobs. Damn, I love that word. And all of a sudden, V is alone with Pan Am. This is where the same awkwardness that popped up during the Judy Romance mission rears its ugly head. Pan Am flirts with V, quite aggressively I might add, and she does this even if V is a female. Pan Am is a heterosexual. She has no interest in developing a romantic relationship with female V, but she'll still flirt with her in the exact same way she'll flirt with male V. You actually can't make any serious advances in this scene, but the awkwardness remains all the same. The next Next morning, V wakes up and sees Pan Am off, but not before Pan Am gives him a gun and possibly a kiss if he's built up enough goodwill from her so far. After Pan Am rides off, Saul, Cassidy, and one other remain- uh, uh. I guess he had somewhere to be. Anyways, sometime later, V returns to the Avocado's camp, only to find Pan Am, Saul, and Mitch arguing over something. Pan Am and some others have organized a hit on a Militech convoy that's transporting a vehicle called a Basilisk, and Saul's having none of it. He still believes that the Avocados can work with the corporations, and doesn't want to do anything to rock the boat. Pan Am, however, just wants to recklessly steal stuff. So far, the Saul-Pan Am dichotomy isn't shaping up to be all that deep. Saul comes off as an idiot who really doesn't deserve leadership, but what exactly does Pan Am offer as an alternative? This conflict doesn't give the player much to think about. There aren't any real stakes to weigh or morals to debate. Pan Am's recklessness sounds like it would have consequences, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. The game doesn't let you side with Saul anymore. All you can do is go along with Pan Am or walk away from this mission. The plan is to drive a train in front of the convoy and ambush it. However, first those involved need to take control of the train, which involves breaking into the control tower, finding a punch card, and putting it into the reader. A truly exciting sequence of events. Before we can get to all that, however, we need to first find a way into the tower. Most players will likely be drawn to the front door that has a level 3 tech skill check, which just so happens to be the minimum tech skill that Cyberpunk allows the player to have. However, real gamers will parkour onto the roof and enter through the open window. Get wrecked, door. That was impressive. And I prefer the door. It's at this point where the player can accidentally proposition Pan Am for prostitution while thinking that you're just stating your intentions to romance her. Whoops. Nomads sure do have weird fireside habits. I honestly have no idea why the series of interactions is so broken. After waiting for nightfall, the gang starts discussing nomad politics. Turns out that Scorpion, the guy who died, tried to persuade Saul to merge the avocados with Snake Nation, a loose confederation of nomad clans that unionize for political power. They also talk about the Mexican War, an event that gets brought up every once in a while but never really seems to have mattered all that much. For me, none of this exposition was interesting because it all felt so distant from V and his immediate problems. The Witcher games did a much better job entwining Geralt's story with the fates of the various kingdoms. 
V goes to sleep and wakes up the next morning to Pan Am's smiling face. As a reminder, by this point in the game, V could have refused to let her take revenge on Nash, abandoned her while she was wounded and Mitch was still in need of saving, left her in the middle of a sandstorm for weeks while eloping with Saul, and just the day prior propositioned her for prostitution, and yet she still feels obligated to wake V up with a warm smile. The gang all hop into their cars and ride to the ambush site with a train alongside them. Pan Am orders V to shoot the coupler to disconnect the freight car that's slowing the train down, but this isn't the slightest bit necessary for the train to make it to the point it needs to before stopping the convoy dead in its tracks. Naturally, everything goes without a hitch, and the avocado steal the basilisk can take it back to their camp. Now, I've complained about conversations between NPCs feeling stiff before, especially the ones between the avocados, but they were nothing compared to what is about to ensue. First, the gang gets out of their vehicles and awkwardly pathfind to evenly spaced locations before assuming idle animations. Then they proceed to stand there and wait until Saul slowly walks over and then starts yelling at Pan Am. These interactions were already awkward because V was always an unnecessary bystander, but in this instance everyone but Saul and Pan Am are unnecessary bystanders as well. This wouldn't have been an issue if this was a cutscene. The camera would focus on Pan Am and Saul, capturing their body language more effectively, and the player wouldn't be burdened by the awkwardness of having to focus the camera. This wouldn't have to be a third person cutscene either. A Far Cry esque first person cutscene would be just fine. This otherwise tense scene is let down by its poor presentation. Also, why is Saul's anger directed solely at Pan Am when like all of the other prominent avocados were also in on it? Anyways, Saul's mad, Pan Am starts ordering people around for some reason and the mission ends. Great. What happens next is kind of weird. Both times I got to this point in the game, the game wouldn't let me save or fast travel until I moved far enough away from the camp. While likely a bug, if not for this restriction, I likely wouldn't have stumbled across the following side job on my third playthrough. Mitch asks V for a favor. More specifically, a favor that is related to Scorpion and requires V to follow Mitch in his vehicle while he drives Scorpion's car. Upon arriving at the destination, Mitch reveals that Scorpion's body is in the trunk and that his dying wish was to be driven off into this canyon in a literal blaze of glory. One invisible gas canister later and Scorpion's dying wish is fulfilled. Overall, it's a decent enough side job. Scorpion otherwise just felt like a character whose sole purpose was to die to add dramatic tension. So it's nice that between rigging up broken gas canister animation, CDPR was able to make Scorpion feel a bit more like a real person. A while later, Pan Am will call about the Basilisk being ready. If you're as unlucky as I was during my second playthrough, this will also be the point in the game where the quest progression breaks and you're unable to continue with this questline. I believe this has since been patched. Pan Am and V hop into the Basilisk and begin testing out its capabilities. While nothing groundbreaking, the Basilisk is fun enough to use. However, what's much more fun to use is Pan Am. <laughs> I will admit that I find this scenario humorous. Uh, apparently operating the basilisk requires both of their minds to be in sync with each other, so it's almost like they're both fucking themselves along with each other, I guess. It's worth noting that Pan Am will not put out if you haven't simped hard enough. I'm pretty sure treating her like a prostitute didn't help either. I'm not sure if the other three romance paths have similar triggers or not. Judy and River's paths both allow you to make decisions that restrict access to the romance mission itself, but I'm not sure if there's anything you can do to find yourself cucked in the end. All of a sudden, the two get a call about Raf and Shiv attacking the Avocado's camp, which prompts V and Pan Am to return post-haste. After fighting them off, Pan Am and V depart the Basilisk, and Saul confronts Pan Am once more. Come on, Saul. If I have to leave the clan, please just say so. Spare me another speech of yours at the very least. I'm afraid you'll have to sit through a few more, because from this day forward, you will lead this family by my side. That's right! Saul does a total 180 for absolutely no fucking reason! I I'm sorry, but I hesitate to call this bad writing, because that would imply that someone actually sat down and wrote something which someone else had to then read during the process of implementation. There is no weight behind this revelation. Saul is mean, but now he's nice and gives Pan Am the reins of leadership over the avocados because fuck you, that's why. Saul has repeatedly been proven wrong about the threat that the Raffin ship represented, and he has repeatedly shrugged off any evidence of his incompetence, but all of a sudden he has a change of heart because the plot demands it. This almost has to be a rushed conclusion to what was meant to be a branching questline where the player could either side with Pan Am or Saul. Not that that would have been all that interesting of a choice in the first place. <sighs> 
So, I'll always remember the time we shared, but for the record, you are a truly awful character. As for Pan Am, I think she shared enough work to become the leader of the Avocados. Anyways, V's plot fatigue kicks in, the Avocados move north, and that's it. This change of location was extremely annoying during my first playthrough when I didn't use any fast travel, but other than that, the new camp is rather unremarkable. There are two more side jobs related to the Avocados that I feel like mentioning before moving on to the next batch of more general side jobs. At some point, V will come across a few of the more prominent avocados doing a deal with some scavs. There's a kid named Taco guarding the deal who tells V what's going on and asks him what he's doing there, to which V responds that this is a chance meeting, despite the fact that the player will likely have found the side job by just following the icon on the map. Based on the player's actions, the deal either ends peacefully or in a firefight. I personally find it annoying that the deal doesn't play out at all if you don't interfere, but I suppose it's a fine enough distraction. The second side job is a little better. Bob's son Jake is in need of a new kidney, so he asks V to pick one up at a prearranged deal in Night City. The deal turns out to be a trap by the NCPD for some reason. After killing all of the officers, V confronts the contact and has the option to kill him or not. If the player is hasty and kills him, it turns out that the kidney has been tampered with, which results in Jake's death. However, if the player either lets him live or has a sufficient intelligence stat, they learn the truth and receive a shard that wipes a virus from the artificial kidney. I like this side job because I almost made the mistake of killing him on my first playthrough, but I have to admit that it's kind of stupid that you can't just loot the shard from the contact's dead body. The Sinner Man questline is really strange due to how abruptly it introduces the player to an extremely complicated situation, before giving them virtually no ability to impact the situation themselves. Firstly, V will get a call from Wakako, where she might very well say absolutely nothing because of a well-known bug. But if your game isn't broken, then she'll say that her client wants V to kill a murderer who's now on death row. V meets the client, Bill, outside of a hotel, where you'll find him leaning against a floating car. If you choose the correct dialogue, options, Bill reveals that V's job is to help him kill a death row inmate named Joshua Stevenson who murdered his wife. All of a sudden, the two take off after a police car, in what for me was certainly the most broken sequence in the entire game. Cyberpunk's vehicle mechanics are already far too lackluster to support any kind of chase sequence, but that's not even the most broken part. For some reason, the shadows break when the chase starts and fix themselves later on. This happened consistently every single time I played through this section. All all of a sudden, the police car stops under an overpass, and at this point, one might assume that the game wants you to carry out the contract and kill Joshua, but doing so immediately causes Bill to die, and immediately triggers a wanted state. Now, I played through this mission before the patch that fixed the cops, which essentially meant that V got insta-killed at this point every single time. The busted wanted system combined with the unintuitive mission design combined with the lazy checkpoint placements meant that I spawned back at the start of the mission and had to go through the the broken introduction every single time I died. And I died a lot. During my first playthrough because I didn't know what the hell I was supposed to do, and during my third because I wanted to see what would happen if you killed Joshua. Turns out you actually can, and doing so causes a side job to conclude with Wakako asking V how he felt about his actions, to which V replies meh, to which Wakako replies radio. However, it's clear that killing Joshua is not what the developers intend for the player to do. Instead, the devs want the player to just stand there like a jackass as the cops kill Bill. A terrible movie, by the way. Considering what happens next, this is an immensely bizarre introduction to this questline. After the client gets zeroed, the assassination target, Joshua Stevenson, gets out of the car and asks V to join him. Johnny is just as confused as the player during all of this, but without the frustration of having to play through that stupid chase sequence ten times. The whole thing is just a barrel of laughs to him. The player can choose to get in the car and well, thank god it auto saves. Speaking of god, during the ride, Joshua dumps a load of exposition that conveys he used to be a murderer but has since found Christ. Once arriving at the destination, V gets out of the car and Fucking cars, man. If you were thinking that things were gonna stop being confusing right about now, then boy are you in for a surprise. V and Joshua enter the nicely detailed house and sit down for non-alcoholic refreshments with Zuleika. After V gets to share his feelings about his belief in God, we get to discover what this whole thing is really about. Joshua murdered Zuleika's brother, but instead of holding a grudge against him, she sent him letters in prison and converted him to Christianity. Joshua is on death row, but since converting to Christianity, 
Kennedy, he has agreed to die by crucifixion and have the experience of his death recorded as a brain dance for distribution, but Zuleika is against this. Suddenly, Zuleika's mother, Gloria, walks in and demands that V and Joshua leave her house. You might be wondering why Gloria is white and Zuleika appears to be Indian, and I believe that's because she's adopted, but I couldn't find any material directly stating so. This plotline was poorly presented and overly convoluted enough already without making the player pause to question why a white woman's daughter is Indian. During the ensuing car ride, you can talk to Joshua about the events that just took place or awkwardly change the subject to where they're gonna go to eat. Before entering Pies, Rachel tries to bribe V into leaving Joshua alone. Accepting this offer will end the questline and cause Johnny to express disapproval of your actions. While at Pies, you can choose to engage in some surprisingly casual conversation topics, such as talking to Joshua about movies. This exchange really just reinforces that Rachel is extremely protective of Joshua because she thinks that she can make a fortune off of him. The player is given dialogue options to express how they feel about the matter and whether the corpos are exploiting Joshua or not, but these decisions don't end up mattering. Johnny seems to like Joshua because he's free-spirited, but he strongly disapproves of the corpos exploiting him. This is an okay enough moral dilemma and all, but the questline doesn't end up letting the player make any interesting decisions. After a while, V will get called to the studio where Joshua's death is to be recorded. It's here where V can pray with Joshua before his death. The player is also given the option to have V nail Joshua to the cross himself. But that's it. Based on a handful of prior dialogue options with Joshua, the BD will either successfully take or not. But the game never lets you truly express judgment on the moral dilemma here. If the writers scrap the half-ass opening and just introduce the questline as V getting hired to help escort Joshua around, Around, maybe they could have put more effort into the ending. In my opinion, the player should have been tasked with choosing whether or not to persuade Joshua that he's being exploited and help him escape, or even whether or not to punish him for his crimes after hearing the full story. As it stands, this questline is pretty bad. It had potential as an idea, but the execution is lackluster to say the least. The next side job in River's questline, The Hunt, is one of the best side jobs in the entire game. One of the reasons that it manages to be so good is because it has actual stakes, with the possibility of failure if the player isn't paying enough attention. The mission starts with a call from River requesting V's help. Considering how River just learned that his partner is dirty, it's not implausible that his trust would shift to the person who helped him uncover the truth behind his partner's corruption. Upon meeting up with River, the player learns that a serial killer named Anthony Harris, nicknamed Peter Peter Pan, was recently shot by some police officers and is now in a coma. This is relevant because River's nephew Randy recently went missing, and Peter Pan's latest victim was wearing Randy's shoes. This is a unique plot for a serial killer story. The killer is already apprehended and in a coma, so all that's left to do is find out where his victims are being kept. Since River is personally invested in this, he wants to take matters into his own hands instead of relying on the investigation to take its course. River has got it into his mind that the NCPD was able to capture a BD from Peter Pan's dreams, a BD which would potentially give them a clue as to where they could find Randy. So the two break into the police department and search around. Upon finding Harris's files, an acquaintance of Rivers named Dr. Packard barges in and demands that the two leave. The game tries to play up some dramatic tension between River and Dr. Packard, but it ends up feeling pretty unsubstantial so I'm just gonna breeze over it. It's here where it's revealed that River was suspended from the force due to his investigation into Ryan's death, which is the only event that ties the prior side job to this one outside of V and River's meeting. River ends up blackmailing Packard into helping them, but she reveals that Harris hasn't been dreaming and suggests that they've hit a dead end. This is where River suggests that some form of audiovisual stimulation can prompt Harris into dreaming something relevant to Randy's whereabouts, so the two visit River's sister's place to search for further information. The concept of brain dances being recorded from dreams is actually a pretty nifty idea. It's clear that this technology only exists to move the plot along, but when viewed in isolation it actually comes off as relatively interesting science fiction, and a clever way to prompt River and V to visit Randy's household. Next we meet River's sister, Joss, and her children. The little girl's character model looks exceptionally freaky, but there's a neat touch in this interaction where if you're playing the female V she'll ask if you're River's girlfriend. There was also a moment when you left the police department where Johnny stated that he believed that River was just trying to get into your pants, which while obviously wrong 
long is an attention to detail that other games that allow you to choose your sex generally don't include. In fact, they go out of their way not to remark on such things, resulting in a much more bland experience. It's also worth noting that if you haven't uncrouched since getting out of Paralysis' car, you'll still be locked in a crouch-like state where you can run around at full speed. Next is where V and River search Randy's room for clues. It's here where we learn that Randy's dad was an avocado, but this doesn't end up being all that important going forward. What's important is Randy's computer, but it's locked and can't be accessed without a password or a high enough intelligence skill. If you have low intelligence, after enough trial and error, you guess the name of a song that Randy had in his record player and it turns out to be correct. It's on this laptop where we learn that Harris befriended Randy before luring him into meeting him in person. All of this is suitably creepy and adds up to create a genuine sense of unease moving forward. After a bit of digging into a website that Harris linked to Randy, V finds a creepy video file that used to be on the website which they hope can be used to stimulate Harris into dreaming about something pertaining to Randy's whereabouts. Lastly, V can get the IP address of the website if his intelligence status high enough. At dinner, there's some decent dialogue that manages to raise the tension surrounding whether or not they will end up finding Randy, even if you choose to keep V optimistic. V ends up staying the night. River wakes him up the next morning, urgently stating that the video file worked and that they've got a recording of Harris's dreams. This is where you probably expect me to complain about yet another BD sequence, but these series of BDs are actually really well done. Despite being the buggiest BD sequences in the entire game, most of them are actually skippable, and they're so chocked full of hidden details that I wasn't bored during any of the three times I played through this mission. It's also worth noting that what we're seeing is a dream, not a one-to-one -one memory. This opens the door for more unsettling imagery that goes farther in conveying the disturbed nature of Harris's mind. During the first sequence, Harris is a child. His teacher is lecturing him about killing a schoolmate's turtle by injecting it with HGH, in a well-meaning yet misguided attempt to cure the turtle's apparent sickness. As the BD plays, you might notice that all of the kids in the background are the same character model, and what's more, they all have some kind of wrapping around their head. If you pause the sequence as Harris is running by another one of the kids, you'll see that he has some kind of strange mask on, a mask that is soon revealed to be used for cattle when Harris's dream becomes a little more eclectic. Also, seemingly due to the buggy nature of this BD sequence, when going into editing mode and inspecting Harris's character model, you can see that the other schoolboys are meant to look like Harris, but Harris isn't wearing the wrapping that conceals the fact that he has a scar on his forehead. None of this is actually necessary, however. The only thing you need to do in this sequence is to scan either a bulletin board or a trophy that gives away the school's location. The next BD sequence is entirely optional, but as it plays out, you might notice that a woman's character model exists like a shadow behind this plastic shroud until Harris opens it. This detail kind of annoys me. It's obviously meant to be Harris's mother, whom his dad accused him of killing, but neither V nor River comment on her presence. And and the name associated with her model is just randomly generated. The next and final BD is more disturbing than the final two put together. It begins with Harris viewing the same cartoon as he was starting when the last one ended, but one glance outside of the control room shows a young man crawling away in terror. Despite feeling more surreal due to the green glow, this dream appears to be the most representative of reality. There are a few clues in the sequence that are possible to miss, and doing so will force a choice between two farms. Getting Harris Harris's IP address from the website also comes into play when narrowing it down. This is where the stakes become real. If you choose the wrong farm, you're too late when you arrive at the correct one, and Randy is already overdosed on hormones. Poppy Farm is full of wraiths, and after realizing that they messed up, the two circle back to Edgewood which is laden with mines and turrets. As a pseudo-stealth combat arena, this is far too easy. You can literally just run around the side and jump over the gate to avoid most of the hazards in the front yard. Once entering via the roof, the two scramble to find Randy and check to see if the other boys are still alive. If you chose the correct farm from the start, the two make it in the nick of time to save Randy. But if you failed to do so, he's found dead instead.
I can't even begin to tell you how much a side job is elevated by the possibility of failure. On my second time through, I wasn't even fully aware that you could fail. And the moment that I saw that I had to pick between two different farmhouses, I was hit with the realization that I dodged a bullet the first time around. This side job also benefits from its restrictive nature. You can't take a break in the middle of this quest or just walk off at any point. Doing so will fail the mission. River's questline surpasses both Pan Am's and Judy's because it doesn't feel like it exists at the player's convenience. After starting this side job, you're all in. The mission ends with River stating that he's going to take care of Harris himself. If Randy is dead, River parts with a bitter tone, blaming V in part for Randy's death, yet understanding that he was just trying to help. This is also where River's questline ends if they didn't make it in time. The last thing that I'll mention is that there unfortunately isn't a skip for going to Edgewood Farm early. If the two manage to save Randy, River will call while later and invite V to dinner at Joss's. If V is a female, he'll also remark how he's missed her. So yeah, River is interested in romancing V if V is a female. Here's the thing though, no matter what, this mission feels like a date, to an even greater extent than Judy's romance mission. And if you're playing as a male V, that comes off as really, really awkward. Because River happens to be just as straight in his sexual habits as he is in his policing habits. Firstly, the way River looks and talks to V during this mission just screams seduction. There ain't no two ways about it. Secondly, this is a somewhat intimate yet admittedly wholesome dinner with River's family where V helps River cook in a way that just comes off as homoerotic if V is a dude. And no, I'm not saying that men cooking is gay. I'm saying that men helping other men cook is gay. Really fucking gay. As a male V, this mission simply doesn't work. So because of this, I will be referring to V as a female for the remainder of this mission. When V arrives, River asks her to help him cook by stirring the pot and fetching some rice. This side job has a decent number of optional interactions that make it feel much more substantial than it otherwise would, such as being able to talk to Josh when fetching the rice. V and River sit down, and the field of view narrows to focus on River's face while he discusses what happened with Harris. It turns out he didn't kill him, and to help V understand why, he tells her about his childhood. River's parents were killed before his and Josh's eyes when they were just kids. What's more, one of the culprits had River hold the gun to his mother's head and told him to pull the trigger, something that he didn't end up doing but a traumatic event all the same. This is why River decided to become a cop. As much as I like that River's backstory is further fleshed out here, I don't see the connection between Harris and River that the writers were trying to convey. While River killing Harris could be seen as self-indulgent, unnecessary, and unhealthy in its own right, I don't see why this particular memory inspired him to spare Harris's life. Still, this scene is pulled off with enough cinematic flair that most people are likely to avoid noticing this, so let's just move on. While the food's cooking, River V and the kids play an AR video game called Trouble in Haywood, which just so happens to be the game that Harris bought for Randy when he found out his address. I'm honestly kind of surprised that there isn't a reflex skill check to bring this up. This section's neat enough, though once again it feels much too intimate if you're playing as a male V. There's an optional objective to lose on purpose to appease the kids, and failing to do so will make the kids pretty upset moving forward. Dinner plays out differently based on V's set. Either way, the topic of conversation will veer towards relationships. But if V is a female, things will become somewhat awkward as both Joss and the kids tease V and River's romantic situation. Eventually, V and River will depart. The dialogue remains much more romantic if V is a female, but the atmosphere remains romantic either way. The two head towards the silo. Before the two can climb up it, V has to unlock the fence from the other side either by getting a lift from River or jumping over it herself. Whoa! Okay, we liked leaping. When V kicks the door open, it abruptly flips to an open state without any kind of animation. This happened to me on all three of my playthroughs. Once atop the water silo, the two sit down next to each other and get to talking before River gives V his gun. River has decided to leave the force to spend more time with his family. If V is a female, the romantic tension has already been laid on pretty thick by this point, and River is understandably sick of beating around the bush. What ensues is a conversation that further reinforces that V is her own character and not just an avatar of the player. After this, the player is given the option to have V kiss River. This leads to a sex scene that ends with V waking up the next morning wearing River's tank top. Christ, V. Can't believe you're making me fuck a cop. 
Yeah, I laughed pretty hard the first time I heard Johnny say that. In the ensuing conversation, you can either entrust River with the information that V is dying, or you can elect to withhold that from him. You also have the option to tell River that this was a one-time thing or convey V's desire to pursue a relationship with him. Overall, the side job works if V is a female. However, it absolutely doesn't if V is a male. If V is a male, then he wakes up the next morning after a long night of drinking, which a player didn't get to experience. Then the side job just ends. The two are still good friends, but it's a shame that they don't get to interact with each other going forward. Maybe CDPR will decide to patch in a companion system where River can aid V in doing side content just like Saul did, but as it stands now, it feels incomplete. Likewise with River, after completing I Fought the Law, Paralysis will call V and request his help once again. Like the questline we just went over, Paralysis' questline doesn't end up having that much to do with the original questline that introduced V to these characters. A couple of days ago, Paralysis was awakened by an intruder whom he shot at before passing out. The strange thing is that his private security, SSI, claims that they couldn't find any evidence about such an incident taking place. All of this led the Paralysis to hire V to examine their apartment to see if anything strange is going on. Using his Batman vision, V confirms what Paralysis claimed happened really took place. But what's more, he finds a hidden room in the Paralysis apartment that they didn't even know about. The equipment in this room connects to a transmitter that's pointed towards a black van. Elizabeth is pretty shaken up about this, but she insists that V not inform her husband yet. There are some other messages to read and additional things to inspect, but let's just skip forward to the van. There's a reason that vehicle related activities are kept to a minimum in this game. During the ensuing van chase sequence, you can get ahead of the van and just have it push you along. The van will eventually lead into an ambush in Maelstrom's territory. This is actually a pretty good stealth combat arena because it manages to reward a stealthy approach to dealing with all the Maelstrom goons by only spawning an additional wave of enemies if you get detected. Uh, upon jacking into the van, V uncovers data that reveals a truly sinister plot. Not only were shady actors spying on Jefferson and Elizabeth Perales, someone has been gradually modifying their memories to control their behavior, a neurological form of gaslighting. I think that this is a pretty neat idea, but the impact it could have had is diminished by how quickly the conspiracy is uncovered. These anonymous actors seem like a cabal of pretty clever people, so it just comes off as strange that they would let it get to the point where the Perales is hire a private investigator who tracks down the van that has all of the damning details in it. Like too many plot points in this game, this just feels contrived. There just isn't enough weight to V discovering a revelation of this magnitude. While V is viewing all of this, someone wipes the database remotely and destroys all of the proof. This either makes V look really dumb for not copying it over as he was viewing it, or the application of technology really boring. Did the Illuminati remotely wipe the data from his RAM or something? This might not bother most people, but but the sense that technology only exists to keep the plot on a narrow track really annoys me. When V meets with Elizabeth to convey the newfound information, she reveals that she suspected something was going on all along, stating that her husband seemed to be gradually changing before her eyes and that her friends had made similar remarks about her. Elizabeth's prior suspicion doesn't work as well as it could have because it wasn't foreshadowed at all, unless what she is saying is literally a result of the mind control, which is brought up as a possibility in this conversation. Elizabeth's desire for Jefferson not to know the truth supports this theory, though it's possible that her concern for his well-being could be genuine as well. V departs this meeting with a dilemma. Should he tell Perales the truth or keep him in the dark? When V goes to meet with Perales, his software gets remotely hacked, causing him to lose his vision momentarily. An unknown caller also warns him against telling Perales the truth. In the following meeting with Perales, the player can choose to tell him the truth or be some degree of vague as to why he couldn't get conclusive results. Perales leaves the conversation either motivated to bring the fight to halt, his political opposition, or to the mysterious puppet masters who have been controlling him this whole time. The mission ends with Johnny suggesting that the culprit is likely a rogue AI instead of a person for some reason. It's kind of strange that Johnny isn't mad at V for keeping Perales in the dark, but oh well. The ending where you tell Perales the truth makes no sense. These people have been shown to be all-powerful demigods to the extent that they can seemingly shut down people's cyberware at will, so why would they just allow V to tell Perales the truth without stopping him? Or at the very least, why aren't there any ramifications? V just costs them big time, and they seemingly just let it all go. No hurt feelings, I guess. This side job introduced an interesting idea that unfortunately wasn't applied in all that believable of a way, and for some people that will be enough, however I was hoping for a little bit more. 
the last thing I want to mention is the presence of a suspicious man called Mr. Blue Eyes. The devs obviously didn't intend for the player to be able to see him up close, but the leg cyberware kind of lets you do that, so whoops. Mr. Blue Eyes comes off as a similar character to Gunther Odim from The Witcher 3. He also shows up during one of the endings, but we'll get to that later. I assume he's going to end up showing up for one of Cyberpunk's DLCs. His character just feels like he's positioned in such an obvious way that I think it's inevitable that they're going to pull an Odim again and have him be some kind of Deus Ex Machina-like figure. So, remember that whole desperate search for answers needed to save V's life thing? Y yeah, that the thing we were doing before getting caught up in all that side content? You'd be forgiven for saying no. Unless you've decided to stick strictly to the story missions, all sense of pacing and urgency has been entirely deflated from the game by this point. Soul killer? The voodoo who? What's an alt Cunningham? The pacing of the main story is essentially decimated if you decide to pursue side content. And it's even worse if you pursue the gigs or cyber psychos, and especially if you try to do all the blues. So that raises the question, why did I elect to present the game's content in such a convoluted way, switching back between story and side content every once in a while? Well, simply put, there is no good time to break for side content. There's always a sense of dire urgency for the entirety of Act 2. In addition, there's no good order to present the story missions. If I were to have done this mission with the Voodoo Boys right after finding Evelyn, there would have been even bigger issues. Pacing-wise, it's clear that finding Evelyn is one of the first things that the game wants the player to do. It would also just make sense that V would track down a familiar face before going on some wild goose chase. Likewise, this Voodoo Boys mission is clearly designed to be played last, as it has a much neater transition into the section preceding Act 3 than going in the reverse order. We better recap the events that led V to search for answers from the Voodoo Boys. Judy and V saved Ev, who recorded a BD that revealed that she was planning to sell Johnny's construct to the Voodoo Boys. I'd wager that the average player has absolutely no idea why they're doing what they're doing during this point in the game. The game presents V's goal at this point as get in contact with the Voodoo Boys to find answers, when this isn't really the case. The end result of contacting the Voodoo Boys is to get in touch with Alt Cunningham, the netrunner who invented Soul Killer and whose consciousness has been an AI trapped in the net since 2013. Even the most attentive players will be aware of very little of this context, however, as Alt has been mentioned only a few times throughout the course of the story so far, and only in a rather enigmatic way. When V found Evelyn, that's because he set out to find Evelyn. However, when V finds Alt, it's because he set out to talk to people about stuff he didn't understand, who just so happened to also be looking for Alt. This lack of a clear goal from the start harms this portion of the story. Who Alt is and what she can do to help V really needed to be clear from the start, because as it stands, most players are bound to feel a lack of investment during this part of the story. In order to contact the Voodoo Boys, V first must contact Mr. Hands, the main fixer in Pacifica, who gets V a job working for the Voodoo Boys, which V hopes can get him a meeting with their leader, Memem Brigitte. The Voodoo Boys manage to be the most unique faction in the game because of how secretive and wary of outsiders they are. By this point in the game, the player will have gotten into fights with scavs, maelstrom, raids of various corporations, and probably a bunch of the other gangs, but not the Voodoo Boys. And you get to find out why when V goes to take the job from them. When V goes to the meeting place, his contact approaches him instead of the other way around. And even then, he just tells V to go somewhere else to meet the actual issuer of the contract. Then V goes to a meat shop that serves as a front where V is subjected to a security screening before getting to finally meet Placide, the guy who's going to explain what V's job is. After a pseudo-cinematic walk through Pacifica, V has to go through yet another security screening before he gets the job. During all of this, the player can inquire about Evelyn and ask if he can speak to Brigitte, but Placide will slap down every inquiry without hesitation. This introduction does a great job subtly conveying the type of gang that the Voodoo Boys are, so does the fact that they would hire an outsider to do a job like this for them. Unfortunately, the story ends up undermining the Voodoo Boys by the end of the questline, but it was a good and well thought out introduction nonetheless. The job is to investigate the presence of the Animals Gang who recently set up in the nearby mall, specifically a van that was seen entering the mall alongside them. The mall is heavily 
heavily guarded by the Animals Gang. And no, uh, before you ask, there aren't any cool skips where you can do the mission early. The enemies and objectives just don't spawn until you talk to Placide. The mall is simply massive and there are multiple ways to enter it. You can either charge in through the front door or sneak around to the side entrance. Honestly, this location is a little bit too well realized considering how little time you spend here and how simple your objective is. The list of objectives goes as follows. Hack the van, fight Sasquatch, and find the Netrunner in the movie theater. However, the first two objectives are actually skippable if you know what you're doing. Just like the Arasaka warehouse before it, the majority of the stealth combat arena isn't utilized in this mission. This problem could be solved if the player was given a reason to visit multiple locations scattered across the mall before fighting Sasquatch. As for the fight with Sasquatch, it's kind of weird and mostly bad. She jacks into V at one point, but other than that, she's just another bullet sponge enemy who's tedious to kill. The theater area is really cool. It's playing some western movie that for some reason reminds me of the nostalgia that's often associated with the noir side of the cyberpunk genre. Upon confronting the Netrunner, who it turns out is an agent for Netwatch, the player is given a choice. Carry out the job and incapacitate him immediately, or hear what he has to say. The Netwatch runner insists that the Voodoo Boys have uploaded a virus into V's system, and that he is capable of fishing it out. If you trust the Corpo against Johnny's advice, he allows V to leave peacefully and Placid is really pissed. If you incapacitate the agent like you were told, the virus that he mentioned kicks in and incapacitates V right after causing some sort of widespread damage to Netwatch's global network. There's some ambiguity as to whether it was really the Voodoo Boys or Netwatch who flatlined V, but Placide's surprise reaction to V's return leaves me to believe that it was indeed Placide's doing. Either way, V now gets to meet Maman Brigitte, who already knows who V is and that he's carrying the biochip with Johnny's engram. Why exactly did the Voodoo Boys send V into a war zone when they already knew that he was carrying the biochip that they've been trying to get their hands on throughout the entire course of Cyberpunk's story? It appears as if Placide just wasn't let in on the scheme or something. I can't think of any other reason that he would reject V's efforts to tell him about the biochip. I'm sorry, but this whole scenario just makes the Voodoo Boys look dysfunctional and dumb. I know the main story wanted to give the player a reason to visit the mall, but in doing so it really undermined the Voodoo Boys is a serious faction. Even now, when Mam and Brigitte is here talking with V, she just lets him up and leave with the invaluable biochip that set off the events that the entire story is based around. These people fried Evelyn without remorse just because they thought that she might tip someone off about them. Why did they choose now of all times to start respecting an outsider's freedom of association? These people should either be offering V the world or holding a gun to his head at the very least, considering how much they are shown to value the property that V has inside him. But no, if the player chooses to, they can just leave. To proceed with the mission, V follows Brigitte to the location where the Voodoo Boys and V all collectively jack into the net to relive Johnny's memories that pertain to Alt Cunningham. It turns out that Johnny has been withholding information from V all this time. Alt isn't just some netrunner AI who can help V. She used to be his girlfriend back in the day. Look at you, all hot and bothered. Johnny and Alt had a complicated relationship. Despite him being a narcissistic douche canoe, she was very much attracted to Johnny's bad boy persona. In this particular memory, Alt came to tell Johnny that they were breaking up. But a bit of frontal nudity later, Alt gets captured by Arasaka and Johnny gets impaled. Proving Alt's point that Johnny is a narcissistic douche canoe, Johnny believes that Arasaka kidnapped Alt just to get to him. This of course isn't true. Arasaka just wanted Alt to develop their own version of soul killer for them. This belief prompted Johnny to request the help of Rogue and- uh, Wait, isn't that the dealer who sold V the torture BD? Seriously, are these the same people? Or has CDPR gotten even lazier with reusing character models than they were in The Witcher 3? Anyway, Johnny these two in a media storm Arasaka Tower in an attempt to rescue Alt. This plan ends up failing as Alt's body dies and her consciousness gets transferred into the net. This prompts Johnny to start a 10 year war with Arasaka that climaxes with Johnny nuking Arasaka Tower. Aside from the fact that this all should have been shown to the player much sooner, 
sooner. I am somewhat conflicted about all this new information. Alt's relationship with Johnny feels like a contrived revelation to connect various plot points that would otherwise have nothing to do with each other. The source material might reveal that this is an invalid criticism, but I wouldn't know so let's just move on. On the positive side, this revelation does give Johnny's character quite a bit of additional depth. All of this new context gives the player something to think about. Yes, we all know that corporations are two-dimensional bad guys that somehow get away with kidnapping citizens off the street, but is that really the reason that Johnny hates them so much? Does he actually oppose Arasaka because they took ult, or rather does he oppose Arasaka because he thinks that they took ult just to get at him? Johnny has an ego, a rather big one, and that ego is on full display when he repeatedly states that he truly believes that Arasaka kidnapped ult just to hurt him, some lowly rocker boy. The reality is that Arasaka took ult because they wanted her to develop soul killer for them, but Johnny's ego just can't accept that he could possibly be so inconsequential to them. He has to be the one on Arasaka's radar. He has to be the center of attention. Johnny's entire existence is dedicated to being the most important person in the room, and the realization that he might not be scares him. What I don't find nearly as interesting or believable is that this conflict between Johnny and Arasaka lasted for 10 entire years. This is simply too long of a time frame for such a heated conflict to last for. Realistically, Arasaka should have done something about Johnny much sooner. But overall, this is a really interesting revelation that elevates Johnny from an egotistical prick to an egotistical prick with depth. There is one problem with this, however, and that's the fact that Arasaka attacked Johnny when he went to speak to Rogue, which implies that Arasaka did end up caring about him after all. I really hate it when video games throw in obligatory action sequences, and this one in particular manages to really undermine the themes that the story was going for. Using this memory, the Voodoo Boys are able to pass through the Black Wall and contact Alt. This is where the player's decision whether or not to side with the Netwatch Agent kicks in. If the player chose to let the Netwatch Agent wipe the virus, it turns out that he also installed a virus of his own that forces Alt to kill all of the Voodoo Boys to protect herself. If not, the Voodoo Boys are able to make some kind of deal with Alt where she ensures their safety behind the Black Wall. I don't know, it sounds like a bunch of eclectic nonsense if we're being honest. There's a lot of exposition laid out here. But in short, Alt is not able to help V unless he breaks into Mikoshi in real life, which entails some kind of all-out assault on Arasaka HQ. This sets up the in-game events, where the player has to decide whom to ally with to save V's life. Firstly, however, when V disconnects from the net, the player will either be greeted by Mem and Brigitte or a bunch of dead bodies. If the Voodoo Boys are still alive, the player can choose to have V either kill them all as revenge for the shitty way they've been treating him or just walk away. I'm actually pretty impressed with the level of choice offered in this questline. Having three distinct options is a pretty good job complementing the concept of doing a playthrough for each life path. Shame more story missions didn't take that approach. After walking outside, V's plot fatigue kicks in once more, and he blacks out, only to wake up at a nearby hotel. Johnny took the pseudo-endotriazine and took control of V's body to bring him here. However, this hotel isn't so nearby if the player chooses to do the main missions in reverse order, Voodoo Boys before the parade. If that's the case, it was quite the journey Johnny had to take to bring V here. Either way, the scene plays out the exact same way. The player has the option to voice disapproval and skepticism about Johnny's actions and take control of V's body before following Johnny into a room where he has some dog tags from the Mexican conflict hidden away. In this scene, Johnny asks V if he would take a bullet for him like the man whose name is on the dog tags did. The player is cornered into answering yes or no, and this decision ends up having rather clever ramifications going forward. Before leaving, Johnny asks V to allow him to take control of his body one more time so that he can talk Rogue into hunting down Adam Smasher with him. This transitions into Act 3, which encompasses is a new array of side content along with the endings. I'd wager that most players don't even fully realize that this is a new act. The only thing that's changed is that the player can now meet with Hanako at Embers to usher on the endgame, or start the pseudo questline that starts with Johnny's request to talk to Rogue but spirals into an array of unrelated activities. I think that it was acceptable to gate off Rogue's mission until this point in the game, but holding off on all of the side jobs surrounding Carrie's questline and the finale to the fist fight simply goes to 
too far. All of this creates the feeling that the late game quests are really just a solid block of side content that doesn't fit in very well with the fact that the ending of the game is available. V is supposedly closer than ever to dying, yet for some reason he decides to indulge Johnny's whim to suddenly visit all of his old friends. This isn't a huge issue with rogue side jobs because they do end up unlocking separate endings, but this is a huge issue with Carrie's questline and the handful of side jobs that spring off of it. Let's kick off Act 3 with Rogue's questline. Assuming that the player chooses to indulge Johnny's request, V agrees to let Johnny take control of his body so they can talk to Rogue. After taking the pseudo-endotriazine, Johnny gains control of V's body and calmly walks over to Rogue. Nope! Johnny hammers a few drinks, tattoos V's arm, visits the strip club, does shots, takes pills, gets into a fight, causes the stripper to crash while fondling her leg, and that's just the stuff that V remembers when he wakes up the next morning. Rogue is in the room with V when he wakes up. Up, and she explains what Johnny and her talked about the night prior. Anyways, it turns out that Johnny's escapades were a little bit more than just some casual fuckery, as the stripper that Johnny was moving in on had some information about a guy called Grayson, a character that's so important to the plot that no one has bothered to even create a wiki page about him as of writing the script. So Grayson is the new MacGuffin, and the new lead is to where to find him is a ship called Ebonike that's docked in a harbor in Watson. Before that, however, V meets Rogue at the afterlife and the player is passively introduced to Wayland, a Night City legend, who briefly appeared in Act 1. Before driving over to the harbor, Rogue gives V a replica of Johnny's samurai jacket. This is a part of a full set of Johnny Silverhand clothing that the player can obtain during this mission and as part of a few gigs. Once at the harbor, Rogue tells V to follow her lead. If you instead elect to find your own way into the harbor, it completely breaks the stealth combat arena by not spawning any enemies outside of the ones on the Ebonike. What's more, Grayson doesn't spawn in the Ebonike unless you trigger the right quest progression. So yeah, this mission is pretty busted in its current state. which is. A shame because this area has a lot of verticality and thought put into it. Even if you just follow the objective marker, you'll end up missing the majority of the base. Upon uh, reading the correct email on a certain computer, Grayson spawns on the Ebonike, and when reaching a certain proximity to him, the AI automatically gets alerted and a fight ensues. You can't kill Grayson yet. After dropping his health low enough, he falls to the ground and the two start interrogating him. Kinda. On all three of my playthroughs, Rogue faced away from him a few yards away, which is bizarre. Turns out that Grayson is a dead end on Smasher, but he does say where Johnny was buried and tries to barter for his life with the promise of something of Johnny's. He also suggests that Rogue is hiding something, that she somehow sold out in order to keep Arasaka from hunting her down after they nuke the tower. Rogue runs away disappointed, and if V obtained the keycard either by killing Grayson or sparing his life, you can lower the nearby ship container and obtain Johnny's old car. Since the Smasher lead fizzled out, V decides to visit the location where Johnny was buried. What did you expect? Headstone, flag, and flowers? No, I, I don't know. A marker. Something. Anything. We'll figure something out. Better now? A bit. But let's say it was my real grave. What would you write? Here lies Johnny Silverhand. The guy who saved my life. V, you don't know how much I want that to be true. Listen, I realize I fucked up a lot of things. Either let down or used every last person who gave me their trust. Blind, selfish bastard that I was. But I've managed one thing for now. Not to fuck this up. What we have. Thematically, this is one of the best scenes in the entire game. Even if you haven't been invested in Johnny's character, the way this scene is delivered will probably still get to you. V and Johnny are bound to have been through a lot by this point, but more is surely to come. And this scene nails that theme with everything from the music to the choreography to the holographic advertisements of Night City looming in the background. This scene ends with Johnny asking V to let him take control of his body once more so that he can take Rogue to a drive-in movie just like he promised her 50 years ago.
In order to arrange the date, you first have to call Rogue, who ends up agreeing to Johnny's preposition. After driving her to the movie theater, V has to unlock a door using one of the few passcodes in the entire game. If I had to guess, I'd assume that passcodes for unlocking doors was originally meant to be a much more widespread feature, but was dialed back sometime during development. Which is a shame, because finding passcodes was always fun in the Deus Ex games. There's something that's just fulfilling about finding a key code that opens a specific door or unlocks a specific computer. The flick is some B-action movie called Bushido, but that doesn't matter, the movie isn't exactly why they're here. After taking the pseudo-endotriazine, Johnny assumes control and begins his date with Rogue, which after some reminiscing gets more sensual. Johnny, I can't. It's not right. What a load of shit. Nothing you do or say allows you to romance Rogue. None of the dialogue options do anything. Not even the option to have Johnny say that he would have fucked Carrie. Huh? It's implied that her reluctance has something to do with what Grayson said earlier, but it all just comes off as stupid melodrama in my opinion. The mission ends with Johnny randomly suggesting that him and V are to visit his old friend Carrie, who just happens to be a short drive away. Aside from the aforementioned pacing issues, Carrie's questline is pretty good. Most of it falls much more into the category of dumb fun than anything truly meaningful, but it's still a good time. Gay Tony- <coughs> <clears throat> Carrie Uridine is Johnny's best friend and a former member of Samurai. Like in the case with Rogue, I don't know what CDPR was thinking when they designed past and present Carrie's character models. Not only do they look nothing alike, but Carrie just looks better in 2077. He lost the impressively kinetic hair, but other than that, his overall design looks much less generic in the present day. So, here we go. A tale of a stoic and capable mercenary who gets employed by a charismatic and often an incompetent homosexual cosmopolitan to sort out the mess he's gotten himself into as they both struggle to stay alive in a city where they have no one to rely on but themselves. Yeah, CDPR might have plagiarized Rockstar a little bit in this instance. But if we're being honest, GTA 4's plot kind of plagiarized Snatch. So I guess it's even? Still, we shouldn't be surprised that CDPR took inspiration off of another's work. Not after the Witcher series. Yes, I'm stating that the Witcher series plagiarized Kung Fu, a story about a man who belongs to an ancient order of men who are subjected to trials throughout their youth. Trials which exceptionally few applicants make it through, yet necessary nonetheless to prepare them for their departure from the stronghold, where they embark on a life roaming through the countryside, helping peasants and nobles alike with their problems. Throughout this man's quest, he struggles through prejudice, which he is only able to overcome due to his superior capabilities, as he searches for a family member in the the vast war-torn countryside, divided by morally ambiguous racial tensions, full of magic, sorcerers, and psychic albino children. I'm just gonna state it outright. Andre Sapkowski and CDPR both owe David Carradine an apology. I mean, for fuck's sake! Both Shaolin monks and witchers can parry bolts mid-flight. They both meditate on a regular basis. They both wear a ponytail at some point. What the fuck is this? But speaking seriously, I really don't care that Carrie just so happens to resemble Gay Tony, because the Ballad of Gay Tony was great. Deus Ex Human Revolution has a lot of similarities to Robocop, and Deus Ex Mankind Divided has a hell of a lot of similarities to Half-Life 2, but neither of these facts are going to stop me from praising these games where they both succeed. Before heading up to Carrie's house, Johnny mentions that he saw somewhere that Carrie has tried to kill himself. Setting aside the fact that Johnny is trapped inside V's head and would have had to obtain this information through V's perception, the biggest issue this raises is why Johnny didn't pressure V to visit Carrie sooner if this is the case. If Carrie's life is in danger, why would Johnny elect to fuck around with Rogue before checking up on his suicidal best friend? Carrie's house is a mess, but the fact that so much of the mess had been brought from a catalog prompts Johnny to state that Carrie Carrie wouldn't have chosen the stuff himself. For the most part, Johnny disapproves of what Carrie has seemingly become. After looking around the house, he's left with the impression that Carrie sold out and changed since he knew him. Ah, beautiful butterfly Carrie emerging from his silky samurai chrysalis. 
V takes the pills that give Johnny control, and after picking up one of Carrie's guitars, Johnny plays a solo that gets Carrie out of the shower. Carrie instantly recognizes that it's Johnny just from how he plays, which comes off as a surprisingly clever and stylish way to skip over most of the drama associated with the Who are you? OMG, you're alive trope. The writers at CDPR really nailed the notion that these two are longtime friends, from the way that Carrie teases Johnny about signing with Arasaka to the way that they immediately start catching up with each other. Samurai has been left mostly in tatters, but the reports that Carrie tried to kill himself turns out to just be a marketing ploy. The conversation concludes with some broken robe physics and the two deciding to get Samurai back together for one final gig. Firstly, V has to find Nancy, the ex-keyboardist for Samurai who has since changed her name to Bess Isis, and became an investigative reporter. Upon calling up Nancy, her underpaid, underappreciated assistant will inform you that she's doing a story on Maelstrom at a club called the Totenzens? Toten Tens? And won't be back for a few days. This particular mission is extremely impressive because it plays out three different ways based on your decisions you made during the pickup mission back in Act 1. Firstly, Based on who you allied with during the pickup, either Dum Dum or Patricia will meet you at the entrance to the club. If Royce is dead and you didn't free Brick, Patricia escorts V to where Nancy is being held before a fight breaks out. If Royce is dead and you didn't fact free Brick, Brick is the new leader thanks to you. So Patricia escorts V to Brick, whom is getting interviewed by Nancy, before letting the two of them walk out without a security scan. If you allied with Royce, Dum Dum will lead V to the same location, where Nancy and Royce are talking. But unlike Brick, he won't let the two leave without a security scan. This means that the player has to choose to either fight their way out or let Nancy transfer the stolen files to V so that he can sneak the files out while she passes through security. There's one theoretical possibility that I didn't get to check, and that's if you antagonize Maelstrom during the pickup but sneak past Royce instead of killing him without tipping off Militech. Theoretically, this should result in Royce being alive but antagonistic towards you, but I have no clue CDPR accounted for that during development, and I'm not playing the game of fourth time to find out. It's also worth noting that if you allied with Royce and save Brick, the game ignores that you save Brick and keeps Royce as the leader. Overall, this is a great mission that likely represents the standard that CDPR is hoping to maintain early on during the game's development. So that's Nancy out of the way. Now time for Denny and Henry. The plan is for everyone to meet at Denny's house to reminisce about old times. However, that plan went flying out the window when Henry unloaded a cement truck into Denny's swimming pool because she broke up with him a while back. This sparks an antagonism between the two which forces V to choose which one gets to play during the reunion. A samurai fan called Drowsen replaces whoever doesn't get to attend. I like the concert section because it's pretty light on fake interactivity. It's a a linear set piece that knows that it's a linear set piece. The concert as a whole only doesn't work in the context of V's imminent death, but that can be said about every side job but Rogue's and Pan Am's questline, as they both lead to unique endings. The mission ends with Carrie giving his gun to V for some reason. S seriously, what's the deal with NPCs giving V their weapons all the time? It almost comes off as a joke after a while. Killing in the name is probably my favorite side job in the entire game. It's poorly introduced and contains no meaningful gameplay, but god damn it is the conclusion of the side job so goddamn funny that I can't help but ignore all of its flaws and praise it as the next coming of Christ. You can't truly start the side job until you complete the samurai reunion quest we just went over, which is dumb. This is because V needs to get Nancy involved for some reason. Throughout the game, V will receive texts from the Bartmos Collective, spouting off with vague communist platitudes. There is a side job to look into this organization present from the beginning of Act 2, but the player has to wait until they meet Bess Isis before they can log onto the Bartmos Collective website and see Nancy's post asking for information on Swedenborg Riviera. The Bartmos Collective is BreadTube. Whoever designed this website perfectly adapted the intelligent and thoughtful discussion that takes place on r slash breadtube into the cyberpunk setting. I have died and have been reborn while reading through these replies after reaching the end of the side job and finding out the truth about Swedenborg, the poetic and radical philosopher who has sparked a revolution in the hearts of basement-dwelling commie neats everywhere. After reading Nancy's post asking for information on Swedenborg, V will get inspired to contact her to ask her about the progress on the case. Swedenborg 
Borg appears to be an experienced netrunner who's done a pretty good job covering his tracks, which is why no one has been able to uncover his identity so far. Still, there is a signal that leads to an abandoned apartment complex in Rancho Coronado, which becomes V's first lead to find Swedenborg. Johnny takes a dismissive approach to Swedenborg. Cause this is all one big waste of time. The fuck do you care about a Borg fucking Swede? And this attitude only grows as V decrypts the router and travels to the locations of the subsequent signals. I've got a feeling someone's messing with you, V. You'll follow this breadcrumb trail and when you connect the dots, all you'll see is a dick. I'm sure you would love that, wouldn't you? Fucking A, I would. That cock would be the first thing Swedenborg did that actually made any sense. Except he'd probably give it some pretentious name. Like, patriarchal phallus upholding toxic masculinity. Fuck. Let me guess, another router? My dick theory starting to seem like a real possibility. Then they make it to the final location, and my god. Money is a tool used by the colonial oppressors of our minds. Class division is the breeding ground of anarchy. Wait, what the hell is this? What it looks like, Swedenborg Riviera. Ha! Come one, come all for the profit of Night City! Ha! Oh, that's too good! A wind-up philosopher in a box. Hand me a couple of eddies, see what he cranks out next. That's right! All of the philosophy spouted by Swedenborg was the result of a fortune-telling AI that had been modified to spout off vague Marxist platitudes that Cyberpunk's version of BreadTube uncritically ate up. I was fucking dead the first time I played through this mission. <laughs> You shall meet an attractive lobbyist when you least expect a violent outbreak of class warfare. But wait, that's not all. The player has the option to shut it off, leave it playing, or if they have a high enough intelligence stat, reprogram it to spout off even more nonsensical platitudes. Let your thoughts dance the lofty rumba while accompanied to a joyful accordion. What the? Ha! <laughs> what all his fans think? Whoever designed this side job deserves a raise. Now, you might question why no one else was able to solve the mystery of Swedenborg's identity before this, and the answer to this question is quite obvious. Bread tube neats don't have cars, and therefore were unable to make the journey necessary to follow the various signals that lead to Swedenborg's location. So, in conclusion, 10 out of 10 mission, 100% unbiased appraisal. Become the obese narwhal in heat amidst the blazing ice. Carrie's questline resumes when he calls V to ask for help with something. After waiting around for a while, Carrie arrives and picks V up in a rather shitty looking car that Carrie borrowed just for this occasion. After complimenting V's balls, Carrie explains that an Asian pop band called Us Cracks are doing a cover of his new song. This is a problem because Carrie views Us Cracks genre of music as somewhat insulting to the larger art form. His plan is to ambush and destroy a van that's carrying equipment for an Us Cracks performance. Despite being such a simple objective, I like this ambush much better than the one at Rocky Ridge because it doesn't feign interactivity nearly as much. It's a simple objective that plays out as a simple objective. Just from how Carrie is holding his gun, you can tell how out of his element he is doing all of this. Fuck yeah! Good working with you, V! Fuck me, Carrie. Meaning it's just a truck of toys for some plastic Japanese dolls. Might as well blow up a cotton candy stand. But... Still a big step forward. I hardly recognize the bastard. The character dynamic between Johnny V and Carrie really works here. Johnny may just be along for the ride, but his commentary on Carrie exiting his comfort zone is quite entertaining nonetheless. What ensues is the only police chase in the entire game. Lost him! <laughs> Paying off the ass for you! It was worth every eddy! Nice one. Truly thrilling, Carrie and V stop at a cafe to unwind after the events that just took place. The conversation they have is good, but it's unfortunate that it's possible to miss the Us Cracks music video if you choose a wrong dialogue option. Carrie obviously has strong feelings about music, but he also appears to be gradually developing similarly strong feelings for V's balls. Quite surprisingly, I found that Carrie as a romance option wasn't pushed nearly as hard on the player as the others are, other than spouting a few innuendos here and there. Up and until the final 
side job, his advances are quite tame. Which is good, because I like Carrie. Just not to the extent that I'd hand over V's balls to him. The next side job with Carrie is a direct continuation from the last one. Carrie's attempt to stop us crack from butchering his music turned out to be futile. Which means it's time for him to take a more hands-on approach. Us Cracks is doing a performance at the same club the player visited during the Lizzy Wizzy side job. As some trivia, if you advance Carrie's questline far enough while having Lizzy Wizzy's quest pending, Lizzy will send via message that Liam is out of town for a week. This is done to keep the two objectives from conflicting, I suppose. If you already found a way into the club during Lizzy's side job, this mission with Carrie will be a breeze. However, there is a new option to buy overpriced tickets from a scalper that wasn't there during Lizzy's quest. The Us Cracks members are initially ecstatic to see Carrie, but their excitement turns into horror when he whips out his gun and points it at them in a somehow even stupider looking pose than before. I, I don't know, I think it's the jacket. The girls end up explaining that it was Carrie's manager who fucked him over by arranging the partnership between Us Cracks and a solo thing. This is where the player can choose to guide Carrie's hand towards working with Us Cracks or telling them to cancel the show. Before I move on, I just wanted to say that the developers had absolutely no plan when it came to how Carrie was supposed to depart from this mission. He just walks like 10 yards away and then just stands still. The next side job with Carrie is heavily impacted by the choice you pushed him into making in regards to Us Cracks. V meets up with Carrie at the same location either way, but it's a hell of a lot more lively if he agreed to partner with Us Cracks. Both scenarios find a way to shoehorn in a meeting with a merchant named Spectre for some reason. I really don't know why. While this is the mission where you can start the romance with Carrie, it doesn't feel nearly as suggestive as some of the moments in Pan Am's loyalty quests, or nearly as intimate as the dinner with River's family. This scene plays perfectly fine as two friends just hanging out on a roof, and I think that most players will end up appreciating that. If you chose to nudge Carrie into partnering with Us Cracks, Blue Moon, one of its members, calls V to ask him to help her out with some death threats that she's been receiving recently. Her plan is to roam around this very nicely detailed location in Watson while V watches out for anyone who might want to cause her harm. This area has a great deal of verticality that makes this process actually somewhat engaging the first time you play through it. The culprit turns out to be a stalker whom was initially portrayed as a red herring, and after non-lethally dealing with her, Blue Moon thanks V and phases out of existence. Very cool side job. Carrie's final mission comes dangerously close to feeling like the dinner with River's family without quite crossing that line. Overall, I'd put it about the same tier as Judy's finale when it comes to unintended awkwardness. Carrie invites V to an evening on a voice-controlled yacht. Carrie does have a few lines that stick out as implying that V and him are in some kind of relationship, but the atmosphere is still mostly left up for interpretation. Overall, this mission is by far the weakest one of Carrie's loyalty missions, but its brevity and simplicity lends itself to calmly ending as quest line in a way that the others didn't. At the end of the voyage, Carrie reveals that the yacht belongs to his manager whom set him up with us cracks behind his back, and the two proceed to start causing chaos. This is where you can fuck Carrie if you're a sodom- Boat explodes the end. Before moving on, I want to briefly reflect on the romances in Cyberpunk 2077. I'm not a fan of romances in video games because they usually come off as cheap and overly transactional, but setting my disposition aside, it's clear that Cyberpunk's romance paths have bigger issues than a standard in most AAA games. One of these issues should already be obvious, and that's the fact that romance missions play out far too romantically even if the player chooses not to or is unable to romance the subject. This feels like a result of rush development where originally there were meant to be deviations based on your choice to pursue a romance earlier on, and if a romance was even possible given the subject's sexual preferences. This leads into another big issue. The average player doesn't really have a choice when it comes to romances despite there being four options. If you're a male V, you can choose Pan Am and Carrie, and if you're a female V, you can choose River and Judy. But in reality, most players, being heterosexual males, will choose either Judy or Pan Am based on the sex of their V and call it a day. This combined with the fact that most players will play as a male V results in the popular opinion that Pan Am is the best romance option for the lone reason that she's the only one who will let V fuck her and whom the player wants to fuck. Pan Am, despite her work sharing, is my least favorite of these characters. Her arc and the story surrounding her are boring and incomplete. My point in saying all of this is to convey that romance options in Cyberpunk aren't really options. They might be optional, but beyond that there aren't any interesting choices to make. It pretty much amounts to 
do you want to fuck the one person available? And being perfectly honest, despite liking both River and Carrie as characters, I don't like any of these four as romance options for one reason or another. Though, to be fair, I hated both Triss and Yennefer, especially Yennefer. So, Romance in The Witcher 3 was about as pointless as it is in Cyberpunk for me. Well, it wasn't entirely pointless. I enjoyed crushing Yen's spirits during both of my playthroughs of The Witcher 3. Take that for fucking the sorcerer behind Geralt's back, you bitch. If I had to rank the quality of the quest lines for each romance path, it would go as follows. River, Carrie, Judy, the various whores, and Pen Am. Feel free to disagree with me. I'm just not sure that I care enough to argue about video game romances for more than a paragraph. The last side jobs in Cyberpunk 2077 that we need to go over are the collection of fistfights. I decided to hold off discussing these until the end for two reasons. To unlock the final fight, you first have to do the Voodoo Boys questline for some reason. I understand that the two share a location, but they could have just put it on hold like Lizzie's quest. Secondly, in their current state they are horribly unbalanced, which means that most players will likely wait as late into the game as possible before doing them to ensure that they outlevel all of the opponents. CDPR is seemingly tried to patch the difficulty issues between my first and third playthroughs, but as of writing this script, they're still completely broken. Roughly as broken as the races, if we're being honest. The difference is that the races are broken because the bad AI combined with the rubber banding makes them boring, and the fights are broken because they're unfair and too difficult. Feel free to comment get good or some shit like that, it'll help with the algorithm, but the way that fighters can damage you without sufficient warning or animations that don't properly connect just make these fights feel really awful. And when this fact is combined with the massive opponent health bars, terrible melee mechanics, and V having drastically lower health, yeah, mechanically these are worse than the races. And by the way, this is all after using an exploit to sneak a weapon into the fight to make them easier. I couldn't imagine the horrors that would be doing these fights without a weapon. However, there is a positive side to the series of activities, and that's the writing. Most fighters feel surprisingly well realized for how inconsequential of a side activity this would typically be. The first fight, with the twins, is unique because you're up against two brothers who are actually just one fighter because they had their brains merged or something. Neat idea. El Caesar has a pregnant wife, whom he's trying to make money to support, so he puts his car and some cash on the fight. Uh, upon beating him, you can choose to let him keep the car, the money, or even both. If you decide to be charitable, he'll even send V a picture of the baby when it's born. Sixth Street and the Animals Challenger are rather unremarkable, other than the fact that you can kill all the other animals at the gym because it doubles as a gig location. Kinda funny. There's an optional fight that's unrelated to the tournament where you get to fight Azob, the grenade nose clown. I couldn't pull this off myself, but you can actually punch Azob in the nose to trigger the grenade to go off. This is a neat detail, but once again, I'm kind of disappointed that this was a limit of CDPR's creativity when it came to a clown with a grenade for a nose. Maybe in a future update, they'll make Azob an optional companion. CDPR better watch this video, I swear. The final fight is really well done outside of the awful mechanics of the actual fight. All of the former contenders show up, except for Six Straight, because they attacked you. You can sit down and talk to your opponent before you fight him, and there's an optional side objective to take a fall for Coach Freed. This interaction also leads to a conversation with a child who gives a sob story about her father getting hurt by V's opponent. Overall, despite the fight itself being terrible, the events surrounding the fight are surprisingly well realized. Victor, being a former boxer, shows up and gives V some tips. This is the only side job other than the tarot card thing and paying V's debt that Vic has anything to do with, which makes his character feel really underutilized. The various characters' reactions will differ based on whether you win or lose the fight. Coach Freed reacts differently based on whether or not you had V tell him that he would throw the fight, and talking to the little girl on the way out reveals that her story was fake and she was just probing V's intentions. Even though I failed countless fights across both of my playthroughs by no fault of my own, I can't bring myself to fully hate these missions because of how well realized the atmosphere surrounding the fights are. So that's it. We've gone through every single side job and non-ending story mission that Cyberpunk has to offer. I hope that doing this has thoroughly outlined the issues with CDPR's approach to quest design this time around. Namely, that there just aren't as many quests and the ones that are there just aren't all that substantial, and quite often fail to embrace the authentic nature of the quest in The Witcher 3. For example, take a look at A Day in the Life, that side job where V helps that random shop vendor. The job itself is fine, but it's just so goddamn short and trivial that it fail 
failed to make an impression on me. In fact, it actually managed the exact opposite effect. I distinctly remember the side job for being such a bizarre waste of potential. The same could be said about the Zen Master, Azab, Sex on Wheels, and countless other side jobs that just feel half-assed, especially compared to the standard set by The Witcher 3. Jobs like the roller coaster ride in Pacifica and Jackie's Ofrenda are examples of slightly more substantial side jobs, but there's still far too few of these to make the world feel truly well realized. There are a few examples where Cyberpunk's quest design does embody authentic elements, however. The conversations with Gary and the quest with V's neighbor are both examples of moments where Cyberpunk's quest design manages to make small pockets of the world feel a bit more alive. However, in my opinion, the best example of the game succeeding in this was with how the hunt and dinner with River's family breathed life into the trailer park where River's sister lives. Without the context provided by these quests, this location would be meaningless. But during these scripted sequences, this location feels like a real place with real people who inhabit it. On several occasions, a main story also made an attempt to recapture the authentic nature of the quest design that CDPR is known for, mainly with the Avocados quest lines. Those quests tried to get the player to interact with open world locations as if they were real places, and while I respect the attempt, those quests were absolutely dreadful. There was also an attempt made with Kampeki Plaza, when V and Jackie visited it to steal the relic. The big issue with this was that the story mission doesn't actually allow the player to interact with this location as if it were an open world location. The entire sequence of events surrounding the heist is far too linear and scripted. Compare this to any big moment in The Witcher 3 and you'll realize that that game gave the player much more open world autonomy when it came to its quest design. People were right to complain about the dull nature of those investigation sequences in The Witcher 3, but at least they were open world interactions that made the world feel more real at times. Cyberpunk's quest design almost completely removed that element of the gameplay, and I think that the feeling of interactivity with the open world ended up suffering for it. Far too much of Cyberpunk's quest design fails to embrace the open nature of the game's open world in any meaningful way, and this problem is present in most but not all of Cyberpunk's ending sequences as well. So far, we've gone over every aspect of Cyberpunk 2077 except for the endings. At this point, I'd wager that most players will likely feel pretty detached from the main story due to how it's been structured. If you found Alt after doing the parade sequence, V's conversation with Hanako might feel like an ancient memory by this point. Likewise, if you found Alt early then did all of Takemura's objectives, you might have forgotten who Alt is or what she can even do to help you. And all of this is naturally made even worse if you've been doing a lot of side content. When V goes to Embers to meet with Hanako, his plot fatigue starts acting up more than ever before. While this could have been played as stress-related due to the fact that V is essentially walking into the belly of the beast right now, it's suggested that this is a result of his time running out instead. All of the plot fatigue sections feel off because they trigger around specific story moments, but this one manages to feel even worse due to the fact that the player was likely carefreely wrapping up hours worth of side content just a few minutes ago without any notion that V was on death's door. This is where the game tries to lampshade why Arasaka didn't investigate Saburu's death more vigorously. And the answer to this is, drumroll please, They just didn't care. I'm not kidding. Hanako says that she and all of the Arasaka board members knew from the start, and the only reason that she didn't do anything was because she cared about her brother. This is the weakest possible explanation as to why one of the most powerful corporations in the world didn't care when its leader was murdered. Hanako lampshades the shitty explanation further, saying, I do not expect you to understand. You're goddamn right I don't understand. This explanation doesn't make any fucking sense. Just imagine Imagine how weak and pathetic the Corleone family would have looked if they didn't send Michael to kill Salazzo after the hit on the Godfather. Same principle. Hanako's plan is for V to testify before the board of the Arasaka Corporation in exchange for their help in removing the relic. Despite having such a shitty explanation for why Arasaka didn't investigate the murder of Saburo, Hanako herself isn't a bad character. What makes her interesting is that she's one of the few prominent characters in Cyberpunk who doesn't have grand ambitions. She accepts her place in life and refuses to step on other people's toes for personal gain. At least this is how she is meant to come off during this point in the story. There's a deliberate ambiguity as to whether all of this is just part of some power grab or if she really wants people to know the truth about what happened. Upon leaving, V's plot fatigue worsens even further, and Johnny is forced to take control of V's body to take him to Vic's clinic. I really hate this part of the ending because it comes off as redundant and you can't skip it. This whole cutscene is pretty much just a rerun of the cutscene that played back when V first learned that he was going to die. 
and it's completely unnecessary. Please just move on with the endings. Before following Misty up to the roof, V picks up a gun and the last of the two pills. And the player also has the option to have V ask Vic who won the fight. Say, who won the bout? Oh, so you heard that. Did he get up? Walsh, was it? Nope, he never does. Meaning? It's a rerun. One I'd like to go back to. Why'd you get so mad then? If you already knew who won. Oh no, really. I guess I like to think about where Walsh might have tripped up. Any theories? Entering the ring against a stronger opponent, but feels a little strange to call that a mistake. This is obviously meant to be a metaphor for V's hopeless situation. Things are dire, and if the player was hoping for a happy ending, then maybe they should have played a different game. Misty leads V to a place on the roof where she used to spend time with Jackie. After she leaves, V talks with Johnny about their options. The view from this location combined with the time of day creates a perfect backdrop for the difficult decision that's about to take place. It's at this point when the player can call anyone that they happen to be in a romantic relationship with before making the big choice. There is another option, you know. What? We put all this, the pills, everything, to bed. If we don't try something, anything, we're both doomed. I know. Exactly why we'll do one last thing. Okay. Lost me. Realize the shit we've been through to get this far. Sure do. To let it all go now. Why? Cleanest. Least bloody option. We try anything else, people will die. People die. It's the way of things. Am I worth their sacrifice? Are you? Besides... It's the only way we'll both be aware. Of what? Death? Mm -hmm. The moment life escapes. Hmm. Never really gave it a thought. Funny how you still manage to surprise me sometimes. Might be something I learned from you. V, you sure about this? As long as you got nothing against it. Not how I'd have done it. But that's alright. Just like that. No pushback. Huh. Might have learned a little something from you, too. Is it time? You know, it really is beautiful. Been nice working with you, V. Yeah. With you too, Johnny. I'd wager that a decent amount of players will select this option just to see what happens. And what can I say, it got to me. As inconsistent and often straight up bad as Cyberpunk's main story missions have been at times, I'd be lying if I were to say that I felt nothing while watching the cinematic for the first time. If there was ever an argument for Cyberpunk switching to a 100% first person perspective, this was it. That feeling when the camera finally switches to third person just as you give up control over V's life. This moment can be made much worse 
worse by whatever dumb clothing V happens to be wearing at the time, but overall, this ending is well realized. Even if it does have one key flaw we'll get back to later. As the credits roll, V's voicemail receives a series of calls from the various people he met throughout the course of Cyberpunk's story. However, this particular ending's calls does have a few issues that are worth mentioning. Even if the player chooses not to do any of the avocado side jobs, Pan Am will call V and tell him that she's hoping he's burning in hell. This call is exactly the same regardless if V hardly knows her or is her boyfriend, which is just strange. Judy's reaction can also be somewhat off. If V fucked her over during the clouds thing, she blocks his number, yet during the suicide ending she still calls him up tears and all. Most of the other calls are fine, but those two stuck out as wrong. Cyberpunk's other endings are nowhere near as straightforward. V needs to get to Mikoshi, the sole prison under Arasaka Tower where Johnny's construct can be removed from his body, which will theoretically save his life. There are four ways that V can reach Mikoshi. Going along with Hanako's plan and hoping she comes through on her end, letting Johnny take over V's body so they can ask Rogue for help, suppressing Johnny and soliciting the help of the avocados to break into Mikoshi, and finally there's a secret ending where V assaults Arasaka Tower all by himself. It's only after this when the player makes a decision that results in one of four different epilogues. However, this visualization doesn't tell the whole story, as not every epilogue can be gotten through every route to Mikoshi. This is a much more informative, yet admittedly much more convoluted, visualization of Cyberpunk's endings. While Hanako's ending along with the suicide ending are available to the player by default, all three of Alt's endings require the player to have completed certain side content to be available. The split between Hanako ending and alt endings introduces a big problem. No matter which ending you choose, at least one of the narrative threads introduced in Act 2 will feel incomplete. If you side with Hanako, the entirety of the search for alt suddenly feels rather pointless in hindsight. Likewise, if you choose one of alt's endings. All of Takemura's missions that concluded with the meeting with Hanako suddenly feel like a big waste of time. This isn't an easy issue to fix. I'd personally suggest making Hanako's endings only dependent on completing Takemura's missions, and all of alt's endings only dependent on completing the missions related to those goals, but this of course would result in Cyberpunk having an even shorter runtime than it already does, despite having the exact same amount of content, which would likely be off the table for CDPR's higher management. Due to the complicated nature of how these endings are structured, I will first go over Hanako's ending in its entirety before going over all three of the separate ways V can reach Mikoshi with alt. After that, I will discuss all the different ways that Mikoshi can play out, before discussing the three different epilogues that result from the player's decision in Mikoshi combined with who he chose to ally with to get alt into Mikoshi. For the record, I want to state that despite their flaws, I like these endings a lot. In fact, I've never seen a more mediocre story get elevated so highly by the strength of its accumulation endings. So, without further ado, let's finish Cyberpunk 2077. Going along with Hanako's plan feels best suited for the Corpo life path, but it's a solid ending regardless. Johnny is upset that V would side with the Corpos, but in the end he accepts it and lets V take the Omega blockers, which once again make his word from that one plot fatigue sequence feel out of place. V calls Hanako, whose profile picture looks uncannily similar to an autistic Swedish teenage girl for some reason. She informs V that Yorinobu is suspicious of her and has since moved her to his residence in North Oak. The plan is for her people to pick V up at Misty's Esoterica so that they can free her from her pseudo-captivity. While waiting, V can pet a cat and get his fortune read by Misty. On this particular ending, the tarot card seemed to warn that V is losing control. Despite there being no line of sight between Misty and the Arasaka limo that pulls up, Misty reacts with shock and horror to the revelation that V is sided with Arasaka. This is where your choices during the parade mission first come into play. If you save Takemura, he shows up along with Hellman. I am honestly astonished at just how different this mission feels with and without Takemura's presence. It's not like he just has a brief cameo. He's present for a considerable amount of time if you chose to save him. What comes next is a pretty good stealth combat arena at the Arasaka estate. The front yard is mostly pointless, but the structure itself is well designed and has a lot of destructible glass that's otherwise underutilized in Cyberpunk's environments. My only real complaint is you can't quick save during this entire section, which is annoying. After neutral 
neutralizing the guards, Hanako and V enter the AV where Helmut and maybe Takemura are waiting. This ride is rather reminiscent of the ride that V took during the Corpo Life Path intro, which further solidifies the sense that this is the Corpo ending. Every single time I played through this mission, the AV just clipped right through the closed door into the landing bay, which is admittedly amusing. V's plot fatigue kicks in once again when exiting the AV, but if Takemura is present, he offers to help V stand up, which is a sharp contrast to the cold indifference that both Hanako and Hellman show towards V's suffering in his absence. While following Hanako, the player might recognize that the decor of Arasaka Tower looks quite similar to how it did during the flashback when Johnny blew it up. The feeling of deja vu might hit its peak when Hanako leads V into the room with Saburo's signature desk, which she explains is one of the many exact replicas that Saburo had made for every Arasaka branch. The point of slowly walking the player through this area is to get them thinking about how impressive it was that they were able to replicate the previously demolished Arasaka Tower with such an attention to detail. It might very well get the player wondering what else Arasaka is capable of resurrecting from the dead. A private elevator takes V, Hanako, and Hellman down to Mikoshi, deep underneath Arasaka Tower, where the foreshadowed reveal finally takes place. <laughs> Up until this point, the player would have been justified in viewing Saburo as a pathetic waste of a character who was killed off for cheap shock value, but this revelation recontextualizes everything. Of course Saburo Arasaka, one of the most powerful men in the world, would be smart enough to have a contingency plan in the case of his demise. This is a genuinely great twist that equal part serves as an interesting application of pre-existing sci-fi rules and makes Saburo a much, much more interesting character. It's also at this point when the player can elect to talk to Jackie's ingram if they chose to send him back to Vic's clinic. Once again, I don't think that the game benefits from gating off either this interaction or the ofrenda from the player. I'm all for choices having consequences, but these consequences feel artificial. Also, is there a reason that Jackie isn't a hologram like Saburo, or is it just a bug? Next, V and Hanako meet up with Takemura and Oda if either of them are still alive. Takemura is very surprised to hear that Saburo made an ingram of himself without telling him. The meeting plays out as one might expect. Regardless of Takemura or Oda's presence, V testifies, the board refuses to believe it, then Hanako shows them Saburo's ingram who tells them to listen to Hanako. All of this does make me question if V's presence here was really all that necessary. I can see the argument that it's better to play it safe than sorry and have the eyewitness testify anyways, but in the end, V's testimony just doesn't seem to be all that important when compared to the revelation that Saburo was alive in some form. Next, a firefight breaks out, which leads V and possibly Takemura to fight their way through Arasaka Tower to get to where Yorinobu's hold up. If Takemura is present, he'll ask you if you want to go stealth or loud for the ensuing stealth combat arena, but in my experience, the stealth option doesn't work, and the soldiers just end up charging forth anyways. Still, this section does benefit from the fact that it can play out as either a raid with Takemura's men or V just fighting his way through Yorinobu's goons alone. This section transitions into an arena fight with Adam Smasher, with Takemura at your side if he's still with you. This serves as the final boss fight of the game, and it's not all that good in my opinion. The only times that I found this fight fun were the playthroughs where I darted around the destructible cover around the center of the arena, peeking out to shoot Smasher with my shotgun every once in a while. This is a unique instance where the destruction mechanics are actually used in a gameplay sense, and it's pretty cool. I wish the game did this more often. However, if you choose to fight him and his minions from a distance, this fight is pretty boring. He's pretty much just another bullet sponge cyber psycho with a few tricks up his sleeve. After defeating Smasher, the player can choose whether or not they want to finish him off. This decision has no meaningful impact. You can't even tell Johnny about it when you talk to him in Mikoshi a bit later. It's not even seen as the slightest bit controversial by anyone. All in all, Smasher is a two-dimensional cartoon villain who's death manages to be just as cheap as his life. Takemura, if present, stays behind while V goes on to confront Yorinobu, who is kneeling before a giant screen that says things. Yeah, this whole part of the ending is entirely incoherent. Yorinobu apparently did something that will kill a bunch of people, but I honestly have no idea what he actually did. 
avoid it. You've lost. It is they who have lost. Kyoto. Dubai. Paris. These people had a chance today, but they lost it. A chance? A chance for what? To forget their fear. This is how you want to help people. Forget their fear. By killing them. Sorry. Just don't get it. I don't get it either. What the fuck is going on? What did Yorinobu try to do? Did I miss some dialogue somewhere that explains everything? Is there some hidden shard that reveals Yorinobu's true motivations? Uh, apparently not. Yorinobu goes on to say a bunch more incoherent nonsense that I can only assume that some writer at CDPR thought sounded deep. 50 years ago, terrorists blew this building into smoke. Yeah, so I heard. And? What did it give us? Not much. Nothing. But I learned a lesson. If planting bombs not enough, what can you do? You become bomb. I'd like to say that this issue is isolated to this one portion of this particular ending, but in actuality, its pure bullshittery retroactively harms the rest of the story. Yorinobu is an entirely pointless character. He doesn't like his dad or the legacy he had built, so he does everything in his power to tear it down. But why? For Yorinobu to be an interesting character, we need insight into why he believes what he believes. And we simply never get that. After V boards the elevator with Hellman, the game cuts to Mikoshi. Mikoshi during the Hanako ending is much more streamlined than it is when the player visits it with Alt. Johnny essentially just tells V that he betrayed himself, and the player can respond with a bunch of equally meaningless dialogue options. Johnny isn't upset that he's going to die again, he's more so upset that V chose to work with Arasaka instead of going down swinging. After Johnny's construct is removed, V wakes up in a strange facility sometime in the near future. This skip forward in time to a mysterious location directly benefits the atmosphere that the game is going for. In addition to losing Johnny, V has also lost a part of himself during the procedure, so the lack of initial context will help the player experience the same thing that V is going through right now. This shader that distorts various colors also increases the sense of unease, and helps communicate the general disconnect that V is experiencing with reality itself. The staff here are cold and apathetic to V's troubles. They even refuse to help him up when he falls out of his chair. After falling asleep, V has a dream where he opens the door to his room and steps out into space, where he just drifts briefly, with no connection to anything before waking up to the sound of the TV. The TV reporter communicates the revelation that Saburo Arasaka's engram has been copied over to the body of his son, a rather cold and devious act that once again better defines Saburo's character while applying the established sci-fi concepts in interesting ways. Professor Kusama comes in and makes V run through a series of tests. I'm pretty sure what answers you give to these questions doesn't actually matter, but the effects they'll have on players the first time around will be the same regardless. After falling and blacking out during the treadmill test, V has a dream where Jackie places the shard of Johnny's construct into his head. V wakes up to the TV once again, which this time conveys the heightened social tensions that Saburo's resurrection had caused. Once again, this program is interrupted when Kusama walks into V's room to perform another round of tests, which once again ends with V falling on the treadmill. Unlike the previous time, however, V doesn't black out, and instead gets his communications unlocked, allowing V to call various people down on Earth. These calls do little to alleviate the madness that V is going through right now, as each contact ends up blowing V off for one reason or another, only deepening his loneliness and isolation. At some point, the player might genuinely start questioning if this section is going on forever, if there is any escape from this prison V has found himself in. The next night, V has a nightmare where he breaks open the Rubik's Cube and reveals the Devil Tarot, before waking up to yet another broadcast. The tests start playing out as a montage this time, which is probably for the best, because the feeling of madness has likely already been conveyed by this point, and too much more will just come off as redundant. During this montage, the player can choose to refuse to cooperate with the test and instead throw the Rubik's Cube in trash room, either cooperating with the test 
Kaiso throwing a fit will lead to the same scene where Helmin or Takemura show up sometime later and convey the bad news to V. The procedure didn't work. V will be dead before winter. It turns out that the effect that the biochip had on V's DNA is killing him like radiation poisoning, which is a decent enough explanation, I suppose. This encounter feels very different based on whether it's Takemura or Helmin telling V all of this. Helmin comes across as if he's just doing his job, while Takemura comes off as a friend who has V's best interest in mind. Either way, the player gets to choose whether they want V to relinquish his freedom and become just another ingram in Mikoshi, or have him simply leave and return to Earth to live out the remainder of his days free. Don't want to die. A good choice. The Engram station is ready for you. We should not wait for your condition to worsen. Despite possibly being V's best chance of survival out of all the possible outcomes, this ending is definitely the most depressing. One major criticism I have to mention is that the ending calls that play as the credits roll don't acknowledge a player's decision. They all just act as if V is still in space. The other choice comes off as bittersweet. V is giving up his last chance at life in exchange for life, real life, not as Arasaka's property. Made my decision. Going back to Worth. Going home. You will die, dear. You're all right, Takamura. I like you. Thanks for coming all the way up here to help. But one thing you never understood, and never will. What is that? Got no idea how sweet it is to be free. You speak out of bitterness. Please reconsider. No. This here's goodbye.
This ending isn't in and of itself bad, but it does feel somewhat incomplete in comparison to the old endings where V has six months to live. It's not clear what V does after this point. All we know is that he goes back down to Earth. The calls are the same as they are when you make the other choice, with the one exception that Hanako calls and offers V work for Arasaka. Overall, this ending sequence is quite good. It wraps up quite a few plot elements quite nicely, some others not so nicely, and despite coming off as something of a downer, it conveys what it wants to convey very effectively. All three of Alt's ending sequences require participation in specific side content to become available, which makes sense for Rogues and the Avocados ending sequences, but not so much for the secret ending. Similar to Hanako's ending, V's goal is to reach Mikoshi and use Alt to sever the connection between himself and Johnny. The first and most straightforward way to get to Mikoshi is by employing the help of Rogue. If the player completed Rogue's questline, they can have V take the pseudo endotrizine to give Johnny control so they can ask Rogue for help in reaching Mikoshi. I'm not sure why Johnny has to be the one to ask Rogue for help. It seems like she'd be just as willing to help out V knowing that doing so would help out Johnny, but whatever. After a stylish transition into the afterlife, Johnny meets with Rogue and tries to guilt trip her into helping him by pressuring her about her selling out to the corpos. This is where the game tries to justify all that drama with Grayson and why Rogue wouldn't go all the way with Johnny, but it just doesn't work all that well in my opinion. Rogue is shown to be someone who is clever enough to have earned her station in life, so it just comes off as unnecessary drama to interject that she took shortcuts to reach where she is now. Anyway, she ends up agreeing to help Johnny, which ends with a kiss that transitions to Johnny lying down, presumably resting. Fucking Christ. <laughs> every time. Every time. This phase of the ending has its fair share of personality, but it does feel a little grating on subsequent playthroughs. Waylon seems like he has potential to be a fun character. It's a shame he wasn't used more in Cyberpunk Story. Rogue gives Johnny a pair of anti-gravity boots that are able to completely eliminate any and all fall damage. I am frankly baffled that CDPR thought it was acceptable to introduce a fully functional pair of long fall boots in one of the epilogues without making them available in the main game. With all the verticality in Night City, it would have been an incredible addition addition to the gameplay to be able to survive a fall from any height. The plan of attack is for the gang to infiltrate Arasaka Tower from the top and fight their way down to Mikoshi. Before they can act, however, Johnny needs to hop into Nyx's Netrunner chair to contact Ult one more time to receive a program that will allow him to establish a link that will allow Ult to get into Mikoshi. It's also here where Ult explains that her plan is to take all of Mikoshi's AI constructs and integrate them with her programming, for some reason. All that's left to do now is to board the AV and take off towards Arasaka Tower. Rogue's AV reaches Arasaka Tower much less gracefully than Hanako's, however, as a rocket hits them and forces Wayland to crash the AV into the same interior jungle where the board meeting took place during Hanako's ending. This location now serves as a stealth combat arena where the player can hunt Arasaka goons from the shadows, a really different dynamic that puts the shrubbery to good use. It's at this point where the player will receive the optional objective to save Wayland. Not doing so will cause Wayland to die and piss off Rogue. The the next area is the same place that V previously had to fight his way up, but this time Johnny Rogue and possibly Waylon use her anti-gravity boots to ascend it instead. After hacking into some terminal, Alt takes over the facility and kills the remaining enemies, except for Adam Smasher, who once again serves as the final boss fight before reaching Mikoshi. Adam Smasher impales Rogue, but she is able to detonate a grenade at point blank range, which severely wounds Smasher. This fight plays out very similarly despite taking place in a different arena. Instead of those cool destructible walls, there are these hackable pillars in the center of the arena that I never found a use for. After the fight, Johnny can pick up Rogue's gun before walking towards Mikoshi alongside Wayland if he's still alive. After jacking into Mikoshi, Johnny experiences a dream where he goes to the roof where V made his decision before examining the bullet that V was shot with. And that's it. The player just made it to Mikoshi. But before moving on, we need to go over the other ways that the player could have made it to this point.
Like Hanukkah's ending, Pan Am's ending starts with V calling her after taking the Omega blockers, and continues with V meeting Misty in the alley before she offers to read his future with the tarot cards once again. This time around, they are still rather vague but much more hopeful. Pan Am enters Misty's esoterica the same way as Takemura and Hellman did, and V rides off with her to the new avocados camp that he helped them establish. A while after arriving, Mitch wakes up V, possibly while utilizing that cloaking cyberware that the avocado ripper doc mentioned during that optional interaction. I'm kidding, by the way, this is obviously a bug. When V shows up to the meeting with Saul and Pan Am, they have already formulated a plan of attack without him. It would have been silly for the game to break from convention now and suddenly involve the player in the plan of attack, but it still feels strange that V always just so happens to be the last person who has a say in the events that involve him. The writing between Saul and Pan Am has somehow managed to deteriorate even further. At this point, they're just bickering for the sake of bickering without the slightest pretense that there's anything they actually disagree about. V checks out the Basilisk before heading over to Dakota to use her net running equipment to contact Ult. Dakota is the fixer for the Badlands, but those who haven't been doing her gigs probably wouldn't have remembered that. Since it's V contacting Ult this time, she passes judgment on V's decision to cut Johnny off during this section, which honestly comes off as a contrived way for the writers to paint this ending as some sort of a trade-off. In my opinion, this entire conversation is just eclectic techno babble that's trying to sound more clever than it actually is, but whatever, let's just move on. When V comes back to reality, Dakota's tech is in shambles with sparks flying everywhere and such. This combined with her reaction to the shard that Alt uploaded the virus to really does a good job at selling that whatever is on that shard is some truly dangerous stuff. V's next prerogative is to meet with Saul, even if the objective marker didn't get the memo. Despite my criticisms of how the avocados are generally written, this exchange does a good job selling the spirit of camaraderie that the avocados are meant to represent. The same goes with all the optional interactions that can play out after Saul gives V the avocados jacket. All of these people just come off as happy in a way that nobody in Night City ever did. Sure, there were some bittersweet moments when the clouds parted to show the sun, but since Jackie's passing, the feeling of loneliness never truly went away. Until now. The avocados might be a bunch of incompetent, silly, poorly written fools. But now, they're V's incompetent, silly, poorly written fools. He finally found a bunch of people who are in it with him just like Jackie was. And because of how successfully that theme is communicated, I can't bring myself to hate this ending nearly as much as I hated the rest of the avocado storyline. At this point, a few optional interactions open up before V meets with Pan Am. Firstly, there's an interaction with Jake if you saved his life during the side job where he picked up his kidney. I like that this interaction is included, but it's completely broken as of replaying this ending. There's a conversation with Saul that tries to add more world building to nomad politics, and while better than what came before, it still feels a bit off. However, I will praise how it's delivered through an optional brief conversation, not dissimilar to NPC interactions in the Deus Ex games. You can also take the Basilisk for a spin, where you get to destroy some abandoned in shacks, before talking with Mitch about some more nomad politics. Saul's goal with the raid on Arasaka is to profit from the endeavor, yet if something goes wrong, he feels confident that the avocados will blame Pan Am for everything. This is an alright attempt at giving Saul's character some depth, but it still seems like even if Pan Am took all of the blame, the damage done to the avocados from the failed raid would be immense, so his plan seems really short-sighted. There's also a bottle shooting challenge with Cassidy where you can win his revolver, which happens to be shit. Still, it's a nice interaction regardless. Overall, this part of the ending has a lot of nice details and interactions. There's also a weird meditation session, some technicians working on the drone that's going to be used during tomorrow's raid, and a conversation with a guy named Bruce, who I believe is only present if V saved him during a gig. Dakota even stuck around to give out some free weapons to help out the cause. And there are quite a few other conversations between various NPCs that just make the camp feel more alive. Dare I say, the Avocados camp comes off as a well-realized setting during this part of the ending. The way that all of these optional interactions are scattered about actually reminds me of the fancy parties from The Witcher 3, which were some of the best examples of when the game utilized authentic elements to make a location in the open world feel truly alive. However, it is worth noting that the Avocados camp does happen to have a lot of jank. Character models clipping is quite prevalent, and trying to do something with Teddy here teleports V over to where Carol is sitting for some reason. On my first playthrough, these interactions actions work just fine, but one of the patches seemingly broke them. Sitting next to Pan Am and talking to her ends intimately or less intimately based on whether or not V is in a relationship with her.
The game then transitions to the next day where the gang is almost ready to move on the raid. Before the assault, the player is given access to a drone that lays out the various points of interest in a surprisingly coherent manner. The assault itself is surprisingly good. Like, in hindsight, it's actually quite shocking how much this sequence feels like an actual assault. I mean, this is cyberpunk. Why isn't this raid some broken, clunky mess? Like, seriously, it's an alright set piece. Gameplay is split up into basilisk and on-foot shooting sections as the avocado as assault on the mining shaft commences. This is a really good combat section. With a diverse range of enemy attack patterns that actually feel uniquely fun to engage with. This section ends with a loading screen disguised as a conversation with Pan Am, reflecting on the scripted deaths of Bob and Teddy, in addition to whether or not they can really trust Alt. Upon arriving at the drill that will allow them to infiltrate the area beneath Arasaka Tower, Mitch heads back with the Basilisk to help the Avocados. He does this alone, which is extremely dangerous because the Basilisk requires two mines to be jacked into it. Activating the drill breaches Arasaka's underground facility, and for some reason there's a horde of robots just marching back and forth down here that are really easy to avoid. One decent stealth combat arena later, and Alt has control over the facility. She warns that the party is being pursued, and what do you know? Adam Smasher smashes his way in and brutally executes Saul in front of V and Pan Am's eyes. The fight plays out the same as it did when we broke in with Rogue. After killing or sparing Smasher, you can choose to console Pan Am. Pan Am. I'm going to miss that constant bickering. The unending fight. You can also pick up Saul's headless body and set it down in the air in front of her. Unfortunately, we can't take my boy Saul into Mikoshi with us. This dream sequence is different based on where you elected to send Jackie. If you sent him to Vic's clinic and Arasaka intercepted him, he's waiting for V here because V's mind is in the process of connecting with Mikoshi, where Jackie's ingram is. Get the major leagues, mano. Run in with dicks. Fat ass black cheeses of the afterlife. Next, we move on to the ending sequence where V and Johnny assault Arasaka Tower all by themselves. This is often referred to as the Don't Fear the Reaper ending, or Reaper ending for short. I am somewhat conflicted about this ending. On one hand, it's great. Seeing V and Johnny do this together, both being present for the assault at the same time, just feels like the right way that this is supposed to play out. On the other hand, the way that the secret ending is unlocked is simply terrible. Firstly, there's a lot of persistent misinformation about how this ending is unlocked. Your relationship percentage with Johnny doesn't matter. I've confirmed this firsthand. The only requirement to unlock this ending is selecting specific dialogue options during that side job where V and Johnny drove out to the oil fields to visit Johnny's grave. I'm not sure which exact ones are necessary, so I'm just going to flash the ones that I used to make it work. After doing this, you need to wait five minutes on the ending selection before Johnny suggests that the two of them assault Arasaka themselves. In my opinion, neither of these prerequisites should be necessary. Necessary. Maybe it's an alright idea to make the player wait a minute or so, just to let them stew a bit, but gating this ending using random dialogue options is retarded. The Witcher 3 did the exact same thing, and it was one of the worst aspects about that game's endings. Whether or not you choose to get into a snowball fight with Ciri should not affect whether or not she lives or dies in the end, unless the snowball fight helped her prepare for the cold weather or something. I know that CDPR wanted this ending to feel special, and not something that just every player would be able to do but this was already achieved through the high difficulty of this gauntlet alone. The enemies are really high level. Unless the player is around level 50, this challenge is absolutely brutal. And even then, the game only autosaves once and V's health will consistently decrease throughout the course of the assault. On the highest difficulty, I had to resort to cheesing it with the tech sniper. And even then it was scary because near the end, V's max health was more than halved most players simply wouldn't have been able to stick it out. And that's not me saying that I'm the slightest bit good at this game or anything. What I'm saying is that most players simply wouldn't have been high enough level to even think about completing this ending. This is why I think this option should be available to all players by default. It still feels special because of its high barrier to entry. I think it should have been portrayed as a glorified version of the suicide option, which is quite fitting, because upon death it will literally play the calls from the suicide ending. Still, this ending sequence is great for a few reasons. 
Jones. Johnny's commentary and presence during the assault just feels fitting. The tense challenge, while not exactly fair, does succeed in making the player feel anxious, which is appropriate given V's dire situation. The gauntlet utilizes areas that were unused in all three of the prior ending sequences for combat. There is a minor deviation in one of the epilogue sequences, and most importantly, we get a name drop of the most important character in the game, the one and only Spider Murphy. Damn, could really use you right now, Spider. Having both V and Johnny present when finishing off Smasher feels like the best way that this can play out, even though as we've already gone over, Smasher's a really shallow character. After jacking into Mikoshi, V experiences the same dream he dreamt at the end of the Avocados ending sequence. When entering Mikoshi with Alt Presence, she will read off a poem that doesn't seem the slightest bit relevant to anything that is going on. But whatever, let's just roll with it. Either V or Johnny greet the other and revel in the fact that their plan succeeded. This positivity is short-lived, however, as Alt informs V that due to the changes that the biochip made to his body, if he were to return, he would only have six months to live, just like with Hanako's path. This leaves the player with a choice. Let V keep his body, knowing that he'll be dead before winter, or let Johnny take over V's body instead. Whoever gets excised will merge with Alt just like all of the other engrams in Mikoshi. The nature of the interaction between V and Johnny in this moment is shaped by four distinct factors. Who has control of V's body, a decision the player made at the end of Act 2, the relationship percentage with Johnny, and the choice the player makes here. The effect that these factors have on the sequence isn't massive, but it is one of the most interesting ideas I've seen in a game with narrative choices. Remember when Johnny asked V if he would take a bullet for him? How you had V respond to that affects how V interprets Johnny's decision whether or not to take over his body. If you had V say that he would take a bullet for Johnny, he is upset if Johnny chooses to sacrifice himself. Likewise, if you had V say the opposite, he is upset if Johnny decides to keep V's body. Johnny is upset if V chooses to sacrifice himself either way. There are also some minor deviations and a few lines of additional dialogue that play out if you have a 70% or higher relationship with Johnny and said that you would take a bullet for him, but these changes are really minor and hardly worth mentioning. The ability to shape a character's personality and then make a subsequent decision as a separate character and watch the first character react based on your first decision is a really cool idea. Maybe another game has done something like this before, but I personally haven't seen it. My only complaint is that this idea wasn't taken further. As for the moral dilemma here, your choice will likely come down to whether or not you like Johnny's character. If you view Johnny as a narcissistic terrorist, you should have died back at Arasaka Tower, then this won't be all that difficult of a choice. However, if you're judging who is the more interesting character, Johnny is the obvious winner. V is simply boring, and most of the personality from their interaction so far has been supplied from Johnny's end. There are three separate epilogues that follow Ult Mikoshi, but it's not a one-to-one -one match for each ending sequence like one might expect. The Avocados epilogue is the only one that is dependent on choosing a specific ending. The Afterlife epilogue is available for both the Rogue and Reaper endings, and Johnny's epilogue is available no matter what. All three of these epilogues have some degree of reactivity based on a few factors I'll mention as they pop up. First, we're going to go over the Afterlife epilogue, which triggers if the player chooses to let V keep his body, while on either the Rogue or Reaper ending paths. The Afterlife epilogue starts with V waking up to whichever romance partner he or she has, if any, in a really cool apartment on top of a building in Night City. Which romance partner is present is dependent on who you called before choosing the ending. After showering, alone or with company, V goes through a series of steps to get ready for work before possibly talking with their partner in the kitchen, which has some quite accurate cube maps I might add. If applicable, this conversation moves outside, where Pan Am and Judy will both announce that they're leaving, while River and Carrie will merely discuss V's current situation. If alone, V will get a call from the bouncer at the Afterlife, who now works for V. Next, V takes a Delamine AV ride to the Afterlife where it's communicated that Arasaka is in serious trouble thanks to your actions. From what I can tell, your actions in the Delamine questline don't have any impact 
also in this segment. So let's just move on to where V enters the afterlife and possibly meets with Rogue. This is what was gained from doing the Reaper ending instead of the Rogue ending. She doesn't get killed by Smasher. I've heard some people criticize this interaction as insufficient. That there should be some greater recognition for your efforts than just a cameo from Rogue. While I hold that this ending shouldn't have been gated behind some obscure choices, I'm not all that bothered that this is the only change in this epilogue. The whole purpose of assaulting Arasaka alone was to keep V's friends from dying for him. And, well, Rogue isn't dead anymore. Mission accomplished. I also appreciate the dialogue where V suggests that the afterlife should name a drink after him. Rogue states that someone has to die before that can happen, and V reminds her that he's died once already. Next, V meets with Mr. Blue Eyes, the character whom you might remember from the Paralysis questline finale. Once again, this guy is definitely going to be important in the DLC. Mr. Blue Eyes wants V to steal a space casino's client data, an apparent attempted suicide mission that no one but V would accept. Next, there's a slick transition to V preparing for the job in a space shuttle. All along, while Mr. Blue Eyes suggests that pulling off this job will gain V more than he could possibly imagine. I legitimately have no idea what just happened in that cutscene. The sudden shift in music initially leads you to believe that something has gone wrong, but upon closer inspection it just appears as if these thrusters have started working normally. If we are to assume that this ending is intentionally left open-ended, well then it's not really much of an ending now is it? All of the other endings, even when the exact nature of the final outcome remains uncertain, manage to come off as much more understandable than this one. When V left Arasaka's orbital station and returned to Earth, he chose to live out his remaining months free instead of becoming the property of Arasaka. Even though it wasn't clear what V would do in those remaining months, the purpose and consequence behind his choice remained clear. He'll die, but he'll die free. With this ending, that's not clear. Does V succeed on his mission? If so, what happens then? This ending is left far too open-ended for any sense of finality to be derived from it. Still, when viewing the epilogue as an entire package, it's well done. There are unique encounters based on your choice of romantic partner, a glimpse of V's life after getting everything that he wanted, and a unique cameo from Rogue if you're on the Reaper path. The ending scene is far too vague, but the preceding parts work just fine. Johnny's ending is kind of a feel-good ending, despite V being an engram, possibly Pan Am and Rogue being pissed at Johnny for taking V's body, and also Rogue possibly being dead too. This ending starts with Johnny waking up in V's body. The one big problem with this ending is that Johnny seems to credit V for sacrificing his life, even if Johnny literally took over V's body against his will. It really seems like some dialogue should have been changed to reflect on this highly cynical and immoral decision that the player could have made here, but uh well. After getting his things together, which includes Rogue's gun if you remember to pick it up while on Rogue's ending path, he gets a local kid named Steve to drive him to a music store. The interactions between Steve and Johnny are charming enough I guess, but I can't see much of a deeper meaning behind any of them. Steve is pretty much just the archetypal kid who had a rough life with a deadbeat dad and a mom who doesn't pay any attention to him. The bonding between the two is natural enough, but I can't see any visible contrasts set up here that adds 
lost anything more impactful. Hanukkah's epilogue represented the consequences of V betraying himself. In the afterlife epilogue, V became the Night City legend that him and Jackie aspired to be at the beginning of the game, but the vast majority of this epilogue just feels flat in this regard. Johnny buys an expensive guitar at the music store, and upon playing part of one of his songs, Steve is impressed that anyone can play Silverhand so well. You can try to tell him that you're actually Johnny Silverhand, but he won't believe you. And if you're playing as a female V, he'll actually bring that up as well. The next stop is the Columbarium, where a handful of people who die throughout Cyberpunk's story get memorialized. V and possibly Rogue have niches here. Regardless of whether Johnny murdered V and took his body or not, Johnny leaves V's bullet in his niche and pays his respects. He does likewise with Rogue's gun in her niche. There's a really out of place moment where you can have Johnny tell Steve that smoking is bad before saying goodbye and boarding a bus to leave Night City. Stop the bus! Hey! Get off! Wait! The guitar! You forgot your guitar! No, I didn't. Haven't forgotten a thing. Never will. Despite the inconsistencies regarding Johnny possibly stealing V's body, this ending is nice. It doesn't really manage to have any deeper meaning regarding any of Cyberpunk's themes, but it does provide a sense of finality that the previous ending just lacked. People complaining that this ending is too cliched might want to take another look at the game they've been playing for the last 20-80 to 80 hours. The big issue that manages to transcend this ending is that it didn't really require reaching Mikoshi to get to this point. Johnny's engram was writing over V's consciousness already. They didn't need to charge into Mikoshi to make that happen. I mean, V would be dead in that case, like fully dead, not stored as some engram with ult, but wouldn't that still be preferable to V killing both himself and Johnny, like what ended up happening in the suicide ending? This is the big problem I mentioned with the suicide ending earlier. V had a third option. Just let the writing over of his consciousness take its course. This option was even foreshadowed back when Misty first gave V the pills. All in all, this epilogue is fine, but it's really contrived that there isn't an option to reach it by just choosing to wait for Johnny's engram to take over V's consciousness instead. The epilogue where V leaves Night City with the avocados happens to be the strongest of them all. It starts with V taking one final look out at Night City before departing. While the game never did all that good of a job defining Night City geographically like GTA 5 did with Los Santos, the themes of corruption and degeneracy were still strong enough that leaving the city once and for all still came off as impactful. This epilogue also happens to contain the strongest ending for V's story. While the afterlife epilogue showed V embracing Night City and achieving his dream of rising to the top of that hierarchy, this epilogue shows V leaving all that behind. The problem with the former is that CDPR didn't really know what to do with V's story after he achieved everything that he wished for. It's much easier to have the hero ride off into the sunset than it is to hang around after completing his goal. It soon revealed that Mitch survived, despite his death being foreshadowed to draw the player's expectations away from Saul dying. I'm surprised at how well the sequence works regardless if you chose to romance Pan Am or not. 
not. Probably because the atmosphere isn't centered around their relationship, and instead about V's personal journey. One thing that is worth mentioning is that while this ending works regardless of your choice in life path, it is considerably better suited for nomads. The story of a nomad having left his clan to go to Night City is perfectly concluded with him finding a new clan then leaving Night City, but as I said it works okay with the other two life paths as well. Because the vast majority of players will have romanced Pan Am, it might surprise many people to learn that the other romance partners will show up and either wish V farewell, or in Judy's case, leave Night City along with V and the nomads. This means that this ending not only best sums up V's arc, but also provides a satisfying conclusion to Pan Am and Judy's arcs as well. Perfect. All great, Pan Am. We're going home. So yeah, while the Avocados missions in Act 2 were pretty bad, they are a necessary evil to get what is arguably the best ending in the game. V will still die in 6 months, so there's still a bittersweet tinge to all of this, but more so than any of the other endings, V has truly grown as a person and realized what was really important in life all along. I won't go over the calls in too much detail because they seem to be unfinished at this point in time, though I suppose the same could be said about the rest of the game. Most of them are fine, but a surprising number just feel inconsistent in a way that the ending cards in The Witcher 3 simply didn't. For example, Pan Am says that she'll hunt down Johnny if he takes over V's body. I'm just wondering why she waited until now to tell him that considering she might very well have been present when he came out of Mikoshi. In addition, if alive, Rogue telepathically knows that Johnny took over V's body, yet Pan Am apparently didn't tell Mitch? Carrie's call is odd. Whether you nudged him into partnering with us cracks or not, he says he's still considering it, which seems strange. Also, if V is in a relationship with two people, the one that you didn't have V call before choosing the ending will act as if the two were never in a relationship. Also, if you only do half of the avocado side quests, their ending calls are a little bit off. And of course, I've already gone over the awkward calls that come from the suicide ending. Despite the inconsistencies, there is a decent amount of reactivity present. Romantic partners feel dejected if Johnny took over since V went off the radar, and most other people seem oblivious to V's whereabouts as well. If V isn't dating him, River came across some illegal firearms which he plans to sell slash give to citizens to protect themselves, which is cool. If Takemura is alive and V betrayed him by attacking Arasaka with ult, he is very pissed, which is a nice detail. Regardless of your choice, Paralysis ends up winning the election. Misty also calls with varying tarot readings, and their inclusion is fine. Maybe these oddities will end up getting fixed in some patch, but for now, the ending calls in Cyberpunk are not as good as the end cards of The Witcher 3.
Overall, I like Cyberpunk's endings. I would even call them superior to those of The Witcher 3 or GTA 5. The endings across those two games felt extremely rushed, which ironically isn't the case for Cyberpunk 2077. There are certainly individual aspects here and there that can be criticized, but if we're being honest, the average quality of Cyberpunk's ending sequences easily surpasses what came before, which is rather surprising. The biggest flaw with Cyberpunk's endings is that you really do need to play Hanako's ending and at least one of Alt's endings to get the full picture, otherwise parts of Act 2 just feel unresolved. Still, in a game that has otherwise been lacking in the type of interesting decisions that the Witcher series was known for, Cyberpunk's endings are a welcome addition. However, I wanted more. The Witcher 2 is one of the most ambitious games I've ever played due to the unparalleled nature of its branching story. The Witcher 3's main story was in many ways a streamlined disappointment, and I was hoping that Cyberpunk would be returned to form for the Polish developer. Act 3 was Cyberpunk's chance to impress me, and while it was a better effort than what was made in The Witcher 3, it still wasn't enough. Cyberpunk 2077 should have used this pivotal moment to lead into one final final act that is vastly different based on your choices. A neat idea that came to mind is having V and Johnny switch places, with Johnny retaining control over V's body with V as a passenger instead. I wouldn't be asking for anything massive. In fact, it probably wouldn't even be necessary to have any side content during this final act. All I want is for a choice I make to truly matter, and so far The Witcher 2 is the only game that has pulled it off to such an extent. So that's it. We've gone over the entire game. Now all that's left to do is judge it. But how? How should we judge Cyberpunk 2077? Should we judge it against what CDPR initially promised? Should we judge it against the hype it generated leading up to its release? Should we judge it against the industry standards it competes against? All of that is up to you. I went into Cyberpunk with no real expectations, and was met with a fun albeit broken game, with a mess of a story and mostly disappointing side quests. You would not be wrong to condemn Cyberpunk, but please do it for the right reasons. I don't believe that The Witcher 3 was a masterpiece. I hold the opinion that it's somewhat overrated. However, many people were able to overlook its shortcomings because it excelled at things that games don't usually excel at. For many people, this is much more important than a game succeeding at doing something that many other games already do competently. And I do genuinely believe that Cyberpunk succeeds as an outpost open world game even if there is a lot of filler and other such content that simply isn't worth your time. I immensely enjoyed the gigs all three times I went through them. I kind of wish the game focused on expanding on them to create something truly revolutionary instead of wasting time with that mess of a story and all those pointless side jobs. This wasn't realistic though. Cyberpunk is the successor to The Witcher 3, so they had to at least try to implement the aspects that people liked about that game. And in my opinion, they failed. I've heard people describe Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that tries to do too many things. In a gameplay sense, I couldn't disagree more. Cyberpunk is now post open world game, and it's roughly as focused as its contemporaries when it comes to achieving that goal. However, in a thematic sense, it starts to seem like a valid perspective. Cyberpunk 2077 is a game about crime, a game about rock and roll, a game about a corporate dystopia, a game about Japanese honor, a game about technology, a game about transhumanism, a game about family, a game about vice, a game about rebellion, a game about entropy, and a game about ambition. Quiet life or blaze of glory, hmm? and maybe Cyberpunk could have gotten away with being just a few of those things. Because Cyberpunk tried to hit so many notes throughout its narrative, none of them truly landed. It should be no surprise that Soma, a game that is almost 100% focused on the theme of transhumanism, explores the topic better than Cyberpunk did. The central most theme of Cyberpunk 2077 is Go Big or Go Home, but there isn't really a clear message to delineate from what comes of Dex's question, as the game tries to convey this theme through the fates of various characters, but with very inconsistent results. Vic took the quiet life, and he seems to be doing alright for himself. Dex tried to play it safe when he killed V, but then he ended up dead. Jackie and Ev went for the blaze of glory and it cost them their lives, yet Pan Am acted recklessly when she stole the 
the basilisk and she was rewarded with the leadership of the avocados. Judy seemingly benefited by choosing the quiet life, but it isn't as easy to draw such a clear narrative with either River or Carrie. Rogue took the easy way out, but then she felt bad about it, so she agreed to go on a suicide run with Johnny, which resulted in her death. Yori Nobu and Hanako aren't so straightforward. Yori Nobu initially rejected his father's empire in order to pursue his own ambitions, but then took it over after his father's death in an attempt to cripple Arasaka. Hanako, meanwhile, embraced Arasaka while her father was alive, but then she accepted outside help to restore it to its former glory, a glory that she willingly accepted a modest role in. And V? Well, V just gets screwed no matter what he ends up choosing in the end. It also becomes more awkward to say that the main theme of Cyberpunk is ambition when CDPR is a studio renowned for their ambition. Is Cyberpunk's main theme supposed to be a meta-commentary on CDPR as a whole, and their inevitable failure as they aspired to fly too close to the sun? Overall, the theme of ambition and its consequences is played inconsistently. But then there's Johnny. Johnny is the Joker. No, not that Joker, that Joker. No, not Todd Phillips' plagiarism, the OG Joker. Travis Bickle from Taxi Driver. Travis, like Arthur and Johnny, is a product of entropy, the forces of disorder and randomness that exist within a closed system. In all three of these tales, the city is the source of entropy, and the effects that it has on these characters is the same. When you're just one of countless dots bouncing around, without a grasp on your surroundings, with no clear direction to go in life, the inevitable result is a desire to gain dominion over the system, even just for a second. Just like a drowning person desperately trying to grasp for air. The moment when the bomb went off, Johnny had finally done it. He had done something to set himself apart from the entropy. He had control. This is what happens when someone exists in an environment that they have no hope of understanding. When if someone has no attachment to anything, they will end up doing drastic things in an attempt to leave a mark on the world, no matter what the cost. And yet, this theme of entropy remains in the background for the vast majority of Cyberpunk's runtime. Cyberpunk's themes are all either incoherent or underbaked, and that's likely due to its rushed development. One of the reasons I chose to make such a complete video is so that I could stand on the moral high ground when I criticized Cyberpunk for not being complete. I could have been like other YouTubers, and made an hour-long video where I talked about my feelings about the game in general terms, criticizing CDPR for releasing an unfinished product while bathed in the irony that I was making an unfinished product myself. I delayed this video to to ensure that it was complete, something that CDPR should have done with Cyberpunk. Because despite trying to be so many things, Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that is lesser than the sum of its parts. Oh, and uh, you can adopt a cat, and it's, uh, it's, it lives in your apartment. So there's that.